Welcome back to this incredible stadium in Bern, Switzerland for the IFSC World Championships. And boy, do we have a treat for you this afternoon. It's time for the Paraclimbers to perform. My name is Matt Groove and I've got Anita, part of Team GB, in the commentary box. First of all, how are you doing? And I'm so sorry you didn't make it into finals. Oh no, it was absolutely amazing. I'm doing really well. Awesome. Well, we get the uh, benefit of your experience and we will be swapping in some para-athletes as we continue this competition because it is a bit of a marathon of sport here this afternoon. And we're starting off with the RP category, which is neurological or physiological impairment. And Anita, that's your category. So if you wouldn't mind, can you tell me a bit about RP and a bit more details? Uh, basically, um, it's an impairment where people have either had some kind of injury or maybe uh, a cancer over their life or some kind of, maybe you've been in like the military and stuff and you've obviously had an injury there or somebody like me that's um, quite a, com a condition sort of, when I was 36 I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis which means multiple scars in my head and that affects how I, my nervous system works and my physical system works. Because with the RP category, uh, the athletes don't necessarily visually uh, show their impairment, but there's a lot going on and it can really affect balance and the way you stand on holds and you can use your arms and legs, doesn't it? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I'm, I have an invisible condition, but I have something called ataxia, which is the uncontrollable of my muscles, which means that you'll see some people's legs shake like they've got what we call Elvis leg. And that's where we can't control our muscles, whereas yeah. you will have something like scoliosis. So, Yeah, and not being able to control those arms and legs, disco leg, as you said, I mean, that's yeah. something that every climber has experienced at some point, especially when you're a bit nervous above a bolt. And as lots of climbers will know, if your leg is shaking and you're trying to stand on a tiny little hole, that is not ideal. So such a challenge for the RP category. Yeah. I mean, the other things that sort of happen um, is I have reduced sensitivity down the left-hand side, which means I can't feel the holds. I can't feel things with my left hand and my left foot. So it's not only physical, it's strength. So we use alternative limbs. So my bottom half is really weak, so I'm an upper body climber. Okay, well, thank you for explaining that. We'll go into more details when the athletes come out onto the stage. But right now, we're looking at our lead wall, 15 metres high, 40 degrees overhanging in the middle. Anita, were you on that route the other day during qualifying? And if you were, what, what was it like? Actually, it was really good. Um, we all looked at it when we were looking at the wall. We thought it was uh, really, really steep. Um, but the route setters did an absolutely amazing job. And, yeah. Uh, I mean, I got onto the head wall in the qualification and I wasn't expected to do that. So, yeah, everybody's really enjoyed the climbing. It's a really good wall. Yeah, we have the chief route setter coming in, around about 4.12, if you want to know about route setting. And, of course, route setting for the paraclimbing category is hard because there are only a certain amount of wall space. And they've got to set routes that suit different categories. So you might get a visually impaired climber on the same route as an RP route, and that is a nightmare for a route setter. Absolutely. I mean, we call it a crux or a difficult position or on the wall. Um, and what they'll basically do is they'll gauge sort of how that, dis that disability works. And there'll be certain, when you get to crux moves or the difficult move, they'll try and give us alternative movements for the different kind of disabilities. So if you're missing a leg and an arm and you're visually impaired, then in the crux move, they'll make it so it works for all disciplines. Okay, so that's the theory. And of course, as we know with route setting, it's, uh, it's one of those things that can go really right or can go really wrong. And hats off to the route setters because they work incredibly hard. And also, Nita, we're looking at the number there. So AU2, for example. Yes. One tends to be the most impaired, three the least. Um, yes. But within that, it's not quite that simple, is it? Because sometimes the one and three can relate to different conditions. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, primarily uh, one means that's the, the most disabled of that category. So if it's AU, upper amputee, um, AU1, which is now merged into RP1, is where our physical arm doesn't work or it's missing. Uh, if it's upper amputee 2, um, then what you'll find is they won't have uh, anything from below the wrist. So they could be born with like the hand missing or something like that. Well, this is some of the uh, staff and root setters there. That is the lady just there who's going to be joining me later on in the commentary box. She'll be talking us through another one of the root setters there. There's a lot of the able-bodied side of the competition. Nice. Judges and everyone. And Anita, let's just talk about the atmosphere here in the stadium because it has been a marathon of climbing, frankly. We've, uh, we've seen a lot. We're just watching here the paraclimbers observe the routes. Normal binoculars uh, 
a telescope's almost that is that you can yep. say on stage there. And this process for any athlete is so important to try to figure out what on earth is going on up there. Yeah, because you've only got six minutes um, and the stadium or the stage can actually be really crowded. So sometimes you'll see the sight guides jump off the stage and run around and try and see from different angles. Or basically you'll see the athletes actually work together because especially now with the visually impaired, uh, it's on site, which means they have no prior knowledge of what the final is going to be. There we go. So they get a couple of minutes, six minutes to observe the route. And it's uh, different from a normal observation period because we've got lots of different people and we're seeing sight guides there. Oh, there we go on screen. And a sight guide's job, as it implies, is to guide the climber because they cannot see what they're climbing. And we had a little feature uh, on our YouTube channel on the World Climbing Club show. Uh, showing Alana Yip, who is a sight guide for a Canadian athlete, Chaz. Yeah. Just let's briefly talk about sight guiding because that relationship between the climber and the sight guide, very important. Absolutely. And what some people don't know is you will find that some visually impaired climbers actually use their husbands or their friends and they train with them constantly. And you'll actually find that even on our GB team, we actually have visually impaired people that turn up that only get to climb with the GB climbing coach. They don't train with them up throughout the year and they've got to wing it on the day. Wow, that's so much uh, trust that goes into that relationship. I certainly want someone uh, who I've worked with before. Now, we sort of start this earlier on. Benjamin Mayforth will come on in the RP2 category, first of all. And then RP1, Sebastian Depka, who I think is joining us in the commentary box later on. And Sebastian is always surprised to seem to make it through. He, he literally sends me messages apologising that he can't be here with me because he's made finals. Like, I keep trying to tell him that that's far more important. Well... Everything's brilliant. I mean, at the end of the day, his climbing's improved so much. He's, he's that good now that he deserves to be on the podium. He really does, yeah. And he will enter through that door there. That door leads to the backstage area where our cameras are not allowed to go. I am allowed to go there, though. I can sneak in back there. And it's always interesting to see the athletes' preparation and how they get ready for a competition. There's a lot of nerves going on back there, aren't there, right now? Definitely. Definitely. Um, it's, it's an interesting area. There's, there's very little training facility behind there. We're obviously over in an isolation area in another building, and that's where all the athletes are warming up at the moment. But right now behind that stage, we've probably got a fingerboard and maybe a little bit of pulling up, but we've got no warm-up wall. Okay, so tricky for the athletes. And in terms of this event, a World Cup and a World Championships, although they're fundamentally the same, the, the order is, they feel differently, don't they? It's, this is a much, much bigger event. Well, it is because, again, uh, if we have a World Cup, we have to have four athletes from three countries. But this is a World Championship, so in order for a category to run, like Ben's coming out now, you need at least six athletes from four countries. And as the sport is still growing, that's why you'll see later on that we have some athletes that emerge with RP because they don't have six athletes yet. Yeah, merging categories, not ideal, but we prefer the athletes to climb rather than not. That's why that happens. And Benjamin there having a little dance on stage. Such a strong athlete. I mean, I was watching him in Salt Lake bouldering, and I don't think I could do the boulders he was doing. No, we've all tried it. Campus in, like this wall, is absolutely amazing. Um, it's great to see him using his feet now. He never used to use his feet, but now he can actually use his feet as well. <laughs> well, our athletes are being presented to us here. All of those categories as the athletes will come on. And we do have a lot of climbers and a lot of categories here this afternoon. So if you're watching us at home and you're at work, just stick us on in the background if you're trying to get some work done. I promise you, you won't get any work done because this is super exciting. But uh, this competition should end round about 5.30 this evening. And then we move almost immediately into the speed finals. That's going to be good. Ah, honestly, speed is so good cool. this morning. Um, the speed qualification, a lot of emotions kicking around the stadium. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of emotion for these athletes too. We see it from the USA. Benjamin Mayforth just standing there. The athletes are waiting to see what happens next. They're going to be either called on or off. And we do do this presentation so you at home can see. Here and there is comes. Sebastian. <laughs> So a bit of a legend within the sport there. So Sebastian comes on, <laughs> joining the teammates. Sonny back there. Sonny, I had a chat with in Vila. Such a fascinating story from him having a car accident or being yeah. hit by a car. 
I only met I met him just before we came into the wall, um, and he's just like literally just said the same on a on article he's just done online, and I didn't know that until myself just now that he's obviously had an accident, which again is a is a form of disability within the RP section because it could be car crashes, it could be skydiving accidents, it could be motorcycle crashes, like it's basically anything that isn't blind, legless or armless. There we go. So that is the RP categories being introduced. Those athletes will be competing. And I can't imagine that feeling when you're standing with the wall behind you. The temptation to turn around must be huge. Personally, I get tunnel vision. Oh, OK. Like, um, you come out, you wave, you look at the crowd. Um, you've already done your observation. You're kind of going through your routine. You're kind of getting ready and trying to work out when you're going to come out, what your warm-up's going to be, whether you're drunk, whether you've eaten. And then normally, uh, some people obviously do get nervous, but myself, I sort of come down, come out, turn around, look at the wall, it's another climb, just give it a go. There we go, it's a good attitude to have, but nerves and pressure do play such an important part in any comp. And we watched it last night during the semi-finals uh, to get for the eight athletes to qualify for the boulder and lead competition. I don't know if you saw any of that, but we did see Definitely. some big slips and uh, mistakes from some athletes. Yeah, there was definitely something going on on the men's wall. Um, they were slipping somewhere, whether it was too hot or maybe the humidity affected them in that area, I'm not sure. There we go. And Brian in the middle from the USA. He'll hopefully be joining me in the commentary box after he's climbed as well. So we have a range of athletes coming through to talk to you. I mean, I do now looking at Brian at the moment. I actually climb with uh, sports classes. So I actually have an elastic band around the back. So they basically are like, uh, used for winter sports, but I've noticed that there are some athletes in Yannick Floek who was climbing with his glasses on. Yeah. And I've climbed before, my glasses have come off, but the, you can actually get sports glasses with your prescription in, so now we can do that as well. I'm glad you said that. I'm always worried when an athlete climbs with glasses. I certainly would, I wouldn't want to do it. And then I drop everything at the best of time. So, um, <laughs> Me too. Yeah, an absolute nightmare. And of course, wheelchair categories there as well. Prosthetics occasionally too and we will go through all these categories sort of as they're announced because there is a lot of information that happens here and uh, yeah, part that's rp2 so um obviously you need wheelchairs to get about because you want to save your energy like sometimes people can walk but generally we we uh, have a certain amount of power and strength and we want to save it for the wall okay well thank you for that really good to know and find out all this information Uh, the athletes have finished being introduced almost. Oh, we've got more categories coming through. This is actually my category, so that's Rosalie, who's AU3. We've got Martha coming in from GB, who um, has scoliosis. And then you've got Chris from Holland and Marina from Brazil. And what's it like? I mean, it must be so hard. I mean, I appreciate you being here with me, and that's definitely the second best option. But <laughs> <laughs> you must, um, do you get a little twinge when you see those climbers out there? No, uh, I think when you when I was on the qualification day, it was a little bit disheartening. But now we've had a couple of days to relax, and it's all about the team and just supporting the whole community and just giving as many screams and shouts as you can when they're on the wall. Absolutely, yeah. And the uh, the city of Bern is a pretty wonderful place to hang out. The sun's been out in the last couple of days. Unless Not that I've had a chance to see much of it. I'm sure yourself. I have no idea yet. Apparently yeah. it's out there. No, apparently <laughs> there's three bears somewhere. I've not even seen them yet either. I heard this down by the river apparently. But um, yeah. yes, I have, I've yet to do any sightseeing. But I'm sure I'll have an opportunity at some point. There's Pavitra, one of our campus athletes. And I mean, when she comes on, the crowd go kind of crazy. Yeah, I mean, again, you can see if you're looking at her harness, she's had it specially made by, I believe, Edelridge. Um, because she has very little lower body if you imagine that you don't have any legs how do you put a harness on that's a good point yeah so, so specially she, made specially made so she can actually climb and there we can see a nice shot of that harness you were talking about and i think we're almost done because otherwise the athletes are going to run out of space on stage yeah, yeah definitely oh well, i don't know actually can you move up oh yes they are being asked to move there's a, only a limited amount of room going so, on here on the stage and i think we are saying goodbye so that signals that we're about to get the climbing underway. And Anita, something I want to talk about is the ropes, the amount of ropes yes. hanging off the stage. Different belay system here. Yes, I believe you talked about that in your last programme that I actually watched, which was really interesting. It was interesting to hear 
exactly why we need to actually have some training for the B layers. We have had, uh, unfortunately, accidents where people weren't pulled in tight enough. Um, the only reason that we actually have what we call a twin rope and we tie into the middle of the rope is because of the overhang on the wall. We don't want to actually fly out. As you can see here, we will actually come down past the black part of the stage um, and what we have is the bottom part of the rope that actually pulls us in. Um, we need to be tied in because we can see that we need to be at the top of the wall, which is where the top of the rope is. If somebody gets to the very top, then they can be lowered off, but they would still go off stuff off stage so we use the second B layer to put us in back onto stage. Yeah so it is a different kind of system and that requires different B laying and as you said in that video we had Ty from the US yep. come over and give some uh, some master classes to the volunteers here. And I was watching it and it looked like the lady that's coming in later, Carly, she was actually doing one of the climbs so the root setters were actually doing it as well. <laughs> Amazing. They were learning. Amazing so everyone progressing their skills here and we'll start off uh, with the Art P2 category. Benjamin Mayforth, on paper, one of the favourites for sure. He's had a heck of a season this year, really yeah. come into his own. Definitely, definitely. Um, but we've had some reclassifications. So especially in RP, it's getting a lot tighter. For the last three years, they've actually changed the kind of... What is and isn't a difficulty, so my impairment moved from two to three, and we've had some people move from uh, one to two, which means that we've actually got harder people in there, so it should be good. And obviously we've got height difference as well, because Phil's well over six foot, and Ben's obviously short statured with his disability. See, this is the thing, when we talk about route setting, that's part of the conundrum for them, trying to work it all out. It is complicated, and the setters have been here for a long, long time behind the scenes working on these routes. So we're just looking at RP3. So Rosalie actually <clears throat> only has, like, I believe, two fingers on her left hand. So you have to be careful with like putting a pocket on because they can't use it effectively. Uh, so there's also rules about which holds can be put on which routes as well. But when you merge the routes, how do you do that? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, because there's only so much uh, lead wall space available to us. Definitely, yeah. During the qualifying round, we actually used the speed wall, and uh, I quite like that. I think I prefer the paracop on a speed wall than the speed on the speed wall. I think that's a, a, a debate between the actual athletes <laughs> and the visual people that watch it, because uh, sometimes we're not sure whether we get the same opportunities to climb the same type of wall because mm -hmm. there's not enough of an angle on it for us. So you prefer something steeper, ideally? Yeah, that's why in qualities at the moment we actually have one route on the speed wall and then we have one route on the main wall as well. Um, but the difficulty in having some really, really good climbers and then some new up-and-coming climbers, as you said, the difficulty is like having a 5A and a 7A climber in the same route. The speed wall just wouldn't do it for a 7A climber. No, absolutely not. And the routes here are hard. We occasionally get routes up to 8A, I've been told by setters. And, I mean, gosh, I can't climb that great at the best of times. So um, the yeah, fact that I. our para-athletes can is pretty incredible, isn't it? Well, this is what gets me. I mean, um, we have this twin rope system because we need to be able to climb the same system for every disability. But I'm actually a boulderer. And a lot of us are actually lead climbers where we clip the ropes in. Uh, so at the moment, it's just, just trying to work out how do we do that for all categories. But yeah, I think we'd all prefer to sport climb <laughs> and we'd all prefer to boulder if we ever get the chance. Yeah, para boulder comp, that's certainly something that's been discussed, I know, behind the scenes. But as you said, it's, it's a tricky one because safety is paramount, of course. And when you have a range of different impairments within categories, it, it, it's, a, it's a difficult balancing act. Yeah. Yeah, but it's brilliant as well. I mean, just looking at this wall, we're looking at blue holes, purple holes, yellow holes. We're actually finally getting some of these lovely companies giving us the opportunity to climb on these holes we wouldn't get a chance to do at home. Yeah, so thank you to those companies. Yeah, I can't. I haven't actually seen the storage unit for the holds yet. I'm sure there is one somewhere. And I, I would imagine it's absolutely massive. Yeah, yeah definitely. <laughs> and what do you think of the uh, the no friction? boulder controversy from the other day Mikel Malwam, he won uh, holds with zero friction and an entire boulder made up of them, would, would you like to have a go at something like that? They were actually in the warm up no. so there was um, some of those clear holds in the warm up so we were actually having the go on them on Tuesday which was really good um, I think the 
the issue is, do you use water, do you use uh, rhino spit, or do you basically put chalk on? Yeah, we saw lots of athletes doing different things here. All right, well, let's get on with the climbing. Benjamin Mayforth on the left, and Sebastian Depka walks in on the right-hand side. And uh, he said to me recently, banged his head and had a bit of a nasty tangle up in Vila. And he said, all right, that's it. From now on, I am wearing a helmet. And uh, yeah. I'm glad to see he's stuck with his guns on that one. He's done it a few times, but yeah, best to be safe and obviously make sure you don't bang your head. There we go. So Sebastian will have one last look at the route. Lies on his back in order to see, especially those starting holds. Yeah, I mean, Sebastian's... Um I'm not quite sure of his actual condition, but his, his hips and his knees are basically stuck in that position. So he can only basically flick the bottom of the legs from below the knee. Um, and the reason, like, you'll see that he can only put his hand above his head, but he can't actually see the hold. Uh, Ben's a, a really good upper body based person, and we looked at his ape index, which is the difference between two fingers. And... Um, yeah, he's uh, got some uh, amazing arms um, and he can reach things that his feet can touch as well, which is difficult for a, a, a normal sort of able-bodied type person. Yeah, he's an absolute machine, basically. Definitely. <laughs> yeah. He really is. He was the gentleman I said saw him bouldering and uh, I don't think I could keep up. And hanging and resting well on straight arms here and he's quick through the bottom section of the route. Yeah, um, I mean, when we're climbing on our feet, what you want to be able to do is to move your knee over the top of your foot to give you some kind of pressure. When you put your foot out like that, you can't actually use it. So what we want to try and do is we kind of call it feet, hips, hands. So if we keep our feet and our hips and our hands all in line, like you stood on the ground, then we can climb better. Yeah, we've got a double shot to bend that. We change over to Sebastian, who's struggling with feet on the bottom half. Good upper body strength, though. And now he gets feet locked in and goes down for a shake out and a rest. Yep, so now what he's got to do is get his feet on and then he's going to have to feel above his head and he's got to try and work out where the hold is without seeing it. So he can twist his body round. Um, you can see a white line on the hold that's coming up, which means if he was looking at it, he'd know it's there, but you can't see it. Yeah, that's a very good point. Tick marks are only useful if you can actually see the tick marks. Yes. So Sebastian hits the first real crux of this route, this tricky on, sequence. Sir around the right-hand side. Look, I thought it was around a the corner then, but it actually drops into the black part of the wall on the right. Yeah, nice split screen there. That's really good, so people can follow the people that are supporting. Absolutely, so Benjamin, just to give you an idea where he is on the wall, he's nearing the head wall, so speedy climbing from Benjamin, and this is where it changes from 40 degrees into about 15 degrees. Yeah. Sebastian lower about halfway through that 40 degree overhang, so Sebastian's arms are gonna be burning right now. Yeah, yeah. Um, Ben's flying up. He really is, yeah. Speedy from him. Oh, that was close. On, Sebastian man. goes back to the ground. <laughs> Says hello upside down, and so oh. does Benjamin. I was about to say, Benjamin's fingers must have made of steel if he's attempting those moves. You saw him just start to peel off with the left hand. Yeah, yeah. Um, getting pumped, maybe. His arms are hurting. They feel like rock. Yeah, we know that feeling, I certainly do. It's uh, why I avoid lead climbing as much as possible, the feeling of pump. <laughs> well, like I've been watching you climb. You seem to be doing pretty good in your bouldering. And I'm all right. I'm all right. <laughs> I don't think I could be doing this stuff. Anyway, Sebastian, let's see the moment where he fell. So that twist you were talking about to get into a better position, reached up with the left arm towards the good hold, and we lost him just after that. We can see Sebastian leaving the stage and Benjamin and move on to the next round. Manikandan from Indonesia. Yeah. And then uh, Alexander Dornbrush from the USA. And Alexander joined me in the commentary box before, and he's a, a personality. He's definitely a personality. Um, <laughs> I, I think he's from Kentucky, and it's all about screaming like this in Kentucky. Uh, whether he knows he's only got 40 seconds before he has to climb, I'm not sure. Exactly, yeah. I was a little bit worried that he'd be doing similar things in the commentary box, but luckily <laughs> he, he kept himself in. So there is Manikandan of Kuma, and he looks up, he's reading the route. So while Benjamin's screaming, Manikanda is getting back to the yeah. task at hand. We call him Manny. Manny, there we go, yeah. sorry. So Manny is on the wall. Uh, he actually has polio on the right leg. So that right leg, and you can see him standing on it, so imagine how difficult that must be. But, I mean, I say difficult. This is just something the athletes have to deal with. It's, it's who they are, and it's 
it, in the same way as any climbing is finding solutions to problems, this is what the para climbers are doing. Well, if you imagine it's polio, as soon as he was diagnosed with polio, he grew up with that disability. So to him, and this is what everybody's like. So he has, he has to learn what it's like to have two legs that work. So to him, this is normal. There we go. And up on the wall, he's uh, flying up at the moment. So we can see Benjamin Mayforth's high point. He's got 38. Manny on 11 at the moment, so a long way to go. More of a methodical climber. He's like really, really, really strong in his biceps. Um, but he just has to make sure that he brings his body over his right leg so he can actually engage it. His left leg's perfectly fine, so you'll see him climb a lot more like an able-bodied person on the left. Uh, he kicks out to the right, wants to watch that rope. It's kind of flicked around the wrong way, and he's going to have to sort that out, and now he does well. Yeah, rope management is hard. It's part of the game here. Yeah, and uh, again, a lot of athletes don't even train on twin ropes. So we only get to do this in the competition. And there is uh, Alex on the right. And he's through the first sequence. And now, though, he's got to start working on the overhang. I think that's the first time I've seen a hat in a <laughs> final. I think it is for me, too, actually. <laughs> I'm not sure if there's an IFSC rule about it. I don't really care if there's an IFSC rule. I think rule. it's all right, because if Seb can wear a hard hat, why can't you wear a soft hat? That's a very good point, yeah. All right, so Alex, oh, he pops that left hand there. He has to reset, creeps it back up towards that tick mark that he's having to struggle early on. Brings the right hand through, and that's an early fall from Alex. Yeah, luckily he didn't get tangled. Um, you may find some people like Alex when they come down because they don't actually have any core control, which means they get flipped upside down. So that's where the B layers just need to make sure they're safe when they come down. There we go. Right, well, Manny is continuing. And he's near the head wall as well. Yeah, he's doing well. He is, but this move sequence is hard, almost like a twofer like feature. 3D climbing. Yeah, Manny's torso is quite short because he's a short person, so this is going to be quite hard for him to push up and get this. Come on, Manny. That's a big encouragement from Manny from the crowd as well. The athletes and coaches gathered beneath him at the moment. And the audience in the stadium as well getting behind the athletes. Manny snatches nice up with the left. doing well he takes a moment to shake out before approaching the head wall he's normally pretty good with his feet so if he can get some kind of weight off his hands by getting his feet up he should be okay uh, and then once he gets stood on top of that black volume he will have a moment to shake out and he's nearing Ben's high point but starting to struggle now big yeah. move up but he was beneath it good going though definitely good going yeah we'll see if he gets the plus for that I think he has been, yet. Oh, Alex, no, sorry, I haven't seen his score upgraded yet. Currently he's on 35. He was kind of going backwards when he went up for the plus. Yeah, if anybody doesn't know what the plus means, it means that you may forward motion when you're going up from two holds. So we saw that Manny was actually jumping. So that he's trying to produce some kind of upward motion. And the plus is a divide between getting, say, 35 and 36. It'd be 35 point plus. There we go. So... That is the plus system explained. It's a bit different if you watch the competition last night where we have a decimal system for the boulder and lead comps. Here we go back to the normal plus. I'm trying to get my head in, into different scoring systems here. It's quite yeah, hard. Yeah, the scoring system last night was the new Paris scoring system, which was quite interesting to see. Absolutely. Well, we're getting some athletes joining us in the commentary box here. So uh, we've got Anita coming in later on. So we're watching now Takua Okada. He's underway on men's RP1. And then on the left, we have Philipp Horzek from Germany. He's getting going as well, just off your screen. So you can kind of see this ataxia kicking in now. So we've got a lot of shaking going on in the arms. Um, this is like the muscle controlling. Uh, it's, it, it's uncontrollable, and it's definitely not like having an Elvis leg because we're trying to pull through our muscles. We've really, really got to hold on. Um, and it's, it's really hard to actually control this because what we're doing is we're fighting about the overhang, but it looks like we're going to fall, and it's just how our body works. Absolutely. So he's on the battle at the bottom, entering the 40-degree section, and you can see now it's this sequence of moves that's been causing problems for all of these athletes. Yeah, I mean, the dual text just holds, and they've only got small, like, little jibs on them, so obviously if you have a, a sensory issue and you can't feel them, then it's going to be really hard. Uh, Phil's climbing on the left, he's at least a good two feet taller than the last two climbers. 
So he's got a lot of a good torso and a leg movement to try and get a lot higher. So fingers crossed he's going to help him climb. Yeah, good work from him. He's down at the bottom of the of the uh, overhang at the moment. Um, but Benjamin still way out in front. He was deep into the head wall when he fell. So Philip on the left, Takua on the right, and that Japanese team. I and mean, we talk about them in the able body competition, but so much depth to that squad. Oh, they're unbelievable. I've been speaking to them this week and getting to know them. Um, Google Translate has been really helpful. <laughs> it is a useful tool. Yeah, Come on, Philip. Oh, Philip oh. falls and takes a big fall down. Just seemed to start to burn out on those yellow holds there. Yeah, he was looking like he was getting a bit pumped in his fingers. So maybe a bit of sort of footwork, maybe. Right, so Takua is through the tricky blue section with those uh, tick marks we were talking about. On the purple jugs. Come on, dude. Just stretching up, fingertips only. Literally one finger I can see on that next hold. He needs to gain a little more height in order to make that bump move and he can't do it. Slips and falls. And this uh, men's RP1 route. Looking nails. It is looking nails, isn't it? Yeah. Super, super hard moves. Yeah. There's a lot of different disciplines that have got to climb on it, so they've got to try and find some cruxes along the way. All right, so Takua says goodbye, and we'll see a replay of that. He was stretching up. There we go. Look, that finger. At one point, I think he pretty much had that only the middle finger on the middle yeah. of that hold. Yeah, with his bum dropping down past his knees, it looks like he's lost the power in his legs, and therefore he can't create a board motion. So he's got no power in his legs to push up, which is kind of what happens to me, where you get stuck, and then you're just like reaching and holding on for as long as you can. All right, so that's our next two athletes. And we have got uh, a couple of people here in the commentary box, which we'll bring in at the end of this round, if you're right. Shauna Coxie is watching from behind me, who has been the regular uh, commentator here with me throughout the last couple of weeks. From Spain, Ivan Escolar is on. And he begins his journey up. We know that this route is more than climbable, especially through the bottom section. And then we're waiting for Sunny Yang to come on from the USA on the right. And a big heel hook in there. Yeah, uh, again, using heels, trying to keep it on the wall. Remember, it's 40 degrees overhang. So you can tell from the chalk bag, if the chalk bag's swinging around, then that basically means that that's the overhanging sort of area. Absolutely, yeah. Quick draws, chalk bags, and uh, ponytails. That's what I tend to look for generally. Yeah. <laughs> no ponytails yeah. here at the moment, though. No, no. <laughs> so he chalks up, shakes out. And uh, we have Sebastian here as well, who will be joining me soon. He's doing really well. He's like nice and methodical. He's getting good foot placement. He's looking where he's putting his feet, which is like really, really good. He's struggling with his thumbs though, so I'm wondering whether he's got a bit of a grip issue because he's not using his thumbs to like really grab onto the holds. Yeah, it's a very good spot that. So working hard and he's on pinches as well. So if those thumbs, as you say, aren't quite there at the moment, it's hard. Gets the right foot up. Steady climbing from him as he nears 23. Puts the right foot in, starts to this rock up and scumming with the knee, that smart climbing. Yeah, yeah. Cli I always climb with trousers. Um, I'd rather keep my skin. <laughs> exactly. I think I'm right with you on that one. I've no idea when athletes wear shorts. They come back and their old bodies all scraped up. Sonny Yang on the right. Oh, what a man he is. We talked about him earlier. Had that. Was hit by a car. And has the neurological condition from that. And then one thing I'm noticing on the left, you can see the harness. On the right, you can't see the harness. And he's also not got a chalk bag on. <laughs> you, that's a good point. I didn't notice that. I got a lot of stick for not noticing a chalk bag drop the other day. Um, so, yeah. like, my hands are sweating at the moment. But how? There's at least a few athletes that don't need chalk to climb. And I um, don't know how they do it. No, I don't either. Plus, it's sort of a bit of a habit for me. Right, Ivan is up onto the head wall. He's on the bottom now. This is where the angle changes from that 40 degree savagery into 15 degrees. And he has actually moved ahead of Benjamin now. So he's on 38, but due to count back, he's won. But Sonny comes down. That men's route, brutal for the athletes. Sonny Yang says goodbye. So, Ivan now nearing the top of the wall. He's uh, 
Got a few moves to go, though. He's moved, as you can see, into 42, so ahead of Ben. That was really, really good. Stretching out a bit, but yeah, I think that's the high point. That is our new high point. So, Ivan moves in, and last athlete in that category. That will be the gold for him, so what a moment for Ivan. Oh, well done. So gold medal at World Championships, and we have our first world champion. How exciting is that? Whereas for uh, men's RP1, we have Aloise Poitier coming in in a second. So we have one more climber to see if anyone can beat Tekua Okada, who's currently. And uh, we might have a unique situation in a minute as well, where Sebastian, I don't think he knows it yet, but Sebastian is actually guaranteed a medal here at the World Champ. So for the <laughs> second time, <laughs> he's, he's going to get a medal in the commentary box, which is just awesome to see. <laughs> So another one for Sebastian. That happened in Briançon a couple of years ago. So brilliant from him. And we see Ivan there coming down. He's our other medalist. Well, Alvaz. <laughs> <laughs> He's now jumping around. He's oh, hang well on. Is he, is he guaranteed? Actually, I might have said that. Hang <gasps> on, Sebastian. Wait, we've got two athletes to go. So hang on. Hold on a sec, mate. You might have to wait a minute. Because we have, a, we have Elliot to climb as well. And you're in silver medal position. So what that does mean is that... Uh, we get to watch this, we get to see whether you've got a medal here. Okay, I'm going to stay silent for a moment. <laughs> <laughs> right, so Sebastian is nervously waiting here next to us. This is huge from him. So he has to wait and see. So I've actually noticed as well that uh, this USA climber is climbing with two different shoes. Yes, he does. So, yeah, two different pairs of scarpers on that. So a softer shoe on the right and a harder shoe on the left. Right, so watch the score. We could have drama. I called it a bit too early. It reminds we had two athletes to come out on this round. So Sebastian will have to wait, and he is nervously waiting behind me here in the commentary box. And from Great Britain, we move on to our next category. So, this is Seb. Um, uh, Seb is doing, doing his first World Championships. So uh, I just found out that he was actually training on these holds last week. So hopefully he's got some knowledge on how to hold these holds. Absolutely. So uh, a young climber coming into the scene, Sebastian Mousson from Great Britain. That's what I said. A French Mussin. accent. Mousson. <laughs> <Mussin. laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Too used to saying the <laughs> European things. And just so, to let you know, the uh, current drama, Sebastian's eyes glued to the stage as he's watching on here. Elliot Nugent from the USA. Yeah, Elliot's doing some nice, slow, methodical climbing. Seb's actually missing his left hand, so again, he's just got to make sure that he's quite secure with his left hand and his right foot. All right, so we'll have to wait and see. Sebastian currently in silver medal position, we'll have to wait. This is good climbing from Elliot here. And look at that, we can see the stump on the left hand side. So this is actually AU2 then, because Seb is the first out on AU2. Yes, we're rotating through the classes as we finish them. So we're on men's AU2 on the left, whereas on the right we're men's RP1. And he is making good progress through these purple holds. As you said, slow and steady, precise climbing nice. from him. But again, he's struggling. He can't actually look to the left, so whether he can reach the hold or whether he needs to turn his head to reach a bit further, we'll see. Yeah, Sebastian has been bumped down into bronze medal position at the moment, so we've got one athlete to go, so it might be a fourth place, and we lose uh, Sebastian there on the left from Great Britain. Oh, he's done really well. He's his first World Championship, so hopefully he's, he's set a good high point, and we'll see how it happens with the rest of the guys. Yeah, Elliot here has moved up into gold, so he's got the high point, 28 on the board. Come on, Elliot. And he slips on 28, so our new high point from Elliot. He's guaranteed a silver with one climber to go. Alois Potier will come next. And he descends, thumbs up to the audience, a happy man as he returns back to earth. And so uh, just looking at the results, Elliot's got 28, uh, Takia has got 23 plus. And Sebastian's got 23. Oh, close. He's just he's just giving me the uh, the hand wobble there to indicate he's not sure. He doesn't know. We'll have to see. 50-50 at yeah. the moment. Uh, he's got Alois Potier. In fact, let's do a live interview with Sebastian. So, Sebastian, Alois to come. How are you feeling with that one? Yeah, don't ask me now. I had the same situation in, in qualification. I had to wait for 19 starters to know that I'm in finals. So this was already nerve-wracking as hell. And now again... <laughs> All right, so he's done it once already, this competition. We're waiting 
And uh, yeah, so Sebastian might win a medal, but we've got one more timer to go. So it's tense stuff here in the commentary box. But what a performance from Elliot. So Alois Potier comes on from France. There he is on stage. Absolute legend, of course. Yeah, recently new climber. Um, sort of come on this scene and the same as, is it Isaac? Isaac Rittman, yeah, from yeah. Norway, is on the left. Yeah. He's phenomenally tall. Like, yeah, he really is, isn't he? Yeah, I've just checked really, that out. Really, really tall. So yeah. he's got the reach for sure on certain sections here. But unlike Seb, he's actually, he's got um, just below the elbow. So it's almost like climbing with a straight arm all the time, which is interesting because we can't climb like that. Yeah, true. Very good point. And you can see some athletes take the stump, some don't. Personal choice. Yeah, some uh, people tend to like to get harder skin on the, but you do have sensory there. So uh, there are people where they've had their skin repaired and you'll find that you might have the back of the hand on the front of the hand. So you get a sensory sort of, uh, your brain tells you that you're scratching the back of the hand when you could be scratching the front of it, which is quite interesting. Very interesting to know. Thank you for that knowledge. So Alois is nearing the first point where the angle changes here, kicks up a degree. A little bit tangled in the rope on the right. It's not tangled, but it's looped over. He'll be ignoring that and he's aiming for that tick mark. Yes. Yeah. So there'll be a little hold on the top. Heading towards the 12 point here. Gets a left foot twist, reaches up with the left hand, just hits the jib. It's on that dish and a high right heel, but he's struggling now, gets the hand hold. Yeah, it looks like the holds are pretty big. You can't actually see these holds because people are struggling to actually find them. So they're feeling for them. So it makes it realize that this is a really, really overhanging part of the wall. So quite blind. He's got a good left heel in again, reaches up, score creeping up towards Sebastian's high point here on 20 and I think unless something happens here Sebastian might be slipped down into fourth place but it's all to play for at the moment his athletes performing brilliantly under the intense pressure here in the stadium check out Isaac as well speedy climbing as he hits the two for section yep coming up to the head wall and Alois a big move to the right and yeah, Sebastian down into fourth at the moment. Shrug of his shoulders in the commentary box. A good performance though from Sebastian as we watch as Alois finishes things off. Crosses through, but struggling on this cross through. Needs to make the match and change his hands. Yeah, because that next hold's right above his head, he doesn't have that dynamic movement. So he can roll over on the right hand, but basically what he's got to do is jump and try and catch this yellow hold coming up. So. How can he swap it and then hopefully try and reach the next yellow hold? Yeah, he's crossing through. Makes the cross through work. Again with the heels. Good flexibility from him as well. Yeah. And then on the left, Isaac into the head wall. And he really needs to step things up now as he hits the first pinch. Yeah, it's a really good high point for the AU2. So high point set for Isaac. He moves into the lead with 37, pushing Sebastian. Musson down into uh, 22. We stick with Alois Potier here. He's about halfway up this giant lead wall. I think yeah. this is the high point out of the two categories so far. Yeah, he's on 32 at the moment. Just looking at these volcano holds with the hole in it. All right, so he's resting now. Hanging backwards, that angle doesn't give the overhang justice. It's fully on his arms at this point, but trying to use those feet, and he's used heels really well throughout. Yes, definitely. Shakes out, he spots the purple hole, it misses it the first time, gets it the second time of asking, but an accurate pocket coming up. Time is ticking down though, you'll have to be aware of that. But you can see on the left, way out in front with 34. Yeah, it's doing really, really well. Very, very strong climber. Yeah, he crosses the left hand into the pocket. Starts to rock up with the right. Shaking a little bit now, this pump fatigue kicking in. Hard to see the hold sometimes as well. He's got some phenomenal gripping going on here. He really does. Well, he's a couple of moves away, but he's got to do a traverse out to the right and then the route drifts back towards the left. Yeah. Yeah. 
big slopers on the purple holes coming up. So you've got to be really precise, otherwise it's like holding a bar of soap. And only minute 46, thank you for that clock. Up, over the top, hits the jib. And now he's moving into this ginormous volcano-like volume. Yeah, very slippy, very shiny, which means that we can't actually stand on the bit that looks like it's uh, almost like a sun with a reflection on. Yeah, and look at that left foot on the Notex, he's slipping around. And he needs to work out a way of moving that left foot in underneath his hips. Yep, does that nicely. Twists up, fingers buried deep in a pocket. This is great climbing from him, but he's going to have to think about the time. He's close. A couple of moves to go. Are we going to see a top here? Makes the match, crosses through. That's a good jug. You know, one last chance to shake out before a pretty difficult end section to this route. Yeah. This should be interesting. Come on, mate. Couple of moves to go. Could be our first top in men's RP1. RP, if you missed it. I was waiting a sec, because right now he's doing very well. A neurological or physiological condition. He's on 50. He's about two holds to go. Can he keep it together? Time might be a factor here. Reaches up the right, pops the right foot, comes down just below the top, but that is a brilliant performance from Alois Potier. He waves to the crowd. So Sebastian is going to have to wait for that medal for the time being. Anita, thank you so much for joining me here. I know you've uh, got the rest of Team GB waiting for you. Yep, thanks very much for having me. Absolutely. Just tell me a little bit about Team GB. H how is the team feeling this week? Yeah, they're, they're doing really well. We've got some new climbers. Uh, I think we're about 21 here, which is the biggest team we've ever had. Um, we've got 30% of the guys through to the final. Uh, we've got a lot of vision impairment. So, yeah, we should be looking forward to them coming out later. All right, well, Nita, thank you so much. We stick with Brian. I think we're going to bring Shauna Coxie in here right now in a second to have a chat with us before we bring Sebastian. Brian comes down. We didn't see too much of his run, but it was a good performance from him. Brian comes down and, uh, yeah, joining us in the commentary box, a lady who you'd be very familiar hearing her voice by now, Shauna, good afternoon. Uh, what a competition so far. Oh, wow. I don't know where to look. There's just so much going on on that stage, so much tension, great atmosphere in here. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate being here today. I know there's a lot of athletes who want to come and chat on the stream too, so definitely making space for that. And I've just been hearing so much from Sebastian and he's been giving me the whole lowdown. It's been a wonderful conversation and yeah, really, really fascinating insights too. So. I can't wait to hear from him as well. Absolutely. And Shauna, watching these athletes come out, I know that there's a big members of Team GB, of course, you were deeply involved with that team. So it's good to see uh, lots of countries represented here at the World Championships. Definitely so many countries and just such a buzz in this arena, so much passion and you can see these athletes fighting so hard, just chatting with Sebastian, he fought to the bitter end on his route, very satisfied to come off having fought and given his all and great to hear with Sebastian, uh, Sebastian just saying that there's been a change a little bit up in the route setting but a really positive change so that athletes can really show their best selves on the wall and really push and fight for those medals which is what everybody wants to see, that's what sport is about, it should be a great show and Wow, what a show it is. Fantastic. Well, look, Sean, maybe you come back and join us later on if you're around. But uh, right now, I'll let you go back into the audience and uh, enjoy the action as we bring Sebastian in. Thank you, Sean. Thank you so much. I would love to come back and join. But yeah, hear from the athletes because they've got so much to say. And Sebastian is incredibly good at explaining everything that's going on on the screen much better than me. So handing over to him. Thank, Thank you very much. See you soon. Okay, we're watching Kevin Bartek here climbing upwards on the left. Meanwhile, we have our first women's RP2 category, Anna Devries. And uh, I have got Sebastian joining me. Sebastian, before we chat about your run, and we've got a lot to get into on that one, let's talk about these athletes. Kevin, your teammate, someone you know really, really well. Yeah, Kevin has exactly my age, 38 now, and uh, he's climbing for a long, long climb out, outdoors. He has lots of experience in climbing very 
if it comes to technical precise climbing, uh, he's in. And he's not just climbing on plastic, also up to alpine, big wall stuff, he has done a lot in his career. Good to know. And then Anna swinging, cutting loose here, having to do a big campus move up to the next hold. She wow. Those holes are, uh, yes, they're a bit open, so even if it's a jug, it will suck everything out of your forearms. <laughs> yeah, and she goes down eventually. A good fight from her. Yeah, that overhang, eh? That's a, that's a pretty heavy place to go climbing. And it's, and it's I think, a bit longer than the average um, wall that we saw on, on the circuit. I think the overhang is one meter longer, and that means the head wall above is a bit shorter. So Kevin, meanwhile, uh, at the end of the overhanging section here. Yeah, he's about to cross that metal divider between uh, the 40 degree and the 15 degree at the top. So Kevin, once he's in the less overhanging part, that might make it for him much, much easier. Um, he's already pumped, but um, Kevin has lots of experience. And what I love when I see him climbing is always this technical, precise footwork. And um, as he has so much experience, there's always a solution that he can find now struggling a bit. Let's see if he gets an idea. Yeah, he's trying to shake out that left hand, get something back. You can see in his face how hard this is, and he does come down. So 29. Oh, pretty hard section there. Um, the root setters have to make sure that it's uh, the same for everyone, unless it's the right or the left side, which is missing. Yeah, so that, is, that means we have a winner for our, uh, our AU2 category. So Isaac Rippman walks away with gold. Kevin Bartek, silver, brilliant from him, Brian says earlier. Now listen, uh, Sebastian, you just got fourth place. I'm sorry I said you had a medal. We had a, a bit of a miscommunication there with the amount of athletes. Almost. For, but fourth place finish, I mean, you weren't even expecting to be here at one point. Yes, I, I thought we were going to have a chilled commentary session together from the beginning until the end, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, we had 20 starters in RP1, which is a lot. Um, uh, the second biggest uh, starting sport class here at this event. So um, I knew I could have a chance if I have the run of my life in an overhanging wall. And I had that on my first qualification route. The second was not that good, more in the mid part of the whole starting uh, group. And at the end it turned out I made it barely to the sixth place, which that was the last one uh, to come to finals. And yes, I think I made the best of it. Um, the ones, uh, the, uh, when I look at the route, um, those big volumes give me a very hard time because either I put, fit my foot in somehow, then it works. If not, I have a problem. Like here, you see, you have to get your feet up there. If it's not there, you have a big, big problem. And all the holes are open. There are some um, crimps on some of them. The screw holes you see marked uh, with the white uh, tick mark. Did you see it? And uh, well, I'm, uh, I'm pretty happy that I made it through the uh, blue part. Yeah, it was a tricky section. <laughs> and but I was struggling all already there, so I knew this is absolutely the maximum. So I'm I'm happy with my climbing because what I love the most is it's a competition in between me and the wall, yeah. and I want to have fun while I'm climbing. And I'm not climbing against the others. I'm climbing with myself, with the route, and then at the end we have a ranking. Okay. Well, let's just talk a little bit about Sarah here from Switzerland, of course, home country, and boy, the crowd getting behind her, cheering as she comes down. Gave it absolutely everything there, getting a little tangled in that rope. Great effort for Sarah. She was, she was fighting all the way through that. Definitely, definitely. I can tell you it's really, really hard there. And as we saw also in the men's RP1, they were all falling quite low. Just our gold medal winner made it up into the head wall, which really shows the difficulty here. It does indeed, some difficult routes. And look at this, so that right heel slipped. She tried to get the heel back on, but was a bit low with the hips at that point. Came up with the right hand, spinning down, chalk going everywhere. And yeah, it was that initial pop of the right heel that caused the problems. So back in her wheelchair and off the stage. Some athletes use wheelchairs, um, but they can also walk a few meters. So they use the wheelchairs for power management and uh, to be more comfortable, more stable. 
and um, also to save all the energy for the route. Yeah, exactly. You don't want to be burning, getting to the wall. You want to be using all your energy on the wall itself. Dina Evick, another member of Team Germany. Team Germany, big team here today. H how was Dina feeling earlier on? It's not Dina. Oh, so, so sorry. I can't read, can I? I do apologise. We are now in the... Uh, we are now... Uh, in the um, we are now in the women RP3 sport class and so Rosalie Schaupert climbing here, my teammate, and uh, she's actually she's AO3, but as we didn't have enough starters, they were merged into RP3. So the concept of merging is if you don't have uh, enough starters to open a sport class, which means you need six athletes from four different countries to open a sport class here at the World Championships, um, you get merged into another sport class in order to give them a chance to start and um, actually Rosalie is against RP3 a bit in a disadvantage because she has a finger impairment that's what AO3 is standing for um, and um, she made it to finals so for her like for me being in finals is already a big 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 success yeah just getting to this stage you have to beat so many athletes that's something we keep talking about which is you know just to get to a finals yes we it's, had it's hard work 200 almost 200 athletes competing at the event, uh, which was the new record, by the way. So no competition in power climbing ever has been bigger than this. So we have 17 sport classes coming up today, 17 medal ceremonies, and uh, that means from the maximum of 20 we could have, just three couldn't start because they were not big enough. And this is also showing that the sport is growing, the sport is going in the right direction, and I'm pretty sure there will be one day where we might have odd sport classes starting independent. That is the dream, isn't it? We hope that the sport will continue progressing. Meanwhile, Rosalie is progressing. She's towards the head wall on the middle route. First time we really get to see this section here. And she's got the jug on the left hand, but starting to struggle. That angle change really pushes your body into a, in a strange position. Come on, Rosalie. She was super nervous, couldn't sleep that good this night. Oh yeah? <laughs> yes, but we all were, to be honest. I've been now in finals, this was my first final ever, but I was never as nervous as today, to be honest. It's something different. If you have an arena with, I don't know how many people are in here right now, it's different. Already in, classific in qualification, we had, uh, I would say, a few hundred spectators here, which is normally a more, let's say, a more silent event. But it was not. So thank you, Switzerland. You offer us a great, great arena, a great, great opportunity. Absolutely, yeah. It's been fun throughout. Rosalie reaches up with the right hand, pinching that, getting a thumb involved and wrapping the left around. And she's uh, stood up high. That feeling must be incredible as you near the top, hearing the crowd beneath you. Now she has to step on in an uncomfortable and maybe also insecure position, changing hands. As you see, her left hand is the impaired one, um, where she doesn't have all fingers, so she can pinch a little bit with that. But um, yeah, options are limited. So trying to switch hands here, trying to find a good foot position. And it's worth pointing out she's been, as you said earlier, combined AU3 into the RP3 category. And already nearing the top, so Rosalie, this is incredible what you're doing here. A little pop, couldn't quite get there, but what a climb from her. An early high point, 42, and that's going to take some beating. Oh, yes. So let's see if the rest from the sport class can match it and get up there. Well, that is Dina. I said her name earlier on, but uh, there she is from Norway, slapping left, hit the hold, cross through, fell on the cross through. But that has put her up into the number one spot. She's on 29 plus, the gold medal position for her at the moment with one athlete to go, but it is a certain Jasmine Plank. So uh, we'll wait and see. Let's wait and see, yes. RP3, the sport class here, means uh, range, power, limited range and power. Um, that means it could be a neurological impairment, could be a limited range of movement, mostly like due to accidents or severe um, health conditions. And uh, it's the RP sport classes are mostly like a, an interesting mixture, mixture of impairments, which are sometimes also very hard to compare. And uh, well, at the end, it, the, uh, the classification gives us a good chance to group them as fair as possible together 
and give us an as equal chance as possible to have a fair competition. Yeah, we said it earlier that we want athletes to be climbing and not climbing, and that's why those mergers sometimes happen. All right, Jasmine Plank, we just saw her. She's approaching the wall. And then with Great Britain, Martha Evans comes on. RP3, and she's rereading the route. And Sebastian, this is important. We saw you lying on the stage, checking out those first couple of holds. Yeah, it's always the same sequence I do. I get tied in the rope, I lay down, I take a last look, and then I stand up, I go. And so I do always the same. So it's uh, in competition climbing, you need procedures, you need to have a rhythm to feel secure, to feel safe. And um, yeah, once I realize, okay, this is my thing, I always do it like this. As your routine, your, your sequence of moves. Yes, exactly. You have, by the way, when you get tied in, you have 40 seconds left until you have to start in the route. So um, you can do whatever you want in those seconds. Yeah, we've been talking about that a lot. It first came up in b was what happens if you go over those 40 seconds? I went to ask, and apparently it's never really happened, but they would encourage you to get climbing. Yes, like the judges would, uh, I think, would give you a hint. And maybe the b layer, so <laughs> slight push, slight pull with the rope. <laughs> yes, a little tuck <laughs> towards the wall. Come on. <laughs> well, Jasmine is doing well. She's about nearing the halfway mark on hers. And then Martha making quick work of this middle route. We've got four routes in total in action. And Martha right now in the jug. Well, we don't have more than two climbers climbing at the same time during this finals. So uh, we can focus on the action. Not too much happening at the same time. Marta feeling, looking really confident in the overhanging section here. And uh, Yasmin as well, trying to find a way to the more slopey section up there. So the route progresses more and more to the top. Yasmin is on the 6C and Marta is, I think, is it the 7A? No, 7B plus must be the grade of that route. Yeah, we do lose Jasmine Plank. She waves up and that does mean that Dina Evick takes victory with a 29 plus and Jasmine Plank will settle for silver. And at Devery's third and a bronze medal for her. So that's the action currently. Martha, meanwhile, is progressing towards that top spot, but it's a high one. She's on 25. She needs to go above 42 plus, so 43-ish. Well, not ish. She needs to get 43 to get the gold. Martha hanging with a straight arm now on that big dish. Up with the right hand. And good, solid work from her as she sits back and chalks up. Oh, she can find a good rest there. Yeah. Talking means thinking, <laughs> as I always say. <laughs> <laughs> now looking down to the time, there's a clock running on stage that you can see uh, from above. And uh, checking how much time is left. You have six minutes for your climb until you get timed out. And once you get timed out, you just get the last uh, ranking from the hold that, you're, uh, that you have at that moment. Yeah, she is keeping an eye on that because, as you said, found a good rest. But the problem with a good rest is it can be quite tricky to move away from that rest. And I think we're seeing that with her. But now she moves on quickly. We'll let you know if time becomes a problem. I think no, because she climbed quite uh, straightforward in the lower part of the route. So now into the head wall, a less overhanging section here. Yeah, Martha on 35 at the moment nearing that 42 plus but she needs to go deep into the head wall and things get pretty crimpy out there small holds and you go from sort of physical arm movements into uh, small finger movements and look at that rest once more she's been clever with this sitting down on that left heel stretches up now with the left hand she's got a few moves to go before the top but it drifts left and then comes back right towards that final top hold Nearing Rosalie's high point at the moment. Yeah, she's getting close. She's on 42. She needs 42 plus, so plus more. She won't know that, of course, but she has just moved into that gold medal position. We wait for the score to be updated or oh, creeping out. Yeah, Rosalie also tried to reach up there, but couldn't make it. And now same here. Where do I position my feet? Rutas then try to make uncomfortable positions Encouraged to move and oh. almost getting there, but not quite there. Five centimeters more. 
Yeah, she needs to trust another foothold here. The foothold up above, she's standing inside because there is texture, there is friction. We're standing on where she was trying to stand with her left before. There's no friction, there's dual tax holds. So you would want to avoid to stand on that. The volume is too steep to stand on, so now it's the question, what do you want to do? Time for quick decisions here. Getting more pumped, trying something else, or just committing for it? Yeah, there is that high left foot, and she's now seen it, but that is a big stretch and a lock-off to get to the next move. I think she might have to pop for it. The problem is the lower feet. High feet won't, won't bring you anything, and that's what you see there. Yeah, tricky sequence there, and we wait to see if the scores are moved into the gold, because with count back she might do, but we're just waiting on that one. She's on 42, now she gets awarded it, so she moves up to the gold medal position. So Martha, at the moment, leading the way. And then from, uh, we're watching from Spain here. Cut loose, losing the feet, trying to get back on the wall and falling down. And it's Marta Pesh from Spain. So our podium is beginning to take shape and do bear with us. There's so much action going on here. It's uh, hard to, to keep up with it sometimes. But as you were saying, that route on the far end, uh, 6C. Yes. So a tricky one, it does wind around. Of course, Sebastian was on that earlier on. First, I was a bit afraid, and then in, it's in uh, root observation, when I was laying on stage from different positions, I saw like, okay, it's big volumes. They're round, but they are quite juggy, um, and those screw holes help a lot. But root setters make the roots in a way that they progress more and more towards the top in comparison to a regular gym root, which has mostly the same difficulty from bottom to top you get more and more pumped and more and more challenged <laughs> on your way to the top <laughs> challenged is a good way to describe it i like that one so martha pesh she comes down that was her fault that two rope system keeping her safe as we discussed now wait for the crowd here because pavitra van der hoven is in i haven't seen her at a couple of world cups recently but it's good to have her back Definitely, definitely. Pavitra is uh, originally in the women AL1 sport class, meaning uh, they are climbing in pure campus style because she has no legs. On the women's RP3 route, we have now from Netherlands, Christiane Lutikhusen. She has, by the way, CP, cerebral palsy, and that means less coordination and strength in um, her, uh, her body on one side. And the interesting thing about her is that she didn't have a diagnose and she didn't know that the disease before she made her way to power climbing. Wow. Because to get classified you need a medical diagnosis. She always know something is different with me but I can deal with it and then the doctors find out that it's actually CP. And then she's in this power climbing world doing really really well. Look at Pavitra as well campusing her way upwards. She was a bit disappointed. I saw her come down from the qualifying round but she did enough here. And look at the power of this woman, wrapping the left hand around, bumping out with the right. Pavitra is incredible. As she has no legs, one leg weighs about more or less, we say like 15% of your body weight. So if you take both of them off, you get a huge weight <laughs> advantage. Or less, less you have to, to pull on. To, to lift up the wall, so she can do one arm pull-ups to, 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 to warm up. And in, in comparison to athletes who have both legs, that's a clear advantage. But sadly so far, Pavitra is the only female AL1 that we have. And climbing merged here into RP1 and doing a really, really impressive climb here. Yeah, she just catches that right hand, tries to go up to the pocket. It's a small one to hit on a campus and it's blind, it's underneath. So a huge move needed. Now trying to cut back, sort out a bit. So Pavitra, she's one who can like rest <laughs> like forever, some sections, and trying and trying over and over again. Now crossing through with the left. And matching her hands for a second in that pocket. She swings down. Christiana is still on though. The athlete's climbing in sync. It was quite nice to get uh, one shot instead of the split screen there. Christiana also using the same resting position as Marta. Yeah, a smart place to rest because she knows what's coming. Once she's through the overhang, things uh, ramp up in difficulty. We saw that with the able body competition as well, that 
the higher you go, the harder it comes. She uh, gestures to the crowd to get them behind it. Definitely, definitely. So Cristiani now thinking about the strategy for the end of the overhanging wall and starting to commit. Yeah, she had a long look up at it, moves the feet across the black volume, upgrades the left foot onto the black where you can see that tick mark. And now the business end, heel in. Good footwork from her and she moves into a bronze medal position. She's aiming for that 42 plus sequence, which we know how hard those moves are though. Brings the so, right foot, pushing and sitting oh, up on wow. the wall. Oh, <laughs> wow. That's a good resting position. That's awesome. Nice. She had a little sign down to the crowd there as she sits. That looks pretty comfortable, doesn't it? Yes. So she's I, yes. I always try to see if I can find some creative resting positions, but unfortunately didn't see any in my <laughs> route. <laughs> yeah, certainly nothing like that. We rarely see that. I'm not sure how restful it was as a position, but a brilliant moment there. And she has a seat on our head wall. But this is the tricky sequence. That long move to the left is far, and she's going to no, pop for it. Three. And jumping for it. Full dyno for Christian, but she comes down. But what commitment from her. And gets the 43, moving her into the number one spot. One athlete to go in women's RP3. Wow. Now being ranked down again in the live ranking. We we'll see that might be a good, a good, uh, a good uh, thing to to discuss. Um, the plus ranking means that you're aiming and moving towards the next hold, and you just get it when you are holding it in a stable position and can make use of that. So, just jumping for it as we see here. She was holding it with both hands, swinging, compensating the swing with the feet against the wall, swinging back, and then losing it. Yeah, we'll wait for confirmation of those scores. She gives a big shrug to the audience and a wave. And now she's getting the 42 plus. Yeah, which is strange because, because no, she, she, yeah, it, that's right. She didn't she didn't hold uh, in, a, in a in a in a stable uh, way. So it's basically the same as the others two. They both they didn't jump. They couldn't hold that much, but technically it's all the same plus. Either if you just jump for let's say. 20 centimeters towards the hold, or if you could reach it, grab it, but not hold it. Uh, well, Eva Moll is underway. I saw her uh, the other day in town. She was telling me that she was feeling a little bit nervous after that fall in Vila. Yes. Um, Eva had an, let's say, unhappy encounter with the belaying system <laughs> in Vila and uh, spent a bit of time in the hospital, but now is back on the wall and uh, Trying to give her best. Yeah, she is. She's climbing on the right. Marina Diaz from Brazil is underway. Last women in RP3 category. And Eva, an early fall for her. Didn't see it, but this was really, really low. Maybe unexpected for her. But as you said, she said it's not. she's not in her, in her best shape. Yeah, I think dealing with a few psychological demons there. Just to come back from that injury, climbed so well in the qualifying round. It was great to see. And Definitely. she will be back for sure. And she's a multi-sport athlete as well. Does lots of other sports. Rowing, high-level rowing. Really, yes, she's rowing and uh, power rowing. And she's really, really good there as well. And she said that's more easy for her as she doesn't need um, her leg stability there. Yeah, an advantage for her in that sport. So a talented lady, she will be back. And now we see Marina moving through the bottom of this route. You Confident reckon? moving there. Yeah, around about 7B that route. So uh, a step up in difficulty for sure. And she makes a big move upright. Hits the fingery like jug. I don't want to call it a jug. It's not really a sinker, but it's enough to wrap your fingers around. Uh, some of them are really sharp and give you a good, good hold. But um, some are not, <laughs> and they will really, really ask for everything you have in your forearms. Now Marina in the resting positions, this position that all the others used before. Shaking out a little bit on this part of the route. Yeah, she shakes out, has a look up. Those tick marks put there by the route setters to give an indication to the athletes about where those hidden holds and jibs are. Brings the left hand through, and already she's nearing the head wall. 
Big shoulder moves out left. And once she gets on this dish, I mean, as we know, there's an opportunity to sit down here if she spots that as a rest. <laughs> Let's see if she sees it. <laughs> it's one I certainly didn't see when I was reading that route. She no. doesn't need it. She's just stepping up and now trying to see what she can do with the little crimps up there. And she went a bit out of sequence. She's committed to it again. I think she's just using it as a rest. I think she'll drop back down with the left hand, cross through the right, yes. and then go left. That's what she's doing now. The upper hold is way more comfortable here to shake from, but uh, she might change when she wants to move towards the next hold. Christine, Christina in the uh, lead at the moment. Yeah, because they, she, she had the same um, qualification result like uh, Mata. And as they had all the same ranking in qualification. And also in finals, there's a count back to time where Christiana was a bit faster. Now Marina jumping and... <sighs> Just had that left hand on it. Hips swinging away from the wall, as uh, Sean behind me will know. She talks a lot about hips. We saw some hips there. That might also be then 42 plus, like all the others. So the whole sport class has the same score. And now we get after the... After the final <laughs> score, we have count back to qualification. After count back to qualification, we have final time. Exactly. Well, that's the score. Melissa Ruiz is hanging off and campusing upwards. Fairly new to this, building her uh, competition experience up. Gets a right leg on, bumps over to the right, hits it well. And now leans back and shakes out quickly down low. And of course, Sebastian, you know this route. Her leg stability is really limited, so many times she has a really, let's say, powerful climbing style. Feet cutting loose, just pure pulling on her arms, she has incredible strength. Yeah, you can see that strength there, she throws herself to the left, yeah, matches, that. but misses the jib on the first time near the tick mark. Couldn't make it, her legs are more or less just standing on there, but you see now hanging, cut loose, trying to get back on there. As she has so few coordination down there she has to pull everything out of her arms and her hands let's see what she can do with the move towards the next one yeah it's a bit of a struggle right now she's fighting for it on 28 aiming for 35 plus now aside the good crimp on the volume just at the part and falling a big fall from her we want to watch that arm she needs to wrap it up being lowered, needs to be careful and untangle herself here. The team trying to work. And we hope she's okay out there. The team are immediately there to assist. She's got the arm untangled now. So a tricky fall from her as she comes back down to the mats. Now, Sebastian, I wonder, I'm going to go and try to find a few more athletes. Maybe I could pass uh, Shorter Coxie. Uh, into your capable hands while I go searching for some athletes. So, Shauna, I'll pass the mic over to you. Hi, so, Sebastian. Hi, Thank Shana. you for having me. Wow, how <laughs> exciting is this? There's so much action going on right now. Definitely, definitely. And there's so much more to come. Um, let's see. We have a few more routes that we didn't see yet. And they will come uh, within the next sport classes. Here we see the result for the men's RP3. Ivan Montreux Escola wins the gold medal. Benjamin May, fourth, second place. Manikan and Kumar takes the bronze medal. It's been quite surreal for me because I've been in the booth for the entire competition and being at this event today, I've, I've snuck out and I've been watching the reactions as these athletes come down and are greeted by their friends, by their family, by their teammates. It is emotional out in that arena right now. Definitely. There we saw the men's RP1 results and now we are switching to men's AU2. Isaac Ripman from Norway takes the gold. Kevin Bartke from uh, Germany, my teammate, takes silver and Brian Zazula takes the bronze medal. And can you tell me, have there been any big surprises? Are you, were you expecting results to look like this? Or yeah, any, any big shocks? No, so far I think uh, our best candidates are <laughs> in the position that we were expecting them to be. There are a few changes. Dina Ewig, uh, first place here, Jasmine Plank in second. Um, we, we see really good consistency during the whole season. Sometimes there are a bit changes in between positions here. Men RP, a woman RP3, you see they all have the same score. Um, 
so you see, they are so close together. It, just a tiny mistake can make a difference, or even the count back to qualification, or here, count back to time. Women RP1, Pavitra taking the lead, Melissa Ruiz um, taking a silver, and Marta Pesce Salinero with the bronze medal. Those names have been on the result board before. The only difference here is that Eva Mohl, due to her accident, she made it to finals, but in this case, just the fourth place. And you were talking to me earlier about your experience and the fact that making it to finals for you felt almost like a podium in a way. You said that the, the young guns, they're coming for you. There's a lot going on in power climbing right now. So many people joining the sport. Are you seeing the level really start to step up recently? Definitely, definitely. The level is rising through the season from competition to competition. Roots let us try out more things to see if we can make the sport more technical, so to involve more aspects of experience and also more technical climbing in comparison to pure powerful climbing. Mm -hmm. um, because that's what you get from experience, what you need also to be a full climber. It's just not enough to go into the, to go do some power lifting and uh, strength training and then just camposing up everything. Unless you're AL1, yes, then that's the way to go. So the, the sport class who campuses everything. But they are so technical in the way they are using their movement. And even, you know, exactly. you're saying it's not just power out there. They are not just kind of camping. You can't walk from the gym and do these routes. They are complicated. They are complex. We've seen route reading mistakes be really punished here. And Definitely. It's, and also some surprises up there. Some no hands rest. Very unexpected or really good shaking positions. So. I do see a lot of technical climbing. So yeah, like you were saying, it's not just a case of powering up regardless of your impairment. It seems like the root setters are really creating opportunities to showcase the best possible climbing that these climbers, these athletes can give. Exactly, exactly. We have such an incredible pe incredible team of root setters who know us quite well. They, Even if they are new athletes, they are searching them on Instagram or Facebook or whatever <laughs> to see like, who are they? What's their kind of impairment? How do they climb to see and to adapt a bit also to their needs? Yes. Um, then uh, sometimes we see people appearing on stage for the first time and taking gold. This has happened multiple times during the season. Okay. And uh, that really shows that para climbers are out there. You don't need to build them from a youth generation and form them over years. No, they are there and we just need to find them and motivate them to do competition climbing. So Switzerland, for example, is a good example. Um, they built a team within two years and they yeah. are finalists here. Wow, that's so incredible. And I'm going to put you on the spot now. There's power climbers listening to this that don't compete. Why should they get involved in competition? Can you sum up what it feels like to be out on that stage? The community and the family. I would call it it's a big family we have here. We are friends and we climb together here on a big, big climbing festival. And every competition is a festival more itself. And being together with people who have and maybe a similar disability or have a disability mm -hmm. give you a complete different feeling. Those are the guys who know how it works. Who they understand. know who you are, where you're coming from. Because, for example, if I'm at home, so to say, I'm the only one who has an impairment. Sure. <laughs> and so I'm always the special case. Here in the competition scene, I'm not. I'm just one among many. And the coach is the only one who has no impairment. <laughs> and you could see just how much it means. The athletes coming off that wall, whether they achieved what they wanted to or not, it is a magical moment to be around that, especially walking through that crowd right now and hearing you are world champion and seeing those smiles, all those reactions. I could see just what it meant to you as you were watching the other athletes. You were so passionate, cheering them on. You want to see everybody do well and to see the emotion that you felt as you saw your fellow teammates and your friends winning those medals. It's been beautiful. I have been sat behind you guys, um, not in a creepy way. I just wanted to kind of get a feel for what, I've been out in the crowd watching and I also wanted to know what 
people are hearing at home and you you talk so articulate and so well about this sport we are privileged to have you in the box and it's just so amazing to see so many athletes really really pushing themselves and again coming back to the root setters it does feel like they've made the perfect stage for this but more than that it's the athletes who are putting on this show today yes thank you shauna <laughs> thank you shauna for this uh <laughs> statement <laughs> Um, yes, it's the as the World Championships are just once every two years, mm -hmm. and we have a climbing festival all together. We are most of the times we are separated during the season. Some events are attached, for example, in Innsbruck, where we have also other World Cups, uh, Boulder, Lead, and Park climbing together. This is really exceptional here. This is really, really exceptional here in Bern with the big stadium, big audience, and everything happening together. Right in the morning, we had speed semi-finals and the evening right after power climbing will follow speed final session so full of action here through all the days so full of action you put that incredibly well there is just so much going on and it it just feels like there's so much excitement. There is the Olympic qualification going on, and I know that the decision hasn't yet been made for LA. I don't know if I should bring it up, but we can bring it up. I we do can think talk it's about important it. to talk about. Are you optimistic? Yes. I I am optimistic. I don't know if I'm naively optimistic, but it does feel quite positive. That decision comes in October, if I'm correct. It feels like that is looming, and. But going into that decision, having just had an event like this, surely this stage, this event is showcasing the best of what this sport can bring to the Paralympics. So are you crossing your fingers? Are you optimistic? Yes, <laughs> I am optimistic, but we have to dig a bit more into details. Why we see the athletes for our B sport classes being presented here now on stage. Um, we the next um, block in this competition will all be the silent climbing because we have our visually impaired climbers where the audience has to be silent so that the blind climbers can listen to their side guides who will give them direction on the wall. So use the chance a bit to chat about the Paralympic to topic. Yes, sport climbing was included in the Olympic Games with Tokyo 20, uh, 2020 and along with that the IFSC had this strategic plan also to include paraclimbing into the Paralympics. To get included with a parasport, you need your able body partner sport to be included. Yeah. That's one of the preconditions. Exactly, yeah. So we could not apply before um, sport climbing was not in. So many people thought like this is connected, like when sport climbing goes to the Olympics, para climbing is going Paralympic. No, this is not the case. I know, and it, oh, I don't agree with that, but I don't make the rules. But the fact that sport climbing did get into the Olympics, that is what could start the process for climbing. Exactly. For para climbing, getting into the Paralympics. Exactly. Correct. And you apply seven and a half years before the games for them, unless if it's an able, if it's the Olympic committee or it's the Paralympic committee. And then they evaluate multiple factors and make then a decision which is announced, uh, I think, five and a half years before the games, yes. if they're in or not. And that's the process where we're in now. The sports for the Paralympic games 28 in Los Angeles has been announced yes and those spots given there are the exact same like we have in Paris for the Paralympic Games but there are two more spots for potential inclusion and this is para surfing and yes. para climbing and this is up to the local organizer to see whether they can make it how they can make it and if they want to include none of them one of them or both of them but come on it's got to be both okay let's talk about the fact that we're in LA for the games, LA surfing, you know, it feels like we've got a lot of competition if we go against surfing, but if we go together with surfing, surfing, it just makes so much sense to me. And we've seen a great team, a great representation from the USA. That's got to be positive. I don't know if I'm hyping it up too much. I'm just trying to be as optimistic as possible and channel all that optimism onto the decision makers because, wow, wouldn't it be amazing to see this on the Olymp Paralympic stage? For sure, parallel climbing belongs there, it's no question in my opinion. And the, when the decision came up in January that uh, we are on this, so to say, shortlist, I couldn't believe it. Because we never applied before, this was our first application. And there were 30, 30 sports applying, 22 got a spot, 11 did not. And there were big sports not getting a spot in the games. 
and we were applying for the first time. No one knew us. We introduced many things, many changes. For example, the new IPC standardized classification system within the last years. We did so much in the past years, and since I'm um, I'm the asset representative and also chair of the competing committee, the part time committee who leads and pushes the development forward mm -hmm. now for four years. Um, we have done so much, but to be honest, I didn't believe myself that we could make it because I knew it's going to be hard and no one's waiting there for us. Mm -hmm. No one's saying like, hey, finally you're there. Yeah, no, yeah, we're yeah. just one amongst many who are knocking on the door. And they are really, really strong sports. Some have been in the games before, some have applied before, some have been um, yeah, rejected. Uh, rejected yeah. And try what you do if you are rejected, you apply again. You know how to play the game. Yeah, you, you're more savvy, you're more kind of exactly. understanding of what's needed. But surely it does go to show the fact that it's being considered on its first attempt, you know. It's incredible. I mean, it's like if you do an, uh, you try a route on side, you think, like, no, it's not going to work. And then you <laughs> finally, I mean, like, maybe like two quick draws bec before the anchor, and you realize, like, oh, now it's getting serious. And this is the point we're in at the moment. So the local organizer is considering at the moment whether or if or how they can make it. So there are negotiations, there are considerations, and we'll hear about the result by the end. Um, uh, yeah, in, in, in this fall, we yeah, will see October, about this. October, I October. believe, is the we month hope so. when we get that information. But I do want to bring up, if it's okay, the fact that let's say we get the decision made, it's a positive decision, paraclimbing is accepted into the Paralympics. At that point, the categories and sport classes, correct my terminology if it's wrong, I'm tr trying to learn what is correct here, but categories and sport classes, that will be decided later. We won't find that out until 2025. Exactly. So athletes wanting to compete at that Paralympics, they might not know if their category will be in the games, if I'm not mistaken. Sure, exactly. Because that's the number of spots, the number of categories, the number of medals, all of that is decided afterwards. So although it sound, it could sound like a wonderful story of success, it's so much more complicated than that, if I'm right. Yes, you're absolutely right. The decision about the medals, the number of medals granted to a sport is announced three and a half years before the games. So the decision which we will get by the end of this year will just be yes or no, but that means nothing. Will it be one medal, two, three, four, five, whatever? We are sure. at the moment we have ten sport classes. Yes. So and those ten sport classes I'm pretty sure won't make it. So because yeah, so most, likely, most likely most likely because this is a lot, the number of athletes and the number of medal events has a hard limit. Mm -hmm. So every medal we get is taken away from someone else. For sure, yeah. So hard decisions will have to be made there. And we will make a proposal that we will send from uh, the IFSC. Yes. And um, then we will see at the end of the day what will be accepted or not. It can also be a, um, a case that from the other side, there will come a hard limitation and say, like, we want this or we want that. Remember Tokyo 2020? Mm -hmm. The combined format? Oh, I remember all too well. Don't you I, have I been do. there because you know <laughs> you're in the athletes commission. You have been there at the discussions table. Yes. Right. If I'm right informed, there was a clear, um, yeah, a clear statement on speed climbing has to be in, and there's one medal granted to the sport. Yes. And that was the reason why you invented the combined format, right? Exactly. So that decision was made before I came to the table, okay. before I was athlete commission. Um, but yes, you are correct. There was one medal available. The Olympic Games, as far as I'm aware, looked at speed climbing and went, we want that. Understandably, it is... Straightforward. It's straightforward. It's sport. It's understandable. It's and, and it's incredible to watch. Uh, definitely. Um, so the combine was created to, to showcase the, the three sports. Um, but like you were saying, medals and number of athletes are actually what's really difficult to get. So that when that decision is made, there's a much longer discussion that's going to go on. And... I want to take this opportunity actually because you said that you were surprised when you were under consideration as a sport, but you personally have done so much work to improve this sport. So on behalf of the entire sport, I want to say thank you for all the work that you've done to get paraclimbing to where it is. And I know I'm making you uncomfortable. It seems like you don't like these compliments, but you've done so much. So have other athletes, but you've been the one sat at the table helping the sport get to this point where it is right now. So on behalf of the entire climbing community, thank you so much because 
you know it deserves to be on that Olympic stage and it will get there at some point, whether it's in LA or whether it's in the future, whether we need this round to, to be more savvy, like we were saying earlier, and get to the table again. Fingers crossed that we don't, but you've really been part of this sport progressing. Like you said, we're finding more athletes. This is the most number of athletes we've ever seen at Paraclimb World Championships, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, it is. That must, you must feel something when you walk into this arena and know you're a part of definitely, that. Definitely, definitely. I feel so proud and I feel really proud and thank you for <laughs> your words. <laughs> and yes, there has been a lot of work behind the scenes, especially the introduction of the new classification system, which is a hard requirement to be accepted in the Paralympic Games. You have to fulfill those standards. And before, for example, we had three, two and a half pages of classification rules. Mm -hmm. Now we have 50. Five, five zero. zero. Not one five. Five uh, exactly. zero. Exactly. It's its own rule book now. So this shows the incredible amount of work which has put into the sport and which was, by the way, done in the year of COVID. <sighs> COVID actually helped us. I guess, yeah. Because had we had time. a break. <laughs> we had a lot of time. And then when we came back in the 21 season, we had to get really, really a cold start. And we jumped on uh, the first event and reclassifying all the athletes in Innsbruck 21. And at that event, when it was over, I was sitting in the last row and I was really like feeling all the pressure falling off myself because I know we would have this make to make this step, this competition work anyway, the whole system. Well, I have a big, big problem. And it worked? It worked. And I'm proud of the whole team, of the whole committee, of our classifiers, of our um, athlete representatives, coaches representatives, all the experts, and everyone who's helping behind the scenes, no matter it's from the IFSC or volunteers. It's not just me. It's a big group working there. And yes, I'm the one who's doing all the connections and helping here and there and everywhere. And thank you all out there. Well, we're the one, you're the one we're talking to right now and there's action about to start on the stage. So I will hand back over to Matt. Thank you so much, Sebastian. It was great to chat to you. Thank you, Shauna. On stage now, we have the women B sport classes starting. From Austria, we see here Edith Scheinecker starting in her route. Yeah, and it's worth uh, pointing out to everyone. Hello, hello, Sebastian. How are you doing? Um, worth pointing out that the audience drops into silence here, and that's exactly. because these athletes are visually impaired. They can't see the roots. They have a sight guide on the ground. I always start to whisper at this point. I don't really need to. I know. Yes, we're the only ones who can talk normally here exactly. now in the stadium. <laughs> We've got the privilege as Edith <laughs> continues upwards. Yeah, so the sight guides down at the bottom, they call the route for the athletes. So they've either got a radio in their ears. Occasionally, they'll shout up like the Japanese team well, do. We will see later on. <laughs> yeah, they're coming in a bit. But Edith right now on hold number six, creeping the feet around. And Sebastian, that relationship between the site guide and the athlete, we have a video on the World Climbing Club with uh, Chaz and Alana, who are coming on later. But it's a unique one. It's a special connection. Definitely, definitely. The site guide who's announcing the holes and the direction reads the route like all the other athletes before the climbing session. Six minutes do we have for the observation time. And uh, in this six minutes, the site guide tries to figure out the way to climb the route. So the site guide for sure has to be a climber as well. He has to be able to climb the grade, to read the route and to figure out what's the best option for the athlete here. And for that, the site guide needs to know exactly the style of climbing of the athletes that need to do a lot together to just be able to find the right solution for the athlete here. Well, Edith has a complicated series of moves coming up, lots of cross-throughs coming here, and this can be hard. And that 3D nature of the route as well, that makes it difficult. Definitely, it makes it really difficult. And the way the athletes are guided here is mostly with the clock system. That means, for example, the side guy says, no, big jack, 12 o'clock. Then he would maybe say Langsam left, uh, no, right hand, one o'clock, match. And uh, there's also some discussion backwards and forward going on. Maybe we can hear a bit of that as well. Um, yeah, I have asked one day for that to be patched through to the commentary box because I think it'd be great to hear that communication going on. We can on. hear it very silent in the background. I hope it's also on the live stream. Um, Sometimes the communication gets, I would say, a bit direct. I mean, we're not <laughs> proper for broadcasting <laughs> because of some, some few hard words, words, perhaps. Yes, uh, because of hard discussions are going on in a way like this is not working this way. You try to figure out something new while you're getting pumped and pumped and pumped, and you think, okay, this is going to be it. 
Well, Edith has a tricky right foot here because it's blocked. She's right on the edge of it, and there is some dual tax in there as well, making things even more difficult. Creeping the left hand up. Now getting there with all the RP3 ladies before we're resting a bit. Yeah, they found a shake out here. Edith, I mean, a bit of an endurance expert, tends not to use those rests. But the endurance of these athletes is phenomenal because if you can't see where you're going to next, you have to have good lock-off power. You have to have strength. Yeah, meanwhile, her side guys running around on stage. They have to be very careful, by the way, not to fall off the stage. Has happened before. That's a very good point. I've never actually thought of that. Yeah, that's, yes. uh, that's something they want to avoid. So the route here on these big holes, she's really got to get wrapped up and involved in it, trying to find something for that left foot, perhaps some kind of a drop knee. Some athletes need only announcement for the hands and they can remember the footholds uh, from the, what they felt before. And this way they then can, uh, so to say, use it, which makes the announcement process much quicker and much more efficient. Some need then uh, extra information for their feet as well, depending also a lot on experience the athlete has together with the side guide. Yeah, and with this category, because as we said, we need silence in the arena, we'll have one category climbing at a time. So before we had uh, two groups of athletes, with this we only have one group. So we start off with women's B1, we then move on to men's B1, men's B2, and then uh, we follow after that. But these first couple are uh, alone on stage, which again just ramps up that tension in the arena. Definitely, no one's allowed to say anything now in the arena that our side guide here can give the perfect information up to the athletes because as they have a headset and there would be too much sound around, the microphone would pick it up as well and then the athlete's ear would get bombed with the full sound. I tried it once in a normal climbing gym directing a teammate of me and this is, can be really, really painful. Well, Edith falls high up on the route. She needed a big right-hand cross route starting to burn out on that left. So either Scheinecker covers down, she's uh, a little bump of the head, yeah. An unexpected move that, and a real committing throw over. Definitely. You may be wondering why she's wearing a hat. The simple answer to that is to secure the headset. We have seen headsets falling off stage because they had unhappy encounters with the rope. And this is the easiest way to prevent that, by the way. Absolutely. Well, we've got uh, Amy in the commentary box who will be joining us in a minute after this category, if that's okay. Amy from Switzerland will be representing. That was the throw-through move. She got it, but feet very low, super stretched out, hard to pull from there. She already spent a long time on the wall, and it's really, really overhanging there. Our blind athletes also have six minutes, like all the others, and so they have to be quick, and as you said, they have lots of, lots of endurance, but... Sunida, sorry, just walking on Sunida that was uh, hyping up the crowd as she walked through. <laughs> she seems to be psyched and just cannot wait to get on the wall. Yeah, Sebastian was saying earlier that there was a couple of restless nights within Team Germany, and I would imagine that's across all of the teams here. Uh, definitely, yes. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> yeah, the feeling in here, very different. Climbing in a stadium, and, you know, considering the other World Cups we've had, obviously Innsbruck, massive arena, but it doesn't feel quite like this. It's a difference. It's a difference. It's a big difference, especially here with the big screens, the Boulder World, right next to it, the Speed World there as well, all together. And the well-known World Cup, World Championship format. Yeah, it's all different, all to play for. Right, Sonida pulls on from the USA, part of women's B2, the B, the visually impaired category. And remember, one to three, that is the severity of the impairment. One being the most impaired, three the least. And Sonida, a good start, but tricky feet down here. Although they are big, they're angled in a way that you have to uh, hit the right part of it, which is solid on that right foot. And then wraps the arm around, changes it more into a sort of a side pull. Our B2 athletes have vision left, so they have a limited visual field. That means the angle, what they see. Some see, for example, just something in the upper corner of their eye or just uh, like looking through a pipe and slash or a limited visual acuity. That means how sharp is that what you see there. No matter if you have both or just one impaired, you're grouped together in the same squad class. And uh, so B2 has vision left. So aside to the information that she gets from her side guide, she has her own visual information that she can feed into that. Uh, in some cases, that might just be uh, 
like looking through a pipe and you have to scan the wall and having a lot of head movements going up and down into the side. In some cases, um, if they have the so-called peripheral view, they may see, for example, their feet and their hands at the same time, which is a big advantage, by the way. Uh, in this sport, in other sports, just the central view, which will help you. But um, so there is a difference. And sometimes they have also problems with the visual processing capability. So that means the speed, how fast can you process in your brain what you see there? And for example, some see something like a snowstorm going on. So, so and some see colors, some don't see colors. Um, so visual impairment is very, very hard to describe and also hard to compare. So Ruta just tried to uh, get to offer a good contrast in between the wall and the holes to give them the best equal chance to compete here in equal conditions. Yeah, that's what we're looking for. And I think the contrast thing is worth pointing out. So it's an important point to make. Well, she's making good process at progress at the moment. Up to 19, needs to get to 28. That big cross-through move that Edith fell on. Some big names to come. Abigail Robinson qualifying for GB in uh, first position, so she'll climb in last. And before that, Linda Lebon, also from Team Austria. She's new in the competition season since this season. But in the meantime, let's see what Team USA can do on the wall. Yeah, so good climbing. She makes the match, but there's some a big move coming up all the way out towards that EP sign on the left. She makes it with confidence there. Definitely. And before she swung the rope around her head, also dangerous because she didn't secure her headset in any way. So she's confident that it should hold this way. Yeah, that has happened in comps. We have lost headsets. At that point, the uh, sight guide will be shouting up at the route for sure. Exactly. Now, she's missed the intermediate, gone all the way up to the big dish. And it's hard to see that intermediate in the shadows. So perhaps a decision by the, the, the sight guide, maybe a, a bit of an error, but she's matching over the top of her hand. The sight guide would have to get back, I think, off stage to see that. Yeah, and then the crowd erupts as she falls. They're waiting, I tell you. It's not like no one's uh, supporting the athletes here. They just are waiting for that moment where they fall so they can show their appreciation. Exactly. Voices raising up, applause here in the arena. That's the only moment where they're not allowed to make some noise. Well, they're released for a second and you can hear the music started to go once again. So good climb from Sunida. She moves into second position, 28. Only uh, a point and a plus behind. Oh, no, sorry. She's actually been upgraded on us. So 29 plus for her and Edith, 28. So our new high point. And let's watch this move again. She was matching over the top of her hands. Needed a huge move up. Couldn't quite do it. She leaves the stage looking happy. A good performance from her. And waiting back is Linda Lebon from Austria. She started competition climbing this year on the international the international climbing scene. So, um, and she did really, really well in the past competitions, getting more and more um, confidence and experience. And now she's in her first World Championships final, starting as the second to the last. That means she qualifies as second in... Uh, in the qualification round, which is a really, really, really good performance for someone as a newcomer on stage. It's been a good year for her, but of course, as we know, experience does count for something in these situations. Not only with climbing, but just how to manage, how to deal with but everything that's going on. Sometimes there's a lack of not knowing what's going to happen, but only for the first time. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ISO can be a strange place as a newcomer, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, Linda has uh, checked out the first couple of holds, preparing things with the sight guard. She's almost ready to go. Last bit of communication important. Super lightweight harness as well, trying to uh, minimize the amount of baggage that she's carrying up with her because endurance, as I said, is so important for these visually impaired climbers. And initially, tried to go up to the footholds, that jib on the corner, decided to change into a left hand, a better position, but... Yeah, a bit of a difficult start for her immediately off the ground here. Yeah, the, the, the starting sequence with those volumes, it's, uh, it's looking really, really interesting. <laughs> because not, not the usual hole to pull on. No, and, and it's one of those things we see it a lot last night as well. Just tricky beginnings to unsettle the athletes a little bit. Yeah, and normally what I, what I really, really need is a good start to feel comfortable in the route. That the first few movements are in a good flow that I feel like, okay, I feel welcome. 
uh, on stage welcome in the route if that's not working you will have a hard time up there maybe you you crimp too hard in the beginning you you you, you pull too hard and that costs energy that costs a lot of energy and also confidence and once the head game is on in a bad way you're off yeah, you can't win a route down low, but you can lose a route down there. So uh, an important start. But she looks a little more comfortable now as she enters the overhang. She's got to be climbing confidently through here because it's hard to reverse something this steep if she makes a mistake. Gets her right foot up. A bit of a knee scum out by her hand. Precision with the feet now she's, uh, she's moving here. Looking way more comfortable from that change from volumes into holds. Definitely. I'm always surprised about the footwork precision from uh, our visually impaired athletes because they need to feel a lot if they are right on there or not because just they cannot see it that that in in in, in all, like we can see it you know also very important not stepping on any bolts or other features on the wall that might not then uh, must not be used uh, but in this competition we have like before those bolt covers being mounted on the wall to protect athletes from getting disqualified by just using something which was not supposed to be used. Yeah, utter nightmare, worst case scenario that. So thank you to the setters. And you can see one of those bolt covers on the uh, top middle of your screen there, the black surface. It's no text yet. You wouldn't want to stand on it anyway, but as you said, it protects the athletes from any kind of appeal process. But her feet are on dual text here on the left. Right foot good on the jib, but that left foot struggling to find some friction. Yeah, but no toe hicking. Well, it's more like a jam in there and solving it in a good way. Yeah, good climbing there. She figures out that tricky sequence. And uh, now she needs to move to the right. Shoulder moves required here. She drops from left to right and almost the lay backing up there. Definitely. And this short back shows the real angle of the wall. It is steep and costs a lot of energy. All right, she's got that again. Kind of a toe jam right at the back that's, of that that's volume. That's really, really good technique. It's really good technique. Yeah, so. Camming it, twisting it in. Yeah, foot jamming technique here in park climbing finals. Very, but. very interesting. You don't want to have that back on stage oh. when you fall, but she got it out. Really, yeah. really good. You can see how good that toe jam was. It stayed yeah, for a couple stayed. of seconds. Yeah. So, so when I do track climbing, my biggest fear is always when I fall uncontrolled that something stays in. I think that's a lot of crack climbers fear, that one. It's, uh, it's a nasty feeling when you can feel your fingers uh, yes. leaving that surface. Or good hand jams and feet jams and then your hands pop. Oh. Better don't think too much about that. Absolutely. We'll ignore that for the time being. Well, Linda LeBon comes down. Currently, she's on 25. 29 plus is the high point. So she's in the bronze medal position. And this is where it started to unravel. She had the good right hand, tried to find some kind of a cross. That's the left toe we were talking about. Bump the right hand up. But there's one more to come. Abigail Robinson from Team Great Britain, who has been always, always the gold medal favorite. <laughs> she has so experienced. That was the slide down the left foot. As we said, it was good enough to hold her there. But Linda in a bronze medal position, but of course, and I think having a little word with the site guide there, what, happened what was there? going on. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that relationship, although it is good, as we mentioned, there can be occasional moments of friction between the two of them. Definitely. Definitely. Uh, here is Abigail Robinson. Team Great Britain were, uh, when I was walking around the arena trying to find Amy earlier on, they were lined up in front, all of them cheering on, and, and lots of the teams gathering together. It's, it's really good to see. And able-bodied athletes in the arena as well, watching. So yes, I saw also Team Germany members before. Uh, so Alex Mago's watching uh, the whole uh, able body uh, stuff and uh, coaches here around. So thank you for being here and thank you for supporting us because we support them as well when they are climbing. Yeah, very good point. Alex is actually a regular at para climbing events. It's good to see him here. Right, so Abigail has this sequence. Needs to calm herself down, ignore the crowd, which she must know are watching and waiting in silence behind her. Oh, interesting grab there on the volume. Yeah, much better. We saw Linda struggle with that sequence, but Abigail wraps herself around it, a nice drop knee, and then brings the left up to find the jib. Which again, I mean, the confidence to find that within that volume and stand on it is, uh, shows her trust in the sight guide as well. Abigail has lots of experience in competition climbing, and she, has, she seems to have a really good visual processing capabilities because she is so quick. 
She's really, really quick, and being B2 means she has the least uh, visual own information left that we have among the other sport classes in paraclimbing. B3 can see even more, and she's doing a fantastic job here. Yeah, she is confident, locked in that heel down low. Now, flags, outside flag, and then again the heels. Big rock up, and that'll be taking a lot of pressure off the arms, which she'll need if she needs to progress through this overhang. Blow some chalk off, and again a heel up. Left hand buried deep into that jug. Focused climbing from her. I would bet we could see a top here from Abigail. <laughs> Big claim from Sebastian in the commentary box. Left yes. to wait and see. Commentator's curse is a thing. <laughs> so Abigail, if it happens, apologies from Sebastian. Now she's got the uh, right foot where Linda had a left toe jam in. Yeah, interesting solution for that. Hooking on the other volume. Now trying to see matching holes and continuing to the left. Good pacing from her as well. She's moving. You don't want to move too slowly on a route like this. You can't hang around and she's taking the rest where necessary. Not waiting unnecessarily. Straight arms, looks back at the crowd. I think she wants a bit of something from them. Yeah, she does. <laughs> Fair play. So, Someone is feeling really confident on the wall. <laughs> she is, isn't she? It doesn't have uh, any issues so far as she stands up. And she's still in the steepest part of the wall, now nearing the head wall. Some of our visually impaired athletes like if they get some cheering from the crowd here and there. Well, it's worth remembering, she's also won this thing by now. She's on 35, nearest rival is 29 plus, so that's a gold medal from Abigail. So a bit of a victory lap at the end for her. So, Abigail, can you show us the top as I promised? Well, you did claim this, Sebastian, yeah. <laughs> so uh, she it's rocks not, up. It's not, it's not my route, but uh, it's... Uh, Come on. Now we see, and she, uh, she's resting in a different way. She's just standing on the volume where, um, where Cristiano was uh, sitting on, if I remember correctly. Yeah, she was sitting on that. Where um, Abigail's left hand is, she had a little perch up there. And she's on 40. This could be a top and time, not an issue. Let's see how she can solve the, the jump there. If, if she's going to jump, if she's um, trying it statically with a better foot position, she's, I think she has from her... Can she reach it? Yes, she has the extra centimeters to reach the hold in a static way. Didn't need the Incredible. jump. Incredible. Oh, but holds the swing with the left arm. And we have seen a top. So and that's there brilliant. it is. Our, our expert co-commentator here <laughs> nailed that sequence. Brilliant from Sebastian. You called it. She's got the gold medal. So Abigail Robertson wins again. She's uh, had multiple gold medals. And Snyder in second, Edith Jainek at third, Linda LeBon in fourth. Great, great, great performance. It was, right. Well, Sebastian, look, not only have you been climbing, you've also been talking for a long time. So if you don't mind for a little bit, we'll tag you out, bring you back in a minute as we bring Amy into the commentary box. So you have a rest. Yes. Have a drink. <laughs> Enjoy your fourth place for a second. And Thank we'll see you. you whenever you want to return in a couple of categories time. Thank you very much, Matt, and see you later. You better not go anywhere, though. I need you later on, no, my friend. No, I will stay here around, but uh, we switch the microphones. All right. Well, we'll bring Amy into the commentary box from Switzerland. I had her in Innsbruck in the commentary box, and uh, what I want is to see a Swiss athlete representing here. So, Amy, I feel like I've seen you everywhere. You were on the, uh, the opening ceremony on stage. You've been on multiple TV cameras. I've nabbed you for media as well. So tell me, being a Swiss athlete in the stadium, it must be a special feeling. Um, it was very special because, yeah, I mean, I live 10 minutes from here. So um, it was so amazing. It was uh, mind-blowing. And all my friends were here. My mother came from Crisson. And, um, yeah, it felt so nice. And you're talking to me, so you didn't make the finals, but you're fairly new into this sport, so uh, just working your way into it at the moment. Yes, I'm, I still am, but I have to say it was so close in our group for the final spot, and I'm so happy with my performance, and the routes were awesome, and, I mean... It's the first World Championships for me. It's my second season. I still have a lot of time. 
for that final to come. And it's nice to be here back with you. So <laughs> Exactly. I mean, I'm disappointed. Obviously, you didn't get in, but I do get your expertise. Now, Jesse Dufton approaches the wall, and Jesse is fascinating. He's an outdoor trad climber as much as he's an indoor climber. This man, I think he's climbed up to E3, which is an English, uh, very weird system to describe grades. But I cannot imagine trad climbing where you place protection as you go as a visually impaired climber. It's, for me, who gets scared on trad routes, a terrifying prospect. Yeah, I can imagine that must be very terrifying. I mean, it's for normal able-bodied people it's it's hard and he is so strong and he claps with such a um, calmness so I can imagine he he can do everything he wants so and if we talk about partnerships I mean his sight guide is his life partner as well they travel the world together and she's guiding him up those scary trad routes that I was talking about so the bond between them is something else and uh, he's about to get underway on the left hand side and we know this route it's pretty climbable from earlier on. Some big holds down low, but then things ramp up on the overhang. I haven't really watched at this route because uh, my, my Swiss girl was on the... <laughs> <laughs> Your attention was elsewhere. Yeah, my attention was elsewhere. And um, I just saw the AU2 guys a bit struggling in the final part of the overhang. But yeah, we all know that the B categories climb very high up and they are so strong, so I'm excited to see what we're going to witness here. The men's B1 category is the most visually impaired, and they wear masks so to completely uh, nullify any sight. And have you seen Jess's mask? That's brilliant. Bright green, and it's got a, what looks like frog eyes on it. Yeah, I saw it. It's so fun. <laughs> <laughs> but they, they get creative with their mask. I mean, one of the Japanese athletes has eyes on it, and they are so funny. Yeah, I think Jess's got eyes on that, so... Uh, that's a little bit of humour here in a very serious World Championships, which I quite like to see, to be honest with you. So, Jesse is underway. Brings up the right foot slowly, slowly towards the jib on the foothold. Stands up with that bent arm. Yeah, if you, uh, if I confused you by E3s and all that uh, English trad grades, and you can find the information online, but just trust me, pretty terrifying. So, he's got uh, a lot of guts, this man. Left foot searching for a hold there, hits the jib that time. And it's Jess's endurance that is so impressive to me. He can just hang on forever. Yeah, I mean, he climbs very slow, so he must have arms of steel. <laughs> Good way of describing it, yeah. <laughs> Jesse Dufton, the, uh, the superman of the climbing world. Well, he's searching right now with that right foot, now gets it in, and he'll be able to put a bit of pressure through it, but that was a moment down low. He's on hold 11. Reaches out with the left, but drops back down. Yeah, the hold looks better from here than it is to hold on, I think. You have to get on the best spot on the hold, because down there they are not so good. In the middle they are great, and on more up they are bad. <laughs> so. Yeah, you need to hit the right part of it. You're right, and you can see there the right hand gets buried deep into it finds a toe and leaning backwards straight arm resting from Jesse and has the left hand as well but yeah you can see that left side of that hold not as good as in the middle and he decided to move through it comes up with the left yeah and he wanted that heel you could see he turned the heel and momentarily mm. into a toe then reversed back into the heel And switches. <laughs> and switches again. So Jesse having a couple of moments of hesitation. He's on 15. Has the toe buried deep. And oh, yeah, yeah, there you see the mask. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> so a great mask. Wraps his hand around, closed off that crimp. Trusting it, but that right foot still causing problems. You can see the issue because he needs to bump out towards the right, but that knee right underneath his body. Yeah, but the foothold isn't that good, I think. It looks better than it is. So maybe that's a bit of a point. Yeah, and yet he's leaving it now. He's trying to get that left foot down, but Jesse struggling round about oh, oh, on 16. Uh, that's good strength. He yeah, touched the there bottle it hold. Is. Yeah, now he's in. And now he should be able to adjust those feet. 
all about body position out there and trust as well. Smears on the black volume. But still the feet don't look so comfy there. And he's got a bit of a knee in, not a knee bar, but just using it maybe to find out the hold. Mm. Makes the match, wraps around. You can see not the best of holds, pretty slopey from that angle. Left foot right towards the edge of the wall as he reaches up above his head. And he's low on this, needs to upgrade that right foot, which he does now. And then he needs to cross over, I think. With, oh. oh, he's going for a huge high heel here. Yeah, the feet don't look comfy. No, and he no. struggles, falls, slapping up to the volume. 21 is a good store for Jesse, our first athlete out. But there are some big names to come, so we have to wait and see if that's good enough. But Jesse's afternoon is done. And he takes off that mask. And we see his actual eyes there underneath the frog eyes. <laughs> but it's cool that they bring the blind categories in the middle of the competition. So everyone is already here watching. That's so nice. Yes, it can be strange at the beginning of a competition because we have all this hype mm. and then obviously we have to settle down for the visually uh, impaired category. So I think you're right. It's a, a nice change of order. So you can see that right hold, not as good as it looked. It's not a jug. Trying to rock up, bumped, and if he had hit that hold, I think he would have stuck it, but yes. he was too far to the left. All right, Shoaita is called onto the mats, and goodness me, have I watched this man do a lot of climbing <laughs> competitions. He's so cool. It's fun. I met them on the train station when they newly arrived. I was working last week, so when they came, they didn't recognize me because I wasn't wearing my Swiss team attire, and they were so nice and had, uh, they were so happy to see, to see me, and that I came up to them and that's what paraclimbing is all about. It's so nice that everyone is happy that everyone is here. So It's such a good community, mm -hmm. isn't it? It really is. And you can go and watch some uh, highlights we did the other day of the qualifying, some wonderful shots from our talented camera crew on the World Climbing Club that's on YouTube. Now, Shoaita has this style. He is quite slow in the way he climbs. Mm -hmm. And I have no idea how he stays on the wall that long. Just grinds his way through these routes. And he's much more um, feeling the holds than you see other athletes. I think he does a lot of touch. Yeah, yeah you can see him feeling things out. And myself and Sebastian talked about this earlier, but most teams use a radio system. Team Japan, forget that, they shout up at the wall. And although we'd love, obviously, to hear exactly what they're saying, I don't understand Japanese, but hopefully some people at home do. Yeah, and it's so cool that they do that, even in Innsbruck, where the wall is outside and it's so high. And it's so emotional when you hear the guide down there, when, they, when, they are, when you hear how proud they are on their athletes, and it's so cool. It is. Team Japan is strong in all types of climbing. And show on the good bit of that, of that hold, right on the right of it, and now searching around, he has got other options available. Now he finds that hand. And that's the strength I mean. His lock-off power is unreal. Mm -hmm. Searches for it, hits that blue hold. And now the body position changes as he starts to lay back this next section, upgrading the left. And nearing Jesse Dufton's high point, wraps his fingers around that black hold. Doesn't seem to struggle that much with the feet. No, crosses through. You can see the, the process. He listens to the sight guy, hears it, commits to the move, and then just sort of hangs as he gets the finite mm -hmm. instructions on exactly where to go. That right thumb pressing in. I'm trying to see if that is dual texture. It could be for the thumb. I think yeah, it, is. it is. There's a little bit of texture on it right on the edge. You can hear the Japanese coach there shouting. A pause for a sec so you can listen to that. 
Big drop knee from Shoaita, gets the rope out of the way, and he's moved into the provisional top spot. 26 and still going. And he looks so calm. Yeah, this is a difficult section. I, I said earlier, it reminds me of sort of two foot like moves when you're outdoor climbing. You know I'm a newbie, right? <laughs> <laughs> we'll go climb. I'll show you some twofers. It's my absolute nightmare to climb. Okay. But uh, yeah, they, they created sort of long funnels of rock. He's got a left foot on the jib, creeps it up towards Great. the jib on the slope. But Shawaita is nearing the head wall here. echoing throughout the stadium from his sight guide. And a big move from Shoaita, but he needs to find the undercling, locks it in, but goes back down, and I think he'll have a shake and a readjust of position here. Yeah, I think he's a bit too far on the left. Yeah, so the first moment we show Sho really start to struggle, whacks in a heel. And a good position with two heels in. It's Brooke Rabatu like as he's uh, hanging up there just below yes, the head wall. That's, that's amazing. And you can hear the crowd. They know what that meant. That's a tricky sequence yeah. to get through. And I told you that he doesn't let go. He doesn't. <laughs> I mean, he's going to have to fall off to let go of this man. Getting the encouragement of the sight guide. We're hitting some gambas. And now he's on the head wall. Still steep, but not that steep. Yeah, about 15 degrees. So it changes from 40 to 15, so a relief for the arms. But technical climbing coming up. Mm -hmm. You can see that touch he does. He points towards where he thinks he should go. And there's a series of crimps here, but the body position is awkward. Nothing really for the left foot apart from that volume. I know the hands are positive. He needs to do that unwind, which he does with the shoulder. Tricky sequences here for Shoaita. But he's still on. <laughs> yeah, that left hand locked off with the crimp. Dual tech surface. He's going to have to find a shake out. There is a jib available. This high foot, it's miles to the right, if that's the one he's aiming for. He has got a blue jib up by his left knee. Yeah, and Shoaita falls, but that is a that pretty... That was a massive effort. Yeah, 42. I mean, when we look at Jesse's score down at 21+, plus, almost double as high. Yeah. Good work from Shoaita. And you can see the pump on his left. He's trying yeah. to stretch it out as he comes down. And a round of applause from the audience as they're allowed to celebrate with the athletes. So, no top. And we're used to seeing him top. And he qualified fairly low down for him as well. Yeah, normally he's on top. <laughs> yeah. All right, Razavan Nerdu is on from Romania. And I actually went climbing with him uh, a couple of years ago. Oh, really? Yeah, he was, uh, he was great to spend time with, part of that Romanian team, which is so experienced as well. Yeah, and his guide is pretty nice too. 
we flew in this uh, to Salt Lake City, we were on the same plane. Sorry, <laughs> and they are so nice, everyone of this of this team, and yeah, it's amazing what they what they do. Yeah, it is. So he brings up the right foot, pressing down. And he's, uh, he starts this route, and it's a bit of a journey, this route. We know how long it is <laughs> and how high you have the potential to get. Two athletes to come in his men's B1 category. He's got that right foot on, presses down on it. Hits the side pull, but we know technically how difficult this first section is. Yeah, it's not easy and the holds aren't as good as they look, so still a challenge for the athletes. Yeah, an absolute challenge. He's got the right hand wrapped around now, makes the match. And he's underneath the black volume. This next series of holds, difficult as we saw with Jesse and with Shoaita to know exactly where to hold them. We saw Sho try to skip some of those sections. Makes the match now. And he has that right hand wrapped around the thumb in action. And there it is. That's a great ah, shot. But that's a great hold. <laughs> if you have it on the right spot. Yeah, and now he's got his left hand. And that was the hold that Sho missed. So he decided to cross all the way mm -hmm. up. And that's where, where um, Jesse struggled the first time. Yeah, it was where Jesse struggled. You're right. He tried to make that lower match, yes. changed his mind a few times. And now he's up towards the jug, hits that jug with the right hand. That's all about the feet, and he hasn't found the jib. Now he no, gets it. Yeah. It was too slopey to stand on without that. But that's a bad foothold. <laughs> It is, you're right. There's not a lot of good surface to stand on. No. There's the jug with the right forearm. Feels his way through these sections. Yeah, it's always a left to the right and back again. In this route, it's... <laughs> Slowly getting covered in chalk. Looks <laughs> like it's been snowing up there. Yeah, it's, it suits. It's a nice hockey arena, so... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is indeed. Yeah, it is a nice hockey arena, yeah. that's true. Yeah, we're standing in uh, in where the ice would be. Oh, no, I think we're on the edge of it, and then where the audience and the... We're uh, in the two-minute... Um <laughs> we're the timeout zone. Yeah. <laughs> We've been naughty. We're in, the, we're in the bad corner. Yeah, the stadium, a multi-sport stadium. But this last couple of weeks, it's been handed over to the climbing community, and we're loving it at the moment. Thank you to everyone who's organised it, the Swiss Federation. They did a good job. It's cool. Yeah, they did. And only two days left after this. Oh, yeah, don't say it. I don't know if I'm happy or sad about that. <laughs> it's been a big one. That's the clock. Two minutes 35 on it. We'll let you know if he's getting close to that limit. But he's climbing fairly slowly at the moment. Slowly but steady. Yeah, he's just got to keep working upwards. And there's his sight guide, giving him those precise instructions he needs. Yeah, the sight guides tend to use a clock-style system. So if you imagine, well, I know these guys do. So you imagine 12 at the top and then 6 down low. And they can work out exactly where to reach through by using those numbers. Have you ever tried doing it? I have tried doing it, yes. And it was really hard. I and scary. I'm so bad at this. Yeah, it's... um. Yeah, it's full on. So he brings his right hand up with the pinch in. Those are nice shots. Yeah, he's got the left locked off, thumb wrapped over the top. And look at that left foot creeping vertical. There's not a lot to stand on there, and yeah, he doesn't want to trust it, as you can see. Mm. Struggling now. You hear the breathing. And yeah, he and falls. I think he gave it everything on that reach through. So that means Shoaita 
is still in the lead with 42 plus. Javier Francisco on next. He has the dog, right? Javier is the one with the dog. I'm not too sure, to be honest. The the golden retriever that's walking around. Yeah. No, it's a golden lab, I think. Golden lab, sorry. Yeah, uh, yeah I have no idea. I've seen the dog. There are a few dogs. There are a few <laughs> dogs. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to say. I'm trying to match dogs to owners here. <laughs> yeah, that was the left foot. That was tricky. He needed it probably a little bit higher up. Oh. And then to get the arm out of this press. Yeah, exactly. Hard. I think that would have changed things for him. All right, well, we're last athletes. And then, uh, Amy, I know you want to go and uh, be with the Swiss team, so feel free after that. But uh, our climber comes on. Final climb on his route. Javier Francisco Mondo from Spain, takes off the jumper. Can't believe wearing a jumper. Yeah, that, no, I mean, his mask. Oh, this is the mask. Yeah, this one is so funny. <laughs> it is cool. It comes right down over his nose, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah I think I'd do the same. Oh, a fancy mask is definitely key. Well. Oh, and his trunk bag is a mammoth. <laughs> oh, yeah, it is. So, yeah, trunk and uh, tusks pointing out towards us. I would imagine that adds some weight to him, <laughs> but... Uh, He's not worried about it. And his ears sticking out sideways. Well, now we've uh, critiqued the dress code, we can now critique the climbing. And he's underway. <laughs> All right, so watch that right foot when it pulls off the ground. He's in. Finds the side pull with the left hand. Little adjustments. And now matches the hand to foot. Look how spread out our top three are currently. Shall yeah, I? it's like 10 points or 10 holes difference between each. Yeah, so a big difference. Climbing a little quicker than our other athletes on this bottom section. Crosses through with the left hand and a big bump up with the right. Yeah, you hear the the uh, shoes hit the wall. <laughs> yeah, our uh, camera crew have rigged microphones behind the wall so we can really hear the action. Every bang and clip and thunk. <laughs> thunk is a British word. That Four. means bang, really. Okay. I just quite like it. Funk is when you when you bang with the with the foot. Yes, like a thunk. T h u n k. Ah. Okay. Thunk. Okay. <laughs> I never Fun. thought I'd say that on that. <laughs> All right. Well, he is uh, making good progress here. Right hand on and a side pull. And quick. Yeah, very quick at the moment, and he's approaching Jeff and Dustin's uh, position. Certainly has potential to get on the podium here, and he's only a couple of moves away from that. 18 at the moment, 21 plus needed. His left hand locked in, can't find a foot at the moment, then gets it in. And questioning with the guide exactly where to go. You could hear him ask a question. We haven't heard that many athletes talking back to the yeah. side guides. Communication, yeah. crazy. And very soon, this is going to move him onto the podium. There it is, there so he's the third yeah. place. 22. Fascinating to hear these sequences. Look at that drop knee. That's strong climbing from him. Yeah, his toe pressing down. So it was a sort of upside down drop knee. Oh, powerful sequence though as he tries to lock up that left arm. He needs to find the foot. Now he's got it in. Drop knee again. And he has to cross. Oh, yes. So he chalks up, has a moment to shake, and needs to go all the way to the left 
of that blue volume. Matching with his hands. There it is, wrapping the fingers over the top. Close to second position now. Yeah, 31 plus needed to move into that silver medal position. And this is the sequence we saw Razavan fall on, but the drop knees again. This man's a master of those. Amazing. And he'll know from that reaction from the crowd that he's done something pretty special. He's got a silver medal at the moment. That's a silver medal, yeah. Can he beat Shoaita? Needs to drop into this undercling. It's a big move. Sets himself, tries to find the heel again. His footwork has been perfect. You can see the sweat really struggling. Wants to jump, misses the left hand on the undercling, and he falls. And men's B1 is done. But that was a very strong fight from him. Yeah, strong work as he comes down now. So uh, that's the B1 category done, giving a hug to the side guy who ignores him for a second. Still with the mask. <laughs> still with the mask on. And now he lifts up that mask. And this was the movie drop, so he saw the undercling. Wait, sorry. Bad choice of words. He didn't <laughs> see the undercling. <laughs> Terrible choice of words from Matt. That, but uh, he uh, he, knew, he was told that the undercling was there. Had to do this bump. Needed to commit to the left hand to drop into it. Missed it on the left. Yeah, and Cho went with the right and then with the left. He doubled it before he went further. All right. Well, Amy, look. Thank you so much for joining me here today. I know you're a busy woman at these World Championships. Ah, no, now I'm enjoying it. I'm on holiday now. <laughs> <laughs> so, hey, see you later. Thank you for having me. I'll see you later. Goodbye to you at home. I hope to see you soon. And yeah, Thank have you, fun. Amy. See you later, Amy. Thank you. All right, well, we're going to bring in an athlete who was competing earlier on in a second from the USA, a man I've wanted to have in the commentary box for quite a while because he's had an incredible season. So. Let's bring in Brian here into the commentary box as we uh, welcome him to it. Brian, first of all, congratulations on that climb. How was it out there? Thank you. It's uh, First of all, it's so awesome to be here. I've always wanted to be here too, and so I'm so glad it finally worked out. But um, climb was awesome. The energy in this room is awesome. It's definitely an amazing opportunity to finally be out here. Exactly. Well, uh, you talk about the energy, and I watch Team USA as well. Team USA has a big presence here, and you guys have traveled a long way to be here. Has this been the focus of your season? Yeah, no, definitely. You can see how much all of Team USA has been training. I think we had one of the biggest teams we've ever had before. Um, something over 50 athletes show up to this event. And of that, we've had our record-breaking 12 athletes actually make through to finals. And so it's been awesome, and you can feel the energy backstage. You can feel the energy up here and when you actually come out and kind of see the crowd. And it's like, there's nothing quite like it and it's definitely been something that since the start of the season everyone kind of geared geared it up since last season on training to go into nationals and kind of like make this the focus of the year absolutely and, and i was lucky enough to visit salt lake earlier on in mm -hmm. the season for that competition where, where are you based in the u.s um i was actually born and raised in new york city but now i live in um right out of baltimore in maryland okay a good place to, to go climbing and training uh possibly not the best if you want to go out there climbing but um there's Fair amount of gyms and a lot of good um, access if you want to do a lot of bit of training. Awesome. Well, look, right, just tell us before we, before we talk about this next category, um, tell us a bit about your category that you climb in. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I climb in men's AU2. AU2 meaning um, I'm an upper extremity amputee. Two just meaning that, I'm, uh, am that my missing limb is between my elbow and my forearm. Um, but yeah, so... Most, me and most of the athletes in my category are congenital, although there are some that did have an accident, and that's how they ended up placing my category. Okay, so you're climbing with the stump of your arm, and mm -hmm. I can see, looking at it now, it's you've got like uh, where where the where you've been rubbing against <laughs> the holds. It looks brutal. Yeah, so that's actually a big thing, and I actually just dropped a video recently with um, Adidas Rex about it, about the kind of choice to wear tape versus not wearing tape when you climb. And so for me, I've decided to 
I don't know, maybe a w one or two years ago that I wasn't going to wear tape when I climb inside or at competitions anymore. Wow, well, that's crazy. We're going to watch Brian's climb from earlier on. But right now, we're with Yumi Edri from Japan. And Brian, the, the atmosphere in the stadium, it's so different for the visually impaired category. Because yours, they're cheering away. Here, we have to be silent. Mm -hmm. And it does change things a little bit. Yeah, and so this is actually something that we talk about quite often. Is kind of, with the B category, you want to be cognizant of, of the fact that the callers and the climbers want to have the easiest access to communication as possible. Some teams use Bluetooth headsets in order to do that, but other teams, like the Japan team, for example, you can see the callers don't actually use um, headsets most of the time. The callers are just screaming or using a <laughs> megaphone like you see on the screen right now. <laughs> that is awesome. Truly old school going on there. And uh, yeah, then the visually com uh, impaired categories within the USA team. I mean, do you mm -hmm. train with those guys? Do you spend any time with them? Um, Unfortunately, not as much as we kind of hope, and it's mostly because we have, one, we have such a big team, and we're spread throughout all the different states in the U.S., and so we haven't had the opportunity as much as we would like to train everyone all together, but when you do get the option to climb with everyone, it's kind of amazing, especially with um, VI climbers. It's something where it's like, I think the whole gym kind of quiets down and starts watching the action happening. Um, because their lock-off strength, their ability to read routes, and that's the thing, they read routes very differently for um, um, me, you, and most other climbers um, by doing this thing called scanning. And I actually learned this talking to um, Justin Scales about it. And so, I'll see if we see an example in a minute. But, um, yeah, I'd love to learn about that, because scanning is not something I know about. Mm -hmm. So yeah, when you spot it, do let us know in that moment. But she's uh, got the right hand on a good hold there. This route winds all over the place and split into sections so we can see it. And Brian, we talked a lot about trust before. Mm -hmm. The trust in your sight guide, because when you climb, it's just you and it's up to you what you do. Whereas mm -hmm. this, it, it's a teamwork thing. Yeah, exactly. And so with this, a lot of climbers want to train right there. You saw, sorry, no, right there you saw a glimpse gone. of what she was trying to do. So the color will call off a hold and of directional of the hold and kind of where it is to your relative space. But for the climbers, oh, just yeah. nice. Yeah, Yumi falls. So it's, go on, so, so, you're, so you're feeling around for it? Yeah, and so they actually scan with either their hands or their legs based on the general direction the collar gives them to feel for their holds. And a lot of times they're feeling for the hold, the positivity of the hold and where they want to pull on it. Um, but as these climbers get better and better, they become so good and efficient at scanning that you don't even notice them doing it a lot of times on the wall. So it's feeling it out. So you use mm -hmm. a limb to feel it out, and then you decide how to use that hold if you stand on it on, on how mm -hmm. to pull on it. Exactly. So a lot of it could be related to, I think a good example might be if you're wearing soft shoes and you're kind of feeling around a hold, trying to find where that positive edge is. And a lot of climb, new climbers especially, it's like you'll grab a hold, you'll feel for it, but you want to know exactly where it is. They just become so much more in tune with that and so much more in tune with their and body positioning in 3D space for that. Yeah, well, it's good to know. I, something You can sort of see it. It's like a natural thing to watch, but it's good to know the, the terminology mm -hmm. of it. So thank you for that. Sunita from India comes on. It's good to see so many nationalities here competing. Yeah, definitely. Um, we were also trying to take a look at that before, and I lost count of how many countries we actually had representing uh, represented here in finals today. Yeah, there's a lot. I mean, I, yeah, I haven't got that in front of me, but so many countries. We can see all the flags hanging from the roof as well. There's a lot here. Yes, World Champs is a big event. And, and does it feel different from a normal World Cup? Yeah, and this is something else that me and um, some other climbers were talking about. It's the fact that paraclimbing, for paraclimbing specifically, this world and this World Championship event was very different. And the reason being, the last one was in Moscow in 2021, and obviously um, the world was a much different place then. And so with that, that event didn't have any outside, um, any outside viewership. So everyone that was in the event arena was just there because they were staff or they were um, other athletes, athletes' aides. And then the year and the World Championship event before that was in 2019 in Briançon, but that's when we were out in Briançon and the World Championships. And there was a separate World Championships in Tokyo. And so the last time we had an event kind of like this, at this scale, 
wasn't since 2018 in Innsbruck. Wow. So for a lot of climbers, we've been waiting a long time for kind of this opportunity to be on a stage this big. And so that's why everyone's been really, really hyping this one up. Yeah, it is a big one. I think I've said the World Championship so many times <laughs> in the last season. We're watching Sunita here as she moves into the purple section of the route. Nice, big hands, but it's the feet that are quite awkward. The angle of the wall pushing you back and that big black volume as well sort of forcing her into an awkward place. Has a right foot up and we had a relatively low fall, 28 plus, and she's already on 20. So, and obviously three athletes only in this category. So guaranteed a medal as soon as you get in. Exactly. And that whole decision of how many athletes go out per category, I know sometimes it can be confusing for the viewers to watch. That is entirely based on how many athletes a category has um, during qualification. So a category with anything less than anything around six athletes to, I believe I want to say eight, will have three athletes come out for finals. Eight through 15 will have four, and then 15 and above, you'll have six. Yeah, and you, you say those numbers. I mean, we've, I think it's over 200 para climbers yeah. here. That's massive for the sport. Exactly. Um, biggest turnout we've had in a long time. Crazy, isn't it? Well, these we are getting through this competition, nearing the last couple of categories. But she is moving currently yeah, up into the gold medal position. 29 given, moving above Yumi, who got 28 plus. Sunita now, for the first time really, pausing a little. Gets a heel in. That will help to rock up towards the left. Hits it, but oh. fingertips only just on there and they've done such an impressive job with setting these routes especially for i don't know i want to say especially for the b category honestly we can say for all of them something else that's happened this year is we've seen paraclimbing has been getting a lot much a lot more challenging routes than ever before and so it's been really really cool to see and so you're really seeing the athletes kind of tested to their physical limits. Yeah, I've watched dinos on a visually <laughs> impaired route, which just, to me, just seems ridiculous, but they want that challenge. Exactly. A lot of us want the ability to kind of prove ourselves and show that we're able to and capable of doing um, routes or movements that might seem impossible to other people, but it's like we've all found ways to adapt to it. And I get my ass kicked by power climbers <laughs> on a regular basis. I'm serious. Like, so, so strong. And watching you as well, like, you know, You've had a great year this year. Watching you as Salt Lake in your home crowd Thank was, you. was wicked to see. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but moving forward from these world champs, what's, what's your focus on the next year? Yeah, so, I mean, leaving this world championships, my biggest focus is um, going back into training. So I'm actually really, really excited to go into um, a new training cycle this winter. I'll actually be working with um, Lattice Training. And so it's been something that I've been wanting to do for a long time. So I'm really, really stoked to kind of see how far I can push limits in my grip strength. And I learned that from my friend, Will Bosey, actually. Have you done a lattice program before? No, not before. So this will be the first time. It's, it's real. I've done one. And honestly, it may be like so, so different as a climber. Oh, I believe it. It's brilliant. Like in terms of, for me, flexibility and just everything as an all-rounded person, I felt better. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And I feel like for paraclimbing, that's one of the things that's like, and I've learned this from talking to multiple coaches, multiple athletes. As paraclimbers, we have to learn how to push ourselves in ways that we didn't expect before. All right, well, we're watching Mika Makoa from Japan underway. Final athlete out in this B3 category. So B3 is the least impaired. But it's a hard route. And again, Team Japan choosing to shout up on the wall. Quick climbing from them brings that right hand up to a good hold. There's a toe and a jib, and these tick marks, of course, not particularly useful for the athletes, but they are there because of the other categories. And for anyone at home who might have never watched paraclimb before, especially for the B3 category, you might be a little bit confused when you see her doing stuff like now where she's looking, it seems like she's looking for holds, looking for f foot placements. That's because, like you said before, the B3 category is the least affected, but they're all affected in different ways. So that could be anything where it comes to peripheral vision. Maybe they can't see right in front of them. Maybe they have a focal point um, disability where it's like they can't see depth of space the same way we do. Yeah, I think it's so. a good point. Because you, I mean, your teammate, Justin Salas, uh, yes. he has a similar kind of thing where you can kind of see shapes going exactly. on. He explained it to us. It's kind of like looking through a pinhole for him. And so he can kind of see space, but having that, um, what's it called, that collar for you helps kind of narrow down the space that you're searching for. Yeah, go and try to go climbing looking for pinholes. I promise you it's pretty particularly difficult. 
All right, she needs to cross through with the right. Hits it first time. Nearing the high point right now. Yeah, and quickly as well. Very quickly. We haven't seen a top on this route yet. Be good to see the head wall section. Come close. Struggling with that left foot, and she's right on the bubble. This is the crux point for B3. She needs to make a move here, hanging around for a while, burning out some energy. And you can see that left hand you can starting see the right to arms give. Sure oh, oh, drops down. And I think that's left her in a silver medal position looking at that graphic. Yes, so 29, gold medal 29 plus. I mean, all grouped around there, a real cruxy section of the route. And we've just got one final visually impaired category to do, which is men's B3. Oh, sorry, two categories ago, B2 and B3. And uh, yeah, we watched that fall as she dropped down. So yeah, so new training cycle for you. So we're going to see you an absolute machine in the next year, I hope. Yeah, that's the biggest goal is um, working on a new training cycle, hopefully getting outdoors more um, is another big goal of mine. Definitely planning a trip to Red River Gorge um, later in October, and then hopefully more to come after that. And I think I'm going to, well, I know I'm going to Seagull Block in between that. Wait, what the ones that the competition that's currently running that Seeker Block Comp? Uh, not quite the not quite that one. So there's one that currently just ran in Chicago, but there's another one that happens in Montreal, um, in Canada. Last year was the first time they ever had paraclimbers up there. And if you're a paraclimber watching in anywhere of the North Americas or in the in Europe or in Asia, if you really want to make the trip, highly highly recommend. I want to it. make the trip. I want to see that. that the <laughs> Canadian water isn't known for sort of being like a lovely place to fall into. It sounds freezing. No, definitely freezing. But <laughs> thankfully, we do have a pool of fall into instead. Oh, okay, that got <laughs> you falling into the sea. That's, that sounds like my worst nightmare, falling into a Canadian sea. Yeah, I don't know if I would want to do that either. No, no, horrible, horrible. Richard <laughs> Slowcock is on from Great Britain, uh, and that is a lovely man right there. He's always happy to chat to you and usually uh, take the piss out of you as well, joke with you quite a lot. <laughs> oh, you better believe it. He does the same thing in the back in ISO too. That's good to know, because I've got savaged by Matt Man on a few occasions. Yeah, Team Great Britain at uh, I like his tattoos as well. All right, so Sight Guide goes back, and Richard approaches the wall straight into the underclings as he gets himself ready for this route. And we saw this in some of the B categories earlier on. There's a tricky hand sequence, but he's dropping down with the drop knee. Looking fairly comfortable so far. Yeah, confident start, isn't it? I mean, he's been waiting a while to come on as well, which must start to play with your nerves sitting back there in ISO. Yeah, and that's actually something he talked about, the fact that you come out and do observations in some categories. You only go back for such a short amount of time before you come back out. And so a little bit frustrating because that staging area doesn't really have much to do. And you're trying to stay warm before coming out here, especially for paraclimbers. That's a little bit difficult because you're trying to stay warm and it's hard to do that if you don't have access to the road equipment. Yeah, absolutely. It would drive me crazy, personally. So, sorry you have to do that. So, he's matching on that hold. Out with the right. And, yeah, straight in. He's already up to 16 on the score. Each hold is worth a point, And you get a plus for moving towards the next one. And that double rope system we've talked about a few times. You can see it in action there. Yeah, not ideal, I don't think, but I'm not sure what the alternative would be, but we do see a few nasty falls occasionally. Beautiful flag through there, too. But yeah, the rope system is interesting because you can't quite do lead for every category, so we can't do that, and the rope is definitely too far overhand for anyone to do um, top or boat without doing a massive swing. Yeah, that bottom rope pulls them closer to the wall to stop, as you said, that big old swing, which I think would take off most of the audience's heads. <laughs> <laughs> and Richard is setting an early high point here. First climber out, four athletes in this category. Slaps around the corner, and now he's really having to fight. Fighting through a very powerful part of the rope. Yeah, the nice. left foot is bad in him. He's choosing not to go left yet. And now, right as you said it. Yeah, hits the jib. And on top of that hold, that's good because a few athletes have been uh, using that kind of more vertically, which doesn't work as well. Ops not to take the rest there. Yeah, I think he's starting to go here. Just holds on the right. You can see catching himself on his biceps and wants a knee bar. 
That's cool. I haven't seen that before. Haven't seen any more up there. Looks awfully high. I'm not quite sure it's going to work. And he goes. He needed something back in his arms and couldn't find it. But you can see how much power he has and a great show as he comes back out. That was awesome. Okay, so you got a psycho block competition. Yeah. And you're competing in that. Yes. Oh, I'm going to watch that. I can't wait to see it. Definitely. Um, <laughs> There were talks about it being live stream. We'll see if that actually happens. But um, yeah, but it's going to be pretty in, pretty intense. I think it's going to be um, August 31st through September 4th. And again, that'll be in Montreal, Canada. That'll be right in the island in that center of the river over there. Really cool. Yeah, so keep an eye out for that one. And you're part of this Adidas um, family. And yeah. uh, you get to do quite a few trips as well through them, I think. Yeah, I, um, I was fortunate enough to be in talks with them, and I ended up signing with Adidas Rx and 510 earlier this year. Congratulations. And thank you. And so far, it's been amazing. Um, I've gone to go to Ticino in Switzerland earlier this year with a bunch of members of the team, and last year I got to go to the Petzl Rock Trip, actually, in Manikia. I was there. Well. We met each other there, yeah. I think. We bumped yeah. into I each other. I think that was the first time. Yeah. Yeah, that was an amazing trip, that. You know, a new rock climbing area, as you said, in Greece. Super hot. Brian, new routes, super sharp. Yeah, it was. It was brutal. Yeah. <laughs> we got it done. That was the knee bar he tried to get in, but, I mean, he's a tall man, and even he was, was stretched out on that knee. But it almost looked like, it almost looked possible, I want to say. I hadn't noticed. I think he had a giraffe hanging off his harness there, like a little toy giraffe. I didn't notice that. <laughs> I think no, I'll have to go back and watch. I know. I saw it getting caught in the rope. But suddenly, I think it was some kind of a toy. Raul from Spain is underway. And of course, although Richard qualified in last position, that doesn't mean he's the worst climber in this category. It all depends on those qualifying routes. And route setting does play such an important part in this comp. And I think we had to bring a route setter on later, chief route setter, to have a chat. Oh, really? I think she's, uh, she's agreed to come on, so some, uh, Shauna can grill her later on on the routes. <laughs> That'll be obvious, and that'll be interesting. I find that route setting for para is definitely, definitely difficult, and it's something that I don't know. It's like at the end of this, it, no one has yet. I want to thank all the route setters for all the hard work they've done, especially in these two weeks. But for para, especially, it's quite difficult because disabilities are so asymmetrical. And so I think the hardest thing, challenge that route setters face, face for para climbing is: Do you want to make the first hard route going to the left or to the right? How do you decide on doing that? Yeah, God, that's a really good point. And also, they've got to set for different categories as exactly. well. Exactly. I, I can't, in my mind is blown when I think about that, because trying to work out if you've got like an upper limb impairment, a lower mm -hmm. limb impairment, what works for each athlete, it's pretty yeah, imagine challenging. you're sitting in a gym at home and you're trying to decide, do you think this is something that someone with one hand can climb, but also someone missing a leg, but also someone who's blind? <laughs> oh, we falls early. Raul comes down. He was on 23, aiming for 35 plus. So that's halfway through. So after Guillermo, who comes out next, we'll be able to have a look at our podiums for this category. Yeah, setting is a fascinating thing. And when you train in commercial gyms, I mean, obviously, they haven't necessarily had power climbers in mind. Is it occasionally frustrating to have routes that just don't work for you? So that's the interesting thing. It really can be sometimes. Um, it's really difficult to go to your home gym or a gym that you might visit and try to decide is that route not meant for me? Like, is it too difficult for me because of my disability or is it just out of my current set of skills? And so kind of figuring out that fine line in between because it's good to push yourself beyond your, um, what you think your physical capabilities are. But it is nice to come out here and know that the routes that have set these routes with you in mind, as they did hopefully set them with the intention that someone from your category should be able to top it based on what they've seen in the past. Yeah, that's such a good point, Brian. Like, honestly, I've never sort of thought about that like that. Mm -hmm. Because, yeah, you turn up and you're like, am I not strong enough or does, is it impossible for exactly. me? Exactly. And there's actually a setting guidebook that they have for that. So if you go through the IFSC website, you can actually look it up. And I've done it because I'm a nerd and <laughs> actually gone through and seen for every category, they tell you exactly what they can or won't set for that category. Now, they don't find a follow it necessarily to a T, but it tells you general grade range for something like AU2, for example. You might get bigger holds, but if you get shallower holds, they'll make sure to put a jib on it or something, um, better feet. And there's a bunch of different 
things that are discussed that go kind of in, in play into that when they decide which routes will fall for which categories. I'm glad you brought that up because it, it is true. There is a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes. And I think sometimes when you watch broadcasts and live streams, there's that temptation just to sort of whitewash an entire <laughs> sort of group of people with a uh, with a criticism whereas there is a lot of thought that goes into these things exactly not which it always works i'm not saying that like you know people get it wrong i get things wrong all the time i missed out uh jakob schubert on a uh, on a highlight reel yesterday <laughs> by accident i mess things up and mistakes can happen but uh people are working very very hard to make sure they don't as much as possible exactly and it's important to note that it's not just to pair climbing you see it all throughout the season it's very difficult to set when you're setting at this type of level it's very difficult to set so that only the top you ideally want a nice spread throughout so it's like only making sure it's like this bruise should stump some people this move should be possible but you should feel much more fatigued and for paraglimbers that's just so much harder to do yeah especially with such a new sport I wanted to talk, because um, you kind of brought it up earlier, this tape, no tape thing. You said you dropped a video. Where can people watch that video? Yeah, so you can actually, um, you can see that on either my Instagram or the Adidas Rx Instagram. Um, but yeah, so in there I just discuss why climbers um, missing one hand may or may not decide to tape up. Uh, biggest reason is typically um, saving or not saving skin. I believe James was in the commentary box earlier this season and he actually talked about he uses tape and I used to as well just because it gets super brutal and cut up otherwise on the wall. But um, for me, I find that if you can fight through the pain, it gives you a much better sensation of the holds and definitely much better friction. Like if you tape up your finger, if you have a split or something like that, you feel that kind of like slipping. Yeah, it's the worst. Yeah, exactly. And especially if you get really hot and sweaty, all of a sudden the tape slips off in the middle of a route, that'd be awful. And so that's why I ended up deciding not to, but that does mean it comes with the oh, added pain that you get. Sticking of, to sheets at night exactly. occasionally. Yeah, I can nice imagine. Nice sandpaper, brand oh. new holds like we have today. Oh, my God. Yeah, it's, uh, it, it's, such, it's such a complicated sport. And what I like about bringing different athletes in here is you find all these different angles to it as well. So it's, it's really cool to hear all of this. Yeah, no, of course. I yeah, thank you for having on. us all. Oh, it's pl always a pleasure. This is my favorite comp of the year. I'm serious. Like, I love doing the power comp. All right, Guillermo is in. He's on hold number two straight away, He's aiming for 35+. plus. Richard Slowcock had a pretty good high point, it turns out. There's some big names to come. Fumia from Japan. The Endurance Beast will be up later. I feel like it always makes the rest of the sweat when you see the first person get a <laughs> significant high point over the rest. Oh, yeah, they do. And the setters sit down in some uh, armchairs in the front and uh, watch all the action and analyse it. Biting their nails on first person tops and you're just like, oh, you make it too easy. Exactly. I don't know what I'd least prefer to have a job, root setter or bee layer. It's one of the two. I don't know if I would want to be a dealer. No, awful job. Exactly. No, imagine dropping Yanya <laughs> Imagine Worse, imagine dropping a paraclimber. That's That'd be something different. Yes, yeah, morally not great, that one. All right, Guillermo is crossing through. Goes out left towards a hold on the black volume. And he's got a clever knee scrub in there as well. So I suppose that's that scanning thing you were talking about. He knew what the hold was like and realized there was a potential knee in there. Exactly. And so... A lot of it too, bee climbers are incredibly, incredibly adapt to spatial awareness. And so you'll see as they climb through, they kind of remember where their holds were, where the volumes were, and they can kind of just naturally put their feet back to in that, and back to that space where they needed it to be. So he scans his way through the first section of his route, nearing that silver medal position. Second to last climber out, hit the bolt hole for a second. Luckily blocked by the setters. Mike picking out that big exhale of breath. Looking confident so far on us. Missed the blue, but got it second time. Bumps up towards the hold, sitting on the black volume. It's actually funny, if there's any viewers listening right now and you know Spanish, you could actually hear what the caller is saying and actually under, get a better understanding for what's going on, how they actually tell the routes that is. I said I, I, I want that patched move. into our commentary box. <laughs> it means we could just sit back and enjoy as well. How's your Spanish? Uh, really good, I'm actually Dominican. Oh, perfect, right, well you can tell us if something goes on here, if something happens. No! 
Well, I don't think you need Spanish to understand. No, it's uh, a mistake, perhaps. He wanted to do a little higher. He, you can tell he wanted to do that cross move. He knew where the hold would be, and it was just a matter of the move looked pretty hard. Yeah, it did. Um, seeming a bit disappointed, but it has put him in bronze currently. 23 compared to 23 plus. So we'll have to nervously wait to see if he's on the podium here. Yeah, this was the move. Oh, he hit it on he the hit cross. It. Oh, that right arm was coming up, the elbows going. It was awkward from him. Slapped oh. out to nothing. It looked more so like he was just trying to get that weight through the right foot and wasn't able to do it just quick enough. Yeah, I couldn't find a position, could he? All right, well, last climber, Fumiya Hanoi from Japan comes onto the stage. And yeah, his endurance is something else, this man. I've seen him climb, and it looks like he's going to fall off a lot. And yet somehow mm -hmm. he holds onto the wall. The lock-off power that a lot of these climbers have is just absolutely insane. Yeah, it's bonkers. I, I just I can imagine the training that goes into it. I mean, and talking about training, I mean, I know you're doing the lattice thing, but, but right now, like, how many hours are you spending in the gym, in the climbing walls? Um, I find that for me that varies. It could be... Um, anywhere between four to five days a week, sometimes less, sometimes more. I find a lot of it this year has been dependent on kind of how my body has felt. And so kind of taking that into account. Yeah, listening to it and kind of figuring things out. Exactly, trying to make sure just no, you don't get any overuse injuries, especially, or any um, weird tweaks in your fingers. Or for me personally, my shoulder is always like something keen to go early. Yeah, so you're managing those injuries. Yeah, because the finger injury, I mean, climbing with one hand, obviously, something to avoid because if you can't use that right hand you're not going to be training yeah and so that happened to me earlier last year it was thankfully just a light finger sprain but it is something where it's like i had to take a minute off of climbing um and when i started climbing again learning how to climb without using the full grip of my hand um for me that ended up working out i got much better at open hand gripping because of that but um don't don't take my advice don't climb when you're injured i'm whatsoever. gonna go injure myself just to get stronger <laughs> now i've taken it so Fumia is down low. He hits the 40 degree section. I mean, Brian, you, you were on it earlier. I mean, how savage is that overhang? Um, pretty, I don't know, it's pretty intense. It's, for me, arguably it's fun. Um, even though I did fall on the route, I still love it. I still love overhangs at the end of the day. Um, it is definitely the style that I prefer. And I don't know, it's something about this wall and kind of like the weird openness of the arena kind of does something. Yeah, that's a good point, because it kind of drops away behind you, doesn't mm -hmm. it? That's exactly. pretty, I'd be intimidated to climb it personally, I would. Yeah, you look down at the clock and you realize the clock is right under your feet. It's actually not farther in the distance anymore. God, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, because the speed wall was in action. I know there's a bit of like back and forth about whether that's a good idea or not, because it does change all of these routes. Yeah, and it's one of those things where it really does depend on the category. For some categories, a speed wall makes a lot of sense. For others, it could be quite difficult to manage. Absolutely. Well, we're on men's B2. We've got B3 to come after this. And we're hearing the Japanese announcer shouting up at his athlete. Also, check out the shoulder strength, just shifting from one hold to the other. Yeah, and adjusting those feet. He's got the left in now, drops it down, twists in with the right. And he's found a good hold there, so he can shake out on that blue, but he's not choosing to, moving quickly through that sequence. Very loud sight guide, it's great. I wonder if he's got that tube thing we saw earlier. I'd be surprised. I don't know if we could see from here, but I wouldn't be surprised if he didn't. Yeah, these two have been together quite a lot over the years. And we're watching him climb easily towards a podium. 23, he needs 23 plus, but now breathing, this is the cross through move that we saw before, but so much so better. So much more controlled. Charles getting that left foot high. Yeah, no real texture on that jib. Not that one he's standing on, the one above it, but near where his left knee is now. Big drop knee in. This is great climbing. <laughs> and here he will rest. And that's the hold that he's going for. 
up and around, creeping forward, hits it with the left now. And for the first time, we, really, we see him hesitate. He's on 29, he needs 35 or 36 to move into the gold medal position. It's up and left. He tried to find it before. He's really struggling with this one. Now he has it. And that right arm straight gets a heel in. And you can hear, even without knowing the language, you can tell what the caller is telling the climber to do. And it's pretty, pretty impressive to see the caller kind of switch beta in the middle of it. Yeah, that's such a good observation. You can. It's just like a sort of universal climbing language, isn't it? And I think a lot of that stems from him knowing his caller so well and training with him so long. Oh, he's really fighting now. Hits 31. Great moves from him. Drops down on that right leg and he'll have another moment to shake. That was huge. From right there, you can see him scanning for that underclang over to the volume. He didn't like it on the first time of touching. Readjusts the feet. And that right heel is not on the jib, so he can't rock too hard on it. Actually uses the top of the volume instead. Not sure how you grip that. It's so impressive to watch this man go. There's the head wall reaching through it. And that angle change is increased by that volume, making it a really awkward move. So now you see, and that's the impressive thing about the bee climber, is being able to lock in with your biceps as you pull around. Well, there is a yellow jib up there, but it's further to the right. Adjusts the feet. Going for the knee bar. Oh, he's got it in, and look at that, finds the left hand. And he's nearing Richard's high point. He's on 34 at the moment. He's kind of locked himself in there. And that's the match. Oh. And slips on it, but 36 awarded at the moment. Barring appeals, of course, and we have had a few come in. So we think, though, that is a gold medal for him. Yeah, he's nodding to the sight guide. He knows he's done enough, but that was close to not making it. Such an impressive feat. Well, let's see a replay of that again. I mean, Brian, it was about as close as you can get between silver and gold. He reached up high, and it was all about the knee, as you said. Exactly, and I actually think the reason he slipped was he was going to put his left foot up, but we'll see if it shows up on the replay. I think he actually stepped up on the bolt cover, and his foot, left foot just slipped off. Let's keep an eye on that, then. So right in between the volumes there, I think he was trying to get his left foot over to the leftmost volume. There we go, so let's have a look at these feet. Kick the foot. It was certainly close. Yeah, you're right. Look. Yeah. Yes, you're totally right. And so that's one of those things where it's like his caller definitely told him there's a volume over to the left, and it's just him scanning and him pumping up before he was able to find that left foot and get there in time. Well, drama at the end, but it's enough for a gold medal for him. So congratulations to Fumia. And Brian, we'll say goodbye to you. I think Sebastian is chomping at the bit to come back on the mic. So Brian, thank you so, so much. It's been fascinating talking to you. Yeah, for sure. And good luck with that uh, Seeker Block competition. I will be checking out the live stream for sure. Thank you so much. And thanks again for having me. Always, you're welcome back anytime. Thank you, Brian. For sure. So, Sebastian, how are you doing? You've been away, you've been chilling with the team. Tell me, what's the atmosphere in the stadium like out there uh, beyond this box that we're currently sitting in? Well, it's silent. <laughs> <laughs> Except no one's climbing, then there is emotion. No, I was chatting to my teammates about my climb. We chatted a bit about the team result. And, uh, yeah, I have a really, I would say, lucky fourth place because that was absolutely a max I could pull out of this. <laughs> And um, so I'm, I'm really, really satisfied because that was, 
you have to go climbing and not thinking about the result while you climb. You just give your best, and at the end we have a result. And uh, yeah, but uh, what I like the most is that I like what I do while I'm on the wall. So that I feel good, that I have fun while I'm climbing. And it's what I tell to all the para athletes. If you don't like it, if you cannot love what you do there while you're doing it, please don't do it. <laughs> Because climbing is way too beautiful to let it ruin by pressure, too high expectations, uh, medals, success, whatever, that can poison your brain. Seriously. Oh, I agree that's, with you. That's like an icing on the cake, which you can get if you can enjoy what you do. Let's just quickly just mention this climb. So Daniel Andre is on from Romania. He's on this, you were saying 7B on this route? Yes, roundabout, roundabout, according to the route setters. Um, but just if you consider the whole route, so if you climb it to the end, as we have a progressing difficulty in this route, the beginning will be easier. So um, depending on where you fall, you did not climb a 7B or whatever it is at the end of the day. So uh, also, if you ask the route setters, they're sometimes really um, like shy on yeah, giving they hate, saying they it, they hate they? it, giving a grade for something. But it's like, no. You have to, because at the day you have to tell someone else how hard should it be. And what's the grade we have, or what's the measure we use for expressing the difficulty of a route? Yeah, That's exactly. our grade. And especially, especially with power, I think, because yes. it's, it's difficult to know and it's good to know just how good they are. Yes, exactly. So all of you who are out there and who want to know more about uh, how hard do I actually have to climb to get in here? So if you hear grades like, oh, this is 7B, 6C, 8A, whatever, we all have that all on the wall. Difficulties here range from 6C up to 8A plus. Wow. But qualification is a bit easier. And the idea of competition climbing is that not everyone makes it to the top, right? So even if you cannot climb, I would, let's say, 8A, and you want to, for example, join in AL2, you still have a chance, right? Yeah. Because just also very few of our athletes here can manage that grade on site. Absolutely, man. Well, Daniel, here, Daniel had a, uh, a left toe cammed in. We saw that previously. And look at the progression. He's nearing the head wall. He's got a jug to come if he can get it, which he does. This is a strong start to men's B3. Definitely. But our Romanian team is known to be strong because um, our Romanian coach is working in, a, in an institution for visually impaired people and so he has his so it's a climbing competition boot camp at work <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he that's definitely a, a talent center there in Romania and that's uh, yeah that's one of his athletes who uh, who can show their performance here on the world stage yeah this is helpful to have that in your back pocket isn't it as a training facility Definitely. And at the end of the day, especially for our visually impaired athletes, it's absolutely crucial that you have a guide which is engaged, which is there very often. And while the guide is announcing, he cannot climb. And what do we love? Climbing, right? <laughs> and if you're guiding someone, you cannot climb. It's true. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, and so uh, to all these side guides out there, oh, you're Daniel doing an amazing feels. job. Yeah, they are indeed. Thank you. And Daniel there reaching up towards the right hand, couldn't hit it. But the, uh, as you said, the route builds in difficulty, so he was nearing that 7B section at the top. Definitely, definitely. There are more climbers to come in this sport class, so we'll see how the others can perform on this route. Um, also, one uh, teammate from uh, Romania coming as the last starter here in this sport class. So, uh, yeah, stay tuned for more visual impact performance from Romania here soon. Yeah, that Romanian team, as you said, so, so good. And we watched some replays here. There's the right hand that let him down eventually. Uh, we see this moment. He was just pumped. No, he tried and uh, couldn't quite get it there. And there's no room for compensation to correct any error there, especially if you just slap up the way he was. I mean, he was trying a dynamic move. Imagine doing something dynamic while not actually seeing where you are hitting at. It's terrifying. It's yes. seriously a terrifying he's, idea. He's B3, so that means high number, low impairment, so he has some visual information on his own that he's not getting from his side guys, but still, this is nothing like, for example, which is enough to drive a car or whatever. So um, the information he has is, could be really rough, just uh, 
just just a slight idea of work could be something, but not what it is, how it feels, whatever. So I always surprised when our visually impaired athletes try some <laughs> dynamic moves. Absolutely. But I know our root setters love it, and I know they want to go more in this direction. I see how far can we actually push them. You, so you wait till they put dual tax on the holes as well. Uh, well, there are Full some. I mean, no uh, yeah, uh, no tax. Yeah, I saw those uh, holes, and I was really wondering, like, hmm, okay, do we then work? I don't know. Uh, uh, um, a tissue with water. Well, I have to at the harness. Well, let's mention this. So Chaz is on stage with his sight guide Alana Yip, and we did a feature on these two in the World Climbing Club that's on YouTube. I think it was a look on lost track though. I think two shows ago, and you can watch that. So we had para climbing quality highlights and a feature about these guys. And obviously, having someone like Alana Yip in your corner. I mean, obviously, the, the set, the uh, sight guides are very experienced, but Alana is a World Cup. <laughs> <laughs> world champ climber yes. if she says something i'm gonna follow what she says <laughs> yes <laughs> but also her version might not be his version that's what she said in this video that she has to adapt her own style to fit yes. his and, and she found that quite difficult to start with yeah just imagine you have a different body size she knows how to read everything for her reach for her size for her capabilities and uh, that might not work for him as well no exactly so She's had to adapt, but these two working as a partnership now. So that's Chaz and Alana. It's so beautiful to see the support from the able body climbing scene at the towards the park climbing. See the inclusion, see the cooperation there. That's that's well, that's what our climbing community needs. So some dubs <laughs> to Team Canada. Yeah, well done, Team Canada. Thank you to Alana as well. Well, it's all about Chaz though. Right now, has that left hand in, gets a high right heel, shakes it out. And he was doing handstands in the warm-up area seconds before he climbed yesterday. I had no idea we were filming it. And he was uh, walking around on his hands in the waiting area. <laughs> yeah, why not? If it warms you up, why not? <laughs> well, exactly. I mean, I made him do it twice. So apologies if that upset his qualifying. <laughs> Well, was the light not correct for the camera? <laughs> I just was worried he didn't catch it. I was uh, terrified, so I got yeah. to do it again. Chaz, power screaming as he comes up with the right hand. He found a brilliant rest. The only person to find the rest on the route that I saw early on, he was sitting on a giant blue volume in the first third of the route, uh, having a lovely time up there. Yes, and the public went crazy during qualification. Why not actually being supposed to do that? Yes, it's a good point. They were uh, cheering. Yeah. Yes, and they were cheering not just like five seconds. It was like for about 30 <laughs> seconds. Yeah. At the same time, there were other people climbing on the wall. That move from Chaz, huge on the shoulders, real commitment yeah. from him. That's the trust we were talking about between them. Crimping, but those yeah. fingers unwinding as he falls. Currently si sitting in silver medal position, three climbers to go. Such a nice fight. Yeah, brilliant. Such from a nice Chaz. performance. So Chaz comes down. So seeing some replay from Charles here, he's, by the way, he, uh, he just had three competitions before, so quite new to the competition scene so far, and uh, world finals, what else do you need to say? <laughs> yeah, he's on the big stage, he's hit the big time. Well, well Lux Luce Sale got a big reaction there from Team GB as he walks onto the stage. He's walking backwards with the sight guide. He's trying to stop him walking off the edge of the stage. Stop there, please. Well, at least he has a rope on. The sight guide does. <laughs> That's true. Well, Sebastian, explain this, because visually impaired climber and yet kind of using binoculars to look at the route. So this is where uh, the levels of vision come in. Exactly. So um, the, the level of vision left, um, if you want to know the exact numbers, it's uh, RB3 athletes. They have um, a visual field uh, of... Uh, less than uh, or more in between 40 and 10 degrees so that means like if you go from the center it's like something in between maximum of 40 degrees that he can see 
or slash and you have a log ma, which is the measure for visual acuity in between 1.0 and 1.4. So to those out there who <laughs> can... I was about to say, I'm, I'm a bit confused by that myself. <laughs> yes, um, so imagine uh, sometimes they say they can, B3 can orientate themsel themselves on their own, but things which are far away, it's impossible to see. So they are near surroundings, they can see, they can get around, they don't need a side guide, ne not necessarily to, 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 so to say, to go from A to B. That's why he can use glasses uh, or in this, uh, the, the to, 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 to look up the wall and inspect the route once again. And also, very smart use of the 40 seconds that he has on stage, right? The six minutes, the six minutes of observation time were now I think uh, many hours ago. Yes, it was one, so it was like uh, <laughs> uh, thirteen o'clock. So four, no, my math capabilities uh, three hours ago, and uh, um, so yeah, good chance to refresh on what you saw before. Yeah, and quickly through the first part of this route here, up towards the big holes, confident climbing from him, sure of his feet. And also you see the difference in between B1 moving slow and very static, B2 something in between because they have vision left and now B3 having most vision left of all the sport classes and they can use the quickest. And all the athletes in this category are in B3. We have no combined categories here. Up the right hand into a good dish. And we have seen quite a lot of talk back in this competition. Perhaps it's just because this stadium is so quiet that I could hear it for the first time, but there is some communication between the climate and the site guide and not just the other way around. Uh, definitely. We hear a lot from the site guides uh, here on the microphones uh, this time at the competition. Sometimes when uh, we don't hear it, we don't get the impression that it's there, but it is there, in fact, and it's always there. But also the climbers talking to the site guide. Yes. Communicating, asking questions. Yes, yeah, they, they, they feedback information and, and discuss maybe change of beta. Well, looking at Beta, he's got the left foot out, uh, sort of smear here, hits the right hand in a good hold, and he's using this opportunity to rest, wraps a heel in, and comes up to that finger-like jug, which you can make a match on. And up above his head, we can see that jib actually hits nicely. I was like, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Just moves on confidently. So nice. Yeah, good flow from him as he approaches the head walk. He's on 29. 38 plus was our early high point set by Daniel. Uh, he had a really good run on that route. All right, shaking out now. Coming up to jib on the black volume. Now nearing the end of the very overhanging section of the wall. Into the undercling from Lux. And now that dish, it's a big one, but it's hard to get to because of the angle. That's a better angle for it. You have to reach up and around into the top of it. It's like a, a sweet last hello from the overhang. <laughs> <laughs> Poetic there, right? <laughs> so he gets a very high left foot, drills it in. He has got a jib down left he's not using, and now he's been, oh, but a slip on the right foot. Yeah. Just may caught may himself. Maybe the, the side guard announced it there, and he just uh, saw it. Yes, there's something up there, and just aimed too high. Um, that, that can happen really easily with visual impact climbers. Now let's see if he can use the rest that's, so to say, hidden there. But, oh, no, he's just moving on up to the crims. Now switching hands, we know that's crucial there. Yeah, this is a tricky sequence as we saw earlier on. It requires a big move up left. He is in the number one spot though with two climbers to go. Now feet up and reaching statically almost. Yeah, I think, yeah, just maybe not quite getting the distance right there. Didn't look like he was pumped. I think he would have had the distance but the high feet didn't help him. Because yeah. it actually, it moves your, your hips away from your target. So. Um, he should have better switched feet and just lean over to reach it. So, uh, but sure, you're pumped. You want to get it done quick. You think that's it. And uh, no room for adjustment up there anymore. Absolutely not. Well, look at this. This is on the crimps. He adjusted down but, once. But he's on the lead anyway because we know this score is 42 plus. 
as we learned early on from our women's sport classes. And uh, as I, if I remember correctly, the high point so far was 38 plus, so he should be safe on the lead. Yeah, not too many tops going on here. Not at all. Just one, if I remember Just, correctly. Yes. I'm not sure if I can remember correctly more now, but yeah, we haven't Abigail. seen many. Abigail the one, definitely the one cruise I, through. The one I predicted. <laughs> oh, see, you're just saying that to show off now, just because you predicted it. <laughs> no, it's, uh, to be honest, that's a very, very easy bet <laughs> yeah, on <she's>, Abigail. <laughs> yeah. You can use it next time, Matt. I will, thank you. I will steal that. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll get some money back. All right, Kazuhiro from Japan enters the stage. Second to last athlete out, and we've got a high, high point of 42 plus. As, Daniel, as Sebastian said. And then uh, we've got Daniel after that with 38 plus and Chaz 28 plus. And taking off uh, socks over his climbing shoes there. I haven't seen that for a while. No, it's a, it's a smart move. It's the idea is to avoid picking up uh, dirt from the ground. But uh, to be honest, where I stepped, it was more or less clean. I've seen way more uncomfortable grounds and <laughs> I really wanted to clean my shoes right in front of the the, uh, the start of the route. Well, it's dry, thank goodness. He doesn't need protection with that and he's underway. So he's on seven at the moment. We know where our podium finishes are at the moment. He needs 28 plus to get onto it. And therefore he has a way to go. So, uh, yeah, he has. He's on 14 now, getting upgraded on that score. And fairly straightforward down at the bottom, but this route tends to build as you progress through it. Exactly. Our side guide again, shouting from the ground. He's got a good left toe in there, pressing finds the right hand. And I think it's all just about positivity down low on this route. The holds are good if you commit to them. Left foot on the wall as he reaches up into the dish. But that left foot, he's got to be careful now. That's no text there. He's on the edge of it. And yeah, needed to move quickly through that sequence. I'm still very confident and target in his eyes. Yeah, so hits the dishes. And then this sequence here, we've seen athletes really struggle on these moves or cruise through it like it's nothing. And you can see the handprints left from the climbers before. Definitely, definitely. And a few so to say, confusing tick marks. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Well, I mean, th those, those cues can confuse it. I mean, less of an issue here, but... No, it's not because, well, except the one which is, the screw hole which is in there, but... You might ask yourself, why is no one cleaning? It's the simple answer is there's not enough climbers to fit the rule and before you need cleaning. So uh, it's everything is correct the way it is. There's no need for cleaning. And well, there's a slight advantage uh, for the first climbers, but I would say in this case, it doesn't weigh too much. I would say in this arena, the most, uh, I would say, distracting factor is that it's really hot in here. So uh, outside in Switzerland, it's quite cold, but in here we have, I would say, 20 something degrees. Yeah, it has been warm, especially in the evenings when there's lots of crowds in here. Kazuhiro making good progress as he comes up to the dish. And now he'll get a moment to sum something about, but this left foot jib, we saw uh, Lux before slide down into it, but Kazuhiro not really needing it, using different beta through the head wall. He also doesn't need a high uh, left feet there. He just moved himself up. So now trying to reach the undercling, hooking with his right, and yes. Yeah, now when he gets stood up, he'll have a bit of a shake out before committing to the next sequence. And look at those holes, small crimps on the wall, a big move out to a, a jug, which most climbers have been going dynamically to. Right, and still looking very confident here. Ah. Starting to scream now, but trying to reach out to 43 and he's gets it. So yeah, he's in, in the lead. So he's in the lead. 
All right, so moving into the gold medal position, and might we see another top here? We are, it is a top. If he can match it, gets the heel in to do it. That's good work from Kazuhiro. There and it is, and still one more climber to come. Well, now he's put all the pressure on Cosmin. And we, we talk about a crowd a lot here in the box, uh, with myself and Sean, and the fact that the crowd um, informed the climbers. And for Cosmin, who were waiting back there, he'll know what's just happened. He'll know I mean, what it, he might have to do. Yes, he knows all the speed from the climbers before, and he might have noticed that this one maybe it was not just one minute, right? So no fall down below. And uh, well, he was really quick and confident, so no issue with time odds or timing here. By the way, as far as I'm correct, no time odds yet, right? So all our climbers are, the, especially the visually impaired, are really good underway. Um, so Cosmin, all eyes on him. He qualified best. And uh, let's see what he can do. Yeah, and Cosmin, part of that Romanian team, and you say his teammate climbed earlier on, and Cosmin's so, so good, just used to being in that last position spot. And he's the last athlete who can make a difference to this podium, but he needs the top if he wants to get the gold. 42 plus or higher for silver. And the bronze medal position is currently at 38 plus. So by the way, Cosmin never finished in any other position than first place. <laughs> <laughs> and he has lots of competitions on his scoreboard. So the man used to winning, he knows how to win on a stage like this. He approaches the B layout, will get clipped in. And the uh, communication between him and the partner is interesting as well. Sight guide immediately moved back from the wall to check it out. It's been a while since he's read it as well. Really, it has. Yeah, yeah, it has indeed. Um, Cosmin now has to go really quick to be faster on time because before we saw the top so uh cosman has to top it and wait no he just the top is enough there's no timing needed yeah due to count back i think he'd take that should be yes all right so he's underway and as we know the intensity of this route builds as it goes it's a case of not over gripping making sure you're accurate on the bottom section look how fast he's going here so he's on 10 already, our scoreboard barely keeping up with him as he flies up the wall, hits the jib with the left hand, comes up into the dishes. As I just checked in the meantime, there were no ties, uh, no tied rankings in the qualification, so he actually does need to go quick. He has time because he was, he had the better result with two tops from qualification in comparison to as a competitor from Japan. Good knee bar in there as well. I've been wondering why the athletes haven't been using that because it seems like a one but he just used it to press through that move not necessarily to rest on it well first you have to see it then leg length have to be has to be correct that's most of the time the the issue i think uh, not always you have like a leaning volume where you can fit in all different leg sizes yeah and i think he sort of found it instinctually as well it was just there pressed into it moved through it but look how fast this is. I mean, he's already yeah, he up towards may, the Yeah, he makes it look like a warm-up route, to be honest. <laughs> I mean, we can't see a clock, but he's, he's got to be a, only a minute or so into this. But, oh, watch that bolt hole. He's standing on the bolt hole and making it work as well. Is that a bolt hole? It is a bolt hole. Wow, well, apparently the stickiest shoes in the business there. Is it a bolt cover? I'm pretty sure it is, yeah. We've got a route set next to us. She can tell us in a minute. Yeah, it is a bolt cover, so... <laughs> That's amazing. We've seen people fall on that bolt cover. Incredible. But now, for the first time, he pauses with this huge stretch up. He's locking off that right arm. Gets no, the left. getting it. This is smooth as anything. Look at that oh, top. Wow. Too easy from Cosmin. <laughs> awesome work. No feed needed. That was no problem as well. Sebastian, uh, I'm going to leave you for a bit. In fact, we're both going to leave the commentary box for a bit because Shauna and our chief route setter are here to give us some info on these routes. So we'll leave, and then I think you're going to carry on with Shauna, and I'll come and say, see you at the end and say goodbye, if that's okay. Yes. Right. Goodbye for later. Hello everybody, it is so good to be back. I am joined by Carly, the head route data 
of this event. How are you feeling right now? Uh, pretty good. Yeah, we've, we've got a few tops and um, we, we had a pretty good qualification round yesterday. So we're, I think we're sitting pretty comfortable with our results. Okay. Yeah. Which I, one of my favorite things to do at these events when the competition is happening is look over at the root setters. I do not know how root setters do this job. <laughs> it is so much pressure to get it right. This is the, the biggest stage in the world. It's the World Championships. So do you feel that pressure or are you just so content in what you're doing and confident in your abilities and your team, of course? How big is the team here? Are they all feeling good? Is everyone feeling confident? Yep, yep. Um, yeah, I've got sweaty tips. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, we've got a pretty good team. A uh, team of uh, five. And, yeah, I think generally I'm a pretty chilled out chief. So I do use a bit of, um, a bit of that on board. But, uh, yeah, no, we're, you know, finals is always stressful. You say you're a chilled out chief. Does that mean there's gossip on not so chilled out chiefs out there, maybe? Oh, uh, maybe. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask a little bit because maybe people are new to this, maybe people aren't, but there are four routes on the wall and I have ten categories, we have ten categories, if, I, if I'm correct. How do you decide on the number of routes that, are, that there are going to be and then who climbs on which route? Is there a system in place or is it kind of getting the routes on the wall or are you setting the routes for the categories? How does it all work? It seems like a, I don't know how you do it and how you figure out who goes where. So is there a process or is it getting the holds on and starting to feel for the moves and then deciding or are you setting the routes for what? who will be on them, if that makes yeah. sense. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, generally we're setting the routes for who's going to be on them. Yes. So we've done the plan beforehand. Yeah. Um, uh, there's always four, generally four routes in the finals. And then we, we split the categories up according to kind of grades and abilities. Okay. Yeah. So... And do you feel like the system works well? It, it seems to be working really well here. We've had some tops, but not too many. We've seen yeah. climbers really fighting on the routes, seeming like they're able to give their all. It seems like it's been a great show so far. Are you are you happy with how it's gone? Yeah, like generally, yeah, it's re it's been really good. Um, it would be nice to have that one or two extra route yes. um, for some of the categories, because especially this wall, yeah, it's quite steep. It's really steep. So for our um, RP1 categories, um, as soon as they hit that steep section, you know, you've got to make everything quite 3D, um, you know. Very put physical. Some, yeah, yeah, put some seating options in or mm -hmm. use some bigger holds. And it's hot in here today. There's no doubt about that. It's warming up outside and this arena, it feels much hotter than it has done on previous days. Is, that, is temperature something you take into consideration when setting? You can't get the weather that far in advance often. Yeah, and, yeah. and the weather reports have been very fickle for Bern recently. Yeah. Is it something you consider? We, we do look at the forecast. Um, and, and you're looking at, like, you know, crimps and slopers. They're going to be quite tricky to hold. If, mm -hmm. You know, if we're testing in cooler weather and then the comps in warmer weather, then it's going to play a factor. So you kind of do need to think about that. There are so many factors, and that is why I, I just don't know how you do it. You're juggling so many things and eventualities, and when there's things like the weather that kind of seems like it's always working against route setters, mm. so yeah, not making it easy. One thing you mentioned there was that you're, when you're setting and thinking about all these different eventualities, is it easy to find the flow, and are you? Does it feel easy to put the routes together? I think this for all route setting, of course, speed. They have they have a guideline of what it should look like, and it's the same every single time. But coming into these competitions, are you coming in with moves in your mind? Are you thinking, okay, I've seen this before, I want to recreate it? Or does, does the vision flow is what I'm asking? Is it easy to kind of just start from the bottom or the top, the middle? Is there one move that you come in with? How does it work putting a route up on this wall? Um, well, generally, we kind of, we don't really have too much information about the wall or even the holds that we have. So it's a matter of turning up on the day. We, Seeing what you've got. What we've got to play with and, um, you know, where we can put the lines, what categories we're going to put where. 
um, and, and yeah, like the holds play a massive factor. And a logistical question, for those listening that don't know about root setting, how do you get those holds up there? Are you using a cherry picker? Is it a ladder? Are you hauling them up? <laughs> I think I know the answer, but could you explain about the, the actual process of putting these holds onto the wall for people who don't know? Yep, well, currently at this competition, we have three boom lifts. So, and they're quite small. Okay. So if you have a look at the wall, you know, there's a lot of big holds on there. There are so many holds on the wall. The wall <laughs> looks incredible, I must say. It, it, last night, that took us six hours to put those four roots up. Six hours, how many people? Uh, five. Five people, six hours. Three booms. Six hours, wow. So it was a lot of up and down. There's a lot of uh, heavy volumes. Uh, yeah, but the, the, the boom lifts that we have are quite small here because of the concrete and the, it's a nice arena. Making so you work even harder. You can't have too much weight. So we got these like tiny booms, <laughs> but um, we made it work. We, uh, we've drank lots of coffee. And <laughs> what time did you finish? Uh, seven this morning. Sorry, 7 a.m. this morning is when you finish. Have you been to sleep yet? No. Did you get a nap ahead of this round? No. <laughs> I tried to nap, but I couldn't do it. I hope you're getting lots of Red Bull in and keeping <laughs> yeah, you going. Yeah. I've had wow. a couple. Wow, yeah. honestly, I, I'm asking you so many questions, and I'm sorry if I've asked no, too no, many, no, because I do not think root setters get enough credit. You worked through the night till 7 a.m. this morning. Sebastian has got two thumbs up. Yeah. He's had his head in his hands when you've been talking about how much you work. You did mention the ice a little bit earlier. Underneath us is an ice rink. I believe it's, the ice is still there, hence why we can't oh, really? have. I think someone told me that. Maybe it's not true, oh, wow. but I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Because people were saying, shouldn't it be colder if it's an ice rink and the ice is still there? I don't actually know if that's I think true, in the curling um, stadium, the curl where stadium? the bouldering qualifications were, it, the, they had boards down, so they, I think we were standing on ice. Ah, that makes a lot more sense. But in here, it's, it's the melted. The ice is, yeah. no, they've melted it's, it. It's gone away. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> but still not allowed to have much weight, like we were saying earlier. Yeah. One thing you mentioned, you mentioned testers. So you put these roots up and then you test them. Can I ask, do you have para-athletes testing these roots? No, we currently don't because, you know, we don't have many para-athletes. So they, yeah. they're all competing. So we're, we're the ones that are testing in the, the different types of categories. Yeah. Um, so one of us might, you know, say we're doing an AL uh, test. Mm -hmm. we, one of us might test with our right AL or left AL. Okay. Yeah. And so we kind of mix it all around so we're getting different perspectives from each setter. Of course, yeah. And I think... You know, the sport is growing and it's growing and we're seeing so many more athletes. It's the biggest world championships we've ever had for paraclimbing. So hopefully in the future we can see more athletes being involved with the route setting and yeah, the testing. So that would be great, I think. That would be awesome. <laughs> that would be so cool. Yeah. Um, do you have a favorite route on the wall? Um, I don't know. They're all pretty cool. We had some amazing holds to play with. Um, I think the big blue 360 line is probably the most spectacular it, and the most fun looking. It looks, all, all of them look yeah. so fun to climb. I am yeah. so and jealous that I can't We haven't seen uh, B being climbed yet. That's probably our hardest route. Yeah, this one looks incredibly difficult. Quite a tricky pocket sequence. We're, we're going to see this one climb shortly. Is yep. there a move to watch out for or a section that all eyes should be on at that moment? Yeah, the little two for section just before the last head wall. The so flat, the yellow, holds, yeah, the yellow flat holds with the purples on. Can you tell yeah, us a yeah. little bit about We've that? We've got a little bit of a campus section through there, um, and some tricky foot movement. But it, it, hopefully, we see some foot free stuff. Ooh, exciting <laughs> times! And are there any other moves that have been moves you? have been surprised by where athletes have climbed a sequence differently. Throughout this competition, we've seen in all the different rounds, in all the different events, athletes breaking beta. It's something we always see. Have there been any athletes come out and done something that you didn't expect? Um, no, it was pretty cool to see the, the women uh, blind category go for the little dino jump on the blue. Mm -hmm. That was pretty cool and she kind of committed to it yeah, and went yeah. for it. Really committed so to it. Cool. That was amazing. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's cool to like um, push the athletes a little bit out of their comfort zone and and 
kind of make him try a bit harder. Go for it. Oh, amazing. I think you've done such an incredible job and I'm going to invite Sebastian back in as we get on our way with our next category. Thank you so no. much for joining Thank me, Carly. You. And hats off to you. I hope you have a wonderful sleep tonight. You can rest easy knowing you've done a great job and the athletes look really, really happy with what you've put on the wall. Thank you so much. Hi, Shona. Hey, how are you doing? I'm doing super, super well. I enjoyed the show outside. I chatted a bit to my teammates and uh, now back in the commentary box. <laughs> back in the commentary box and back to the action. We are underway once again. Yes, we see here RP3, our local um, climber from Switzerland. Uh, he, I think he is quite new to the competition scene as all the Swiss are. Um, the Swiss team started just two years ago, and uh, before we had no Swiss car climber so far, you know, and a nation which is known to be for climbers. Switzerland had world champions, uh, World Cup winners, <laughs> world championships, and, and competitions. Yeah, so many competitions here, so it is fascinating that they've only been part of this scene for the last two years, and it seems like they've come onto the scene and really by storm, you know, we're seeing Swiss athletes right now on the screen, the community here, the stage here, it's a big stage and the crowd are just going wild. They are loving this. Exactly. Especially Switzerland is the best example of what you can do if you invest, uh, yes, basically money and time and dedication to the power climbing project because they built a team within just two years and they are now climbing finals and also winning medals also this season and last as well, if I'm correct. So uh, it really shows it depends on single individuals, the right engagement and sometimes also the money that you put in the right place and then you can also build up the para climbing. Yeah, you've got such a great point there. And like you said, not just building a team, not just investing, but really dedicating time, energy, effort, money, as you were saying, to the athletes. And they haven't just come onto the scene. They're in finals, they're winning medals. It is huge and so impressive to do that in just two years. It shows what you can do with the right support. Exactly, exactly. Especially in Switzerland, here are climbers, so here are also para climbers. There's no youth generation you have to build up. There is no, yeah, you don't have to, to search for them somewhere to build them uh, over many, many years. A lot of people with impairments are climbing like me, for example, as well, and don't know that there's something like power climbing existing. A big spinning fall on the left of your screen there. And on the right of your screen, our first look at the second route on this wall. I don't think we've seen a climber on this yet, so exciting to see this route, and it looks hard. It is. The route, as I said, it's supposed to be an 8A+. plus. Uh, Urko Ooh. Carmona Barandiaran. Uh, is a very experienced climber. He's not just climbing uh, indoors, he's also climbing outside Alpine. We did, by the way, the two of us did multi-pitch together. He's also oh, a mountain wow. guide. And uh, so Uko has lots of experience, lots of experience in, uh, in uh, not just competition climbing. And uh, yeah, he also won many medals and he has been away a bit this season from uh, finals and podiums, but so nice to see him back in a world championships final here. Yeah, what an event to make a comeback to finals and climbing with, you can see his experience, you can see how confident he is in his movements, he knows his body so well, he's so accurate with his hand placements, looking comfortable but maybe starting to look like he's having to fight a little bit now, what do you think? Yes, Kind of, as, as I said that, he just rested and composed himself, <laughs> so, you know, maybe he's not struggling, maybe he's just having a little chill. Yes, now he's definitely having a little chill. Well, it's the first climber we see on this route, so we don't know exactly how the climbers will deal with it. And Urko for the first climber, so that means the worst from the qualifying, which went yes. to finals. Yeah. And right climbing right through the big overhang section nearing the headwall now, that really shows like he's either the route is maybe too easy for the sport class, or he's really showing a really, really good performance. Yeah, it's so hard to know when a, the first climber comes out 
and you just don't know what to expect because they could be having the climb of their lives. They could be they could be winning this thing, and then there's more climbers to come. And just because they qualify in a lower position, it doesn't mean that they're necessarily going to fall lower than the other climbers. This is one of the reasons I love to turn and look at the route setters when I'm out in the arena at this moment because their faces, as a climber, get super high as the first one out. Oh, their faces tend to drop and they start to look a bit nervous, but wow. He is looking casual all of a sudden. He just seems to have really stepped it up again. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oko is really showing such a good performance and still looking confident here. Now the head wall nearing the top with still a few meters to go. But yeah, and going from finger pocket to finger pocket. Just a few moves oh. more and falling. Yeah, he wow. hit that pocket, pulled up into the shoulder. He looked a little bit unstable, like he wasn't quite able to get into a good position that worked for him, but a great fight there and a high score for our first athlete out. Yeah, meanwhile, we have on the RP3, the next climber from Chile here on the world stage. Already looking like he's fighting quite a lot there. It looked like that hold was just so far for him to reach, quite extended and Unfortunately, we see him take an, an early fall, I would say, but still. Yeah, it, it was a good good try, it definitely. It was a great effort. Great effort, definitely. I have to correct myself, it's AU3, it's not RP3. Mm -hmm. So AU, uh, it's getting confused here, too many sport classes at the if same time. If you're getting confused. <laughs> 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 yes, doing too many things at the same time. But <laughs> AU3 meaning an finger amputee or loss of limp yes. in the fingers. So uh, he had... Um, uh, a few fingers missing, and as he, as I, if I saw correctly, also his hand is a bit, uh, no, his arm is a bit shorter, which gives him, for sure, a bit of a disadvantage in comparison to other climbers who have full arm lengths. And so, for example, AU2, two lower number, yes. more severe impairment means yeah. they don't have a wrist. Okay. AU3 has a wrist, so maybe if you have just a shorter arm but you have a functioning wrist, then you're not AU2 anymore. You get AU3 because you can grab with this. Of course. Uh, yeah. Rest. Whatever's that, there. But you are saying his arm's shorter, so therefore a disadvantage against other athletes in exactly. the same category? Exactly, exactly. The idea of classification is, in general, that not the least impaired wins. Mm -hmm. We group them together to have more or less equal or the most equal possible impairments grouped together so that in this sport class, yes. the one who shows the best impairment and the best performance, performance in comparison to his impairment wins. Yeah. So for example, you see here Moa Sapir from Israel. Moa had, um, yeah, he, had, he was part of a tragic um, snowstorm where 44 people died and he survived. Oh, wow. But he lost all of his fingers on both hands. Wow. Yeah, so you see he just has, a, let's say, a little stump left um, on his thumb where he can pinch with. Mm -hmm. But imagine climbing without fingers. Imagine where your hand ends there's nothing anymore on both hands. That's how Moa is climbing. And he is looking solid through this section. We've seen athletes really fighting already here, but it, he doesn't seem to be looking dis. He doesn't seem to be looking uncomfortable in the slightest right now. Looking calm, looking collected, precise with his hand and foot placements. Still looking really smooth. We lost our last athlete on that move. He didn't seem to fluster at all. He just hit that and yeah, he's actually he, he chilling was out there. The previous athlete from Chile was quite, is quite new to the competition yes. scene. Moa has lots of experience, lots of lots of years of uh, climbing and competition climbing. And uh, also before uh, this year, we didn't have the AU3 class. Before they were climbing RP3. Okay. So, for the first year, the classifiers saw a chance like there could be potential for a class because we have enough, um, enough yeah. athletes. Yes, we have enough athletes to form our sport classes. And uh, this year it was created. And right from the start, we had the sport classes happening at World Cups. Oh, wow. Unfortunately, we just didn't enough had we didn't have enough women at this event mm -hmm. to start the women's sport class from AU3. But male AU3, that means we had at least six from four different countries to perform here on this stage. Wow. So you see, the sport is also flexible. There are still changes. There are optimizations ongoing. And uh, AU3 is, for example, one of them. 
And I've still got lots of questions, but we need to yes, just take our step. attention to the screen right now because <laughs> both athletes on the wall are approaching the head wall. The head wall being the last section where the angle changes slightly, the angle becomes a bit less. Is that going to play in favor to these athletes, do you think? Definitely, definitely. <laughs> Omar Sapia taking a rest here, looking down to the clock, still confident, so he decided this is the rest I want to take. Um, yes, the wall leans back best, but the route progresses. In the route difficult. gets harder, but so, the angle gets easier. Uh, yeah, so the holds might get a lot less big than they are in the overhang. Often getting less big, sometimes more big and more slopey also. We've seen pockets requiring athletes to be very, very accurate. The root setters are really, really challenging these athletes and it feels like the, the athletes are able to show them their best selves and really fight for the medals that are available here. Exactly. Here you see a good close-up of Moore's capability of what he can do with his fingers, well, slash hands. Um, just the two parts of his thumb left where he can pitch with, and that's all. Wow, what an exciting moment it is right here as both athletes approach the top of their At route. Right, on the right side, you see here the new high point. This athlete, by the way, is climbing with the prosthesis. The athletes are free on their own to choose whether you want to climb with or without leg prosthesis. So a few moves more than Urko before. Our current high point on that route. And... Uh, Moss up here, <laughs> resting confident up there, shaking a bit, choking again. Let's see how far he can get or if he can get to the top. Shaking and choking in a position that didn't look like you should be able to shake out and chalk up there, but he was chilling out. Yes, <laughs> indeed, indeed. Also something for the root setters, impossible to mimic, no finger climbing. Of course. And he falls. Wow, well, he's really happy. He's really happy. A little moment of maybe head and hands, like he could have given a little bit more. But wow, what an amazing performance. He should be happy with that. Definitely. And he is. He is. He is. Thanks to the crowd, and he's smiling. Oh, yes. big smile there. <laughs> there you see the crowd cheering for more Sapia. Oh, he looks so satisfied with this performance there, as he should. Let's see a replay of both of those athletes as they battle their way up the head wall. Oh, I need a moment after that. That was exciting climbing. Definitely. There you see foot up to the left, trying to lean in and jumping from there, but ah, missing it. For the AL athletes, um, the prosthesis might help sometimes, but sometimes uh, it's more weight, okay. right? So an overhang. That's a great point. In, so in the overhang, you're in favor if you climb without prosthesis. In this case, if you have two points of contact with your feet towards the wall, you're much more in favor if it's, for example, if you have a qualification on the speed wall or in the more flat sections. And that's because it would be more stable? Yes, you're more stable. You have, well, you just have two feet. And every time you move your feet, not having prosthesis, meaning hanging fully in your arms. Of course. And you have a weight advantage, but also a, st a strength, so to say, or a resistance disadvantage yes. at this point, especially on less steep walls. And do you see athletes changing no. their approach mid-competition? No. Athletes no. Always, always the same. Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's also strange if you see an athlete walking around with a prosthesis that you always see climbing without. Okay. Sometimes you don't recognize them anymore. <laughs> where, where are your crutches? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so it's an individual decision, and um, uh, which is which stays always the same. Okay. And uh, so, for example, Chue Yuki um, climbing without prosthesis here uh, also gives him the opportunity to switch around way quicker, um, to swing around. Uh, but on the other hand, if you have a prosthesis, you have a leg that you can, for example, here an overhand cross through. You can flag with it. You have more options to play with the balance and. Uh, there are routes which are more in favor if you have no processes, mm -hmm. in this case the overhang. And um, if it's a less steep route, then definitely a more technical one, then definitely the ones with prosthesis are in favor. We so are seeing a really quick pace on the right of your screen. I can see what you, you're saying. He's able to move and maneuver his body so much faster because he's not wearing a prosthesis. 
Exactly, exactly. And on the right we see Nobuhuri Yasuo Baoka. <laughs> Sorry, if I pronounce it <laughs> incorrect. Um, he has a here also um, missing fingers, and um, the sport class definition also here ranges from two. You see, Michael Moss up here had both hands missing fingers, yes. and uh, the sport class definition is in a way that at least you need at least six elements of your fingers missing okay. to fit into that. So there's a range from two, and in all sport classes, this is. This, this is existing. You have always an upper end, you have a lower end. Yes, that might be unfair, but it's the fairest thing that we can have on the competition here. And one of my big questions to ask you, Yes. are the athletes happy with the classification as it stands currently? I would say there's always something athletes can complain about. Oh, I know. I'm and the you athlete know. president. Yes, and an athlete representative, <laughs> you know. <laughs> As do you, very well. <laughs> exactly. There's always something which can be improved, and that's maybe also the reason why both we are here, right? Exactly, yeah. Because I was coming to the competition scene, I thought, like, hmm, this could be better. I will yeah. raise my voice, yeah. right? And that's why I'm here. And that's Same exactly why I'm here as the athlete president. You know, I, I want the athlete voice to be heard at the top and the yes. executive board level. We both do. So I understand. Yeah. So just being unhappy and complaining, that's, 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 not, that's not bad. That's where optimization starts from. It and does, but my question is, there's been big changes about yes. funding classification. Do you think it's been good changes? Are the athletes generally, okay, we'll go generally happy, do you think? Or yes. is there a lot in, of work still to be done? In comparison to what we had before, yes, definitely. Um, before, two and a half pages of classification rules, now 50 pages of classification rules. Five, zero. Yes, dedicated classifiers to, who belong to the sport, who are here at the competitions, who know the athletes, who who are medical professionals, who are also climbers. By the way, our classifiers test the routes as well. I did not know that. Yes, wow. for them it's like a real fun event. And most of us, so most of them are also really, really hard climbers. We have classifiers who can climb 8B+. Plus. And uh, so because they wow. have to, be, if they classify someone, there is an observation and classification to justify if the decision was made correctly. And to be able to do that, you need to know how climbing on high level works. And so do our classifiers. So they are medical professionals, they are climbers, they are climbers also on an advanced level, I would say. And um, they know how climbing works and they really put a lot of energy into it. That's so great to hear. And I had no idea that they tested the routes too. That is amazing. Yes, if they get a chance. Uh, Sometimes okay. the time schedule is too tight, but if they find a gap also together with the route setters, they play with the routes and uh, always they love it. Oh, they love that's it. So great it helps to hear. them for observing because they know then more in detail on what they are observing on. Of course, yeah. yeah. And the fact that they understand climbing, like you said, they're climbers themselves, they understand the sport. Not only are they they watching but they can feel it and yeah i think surely that's going to make a huge improvement to how they can work with yes. the athletes exactly and that's appreciated a lot by the athlete community because i see this makes it way more fair way more professional so in general the they are really satisfied but as always there are things to improve things to change and uh also yeah um i think there are more changes to come but um I'm pretty confident with the system we have now, no matter what, what happens, so to say, the team, my team, will manage it. Mm -hmm. And we lost both of our Japanese athletes looking like they had a really big fight up on the wall. No high points, but great efforts from them. And now we shift our eyes back to this, oh, to the screen here. And we, we just lost our athlete, He's missing Frederick the Lace, hold. Yeah, missing the hold and uh, he looks really unhappy. Was that a root reading error? Do you think he just forgot where that hold was? Did he, did he think the hold was going to be better? What, what do you think happened there? Let's see if we can have mistake. a replay of that fall. My, uh, I mean, Frey is really angry now. Yeah, uh, I can understand why. So he threw up to the yellow volume. He looked like he was going to a hold there. The hold is much, much lower. We'll see this again see. right now. Let's see what happens. Looking for it, taking the swing, taking the... Ah, just miss it with his hands. Yeah, okay, he went too high. He went way too high. So he, it looked like high. he he looked around. He looked at it. He was confident that where it was. Yes. I don't know if his 
like if there was a change in momentum or what what happened for him now that was so unfortunate for him no he was really unhappy so he because the hold looked really good if you can call it good up there mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, i mean uh, we can yeah. call it good but I don't think it's that good. <laughs> yeah, but uh, it really looks like uh, he actually knew where it was and realized why he was jumping, that he was slapping in the exact wrong space. That's so unfortunate. So meanwhile, Albert from uh, Team Spain getting ready for the climb. And here we have Great Britain, Jana Newton on her way. Um, also, AL2 women starting now, so that means we've finished, we finished our AU3 category in the meantime. And now, black on the blue route C that we saw before. So much action. Definitely. One sport class is finished, the next one is on stage. We always have a maximum of two sport classes climbing at the same time visually impaired just one climbing at a time yep. to give the maximum of silence and not distraction by for example having two Japanese of or one Japanese shouting and another one <laughs> uh, trying to announce by radios next to them yeah and, uh, I just do you know why the Japanese choose to do the shouting method over radios I don't know but uh, we were talking to them and they are considering to change oh um, interesting yeah but uh, when you, if you drop your equipment, they always, you always need to have a backup, yes. right? So uh, the Japanese method is, uh, is not a bad one, I would say. Uh, <laughs> they have the a fallback as default, I would say. If wow. you have less technique, if you have less things which can go wrong. Uncharged batteries, things which don't work. Um, those um, microphones mostly work on the Bluetooth frequencies. You can, uh, by the way, you, you could, in theory, uh, manipulate that easily. We hope it won't Go happen. Don't give people ideas. Come yeah. on, Sebastian. I'm not doing, but to be realistic, <laughs> there's a lot of on this frequencies going on here. And um, I mean, imagine having uh, two similar radios together and uh, distracting each other or one hearing the other. It's a lot of things which can go wrong, but other power spots do it the same way. Yes. And... Um, for example, alpine skiing, they're integrated in the helmets, um, so there is advanced technology existing out Ooh, there. That's uh, super advanced. Yes, that we could also use here. And yeah, Albert being really confident. Albert Albe climbing really confidently, very yeah. fast actually. Is he often a climber that will climb with much more pace? Definitely he is, he is, and he also has lots of experience, lots of, um, lots of medals as well. And uh, Albert also climbing without a prosthesis, giving him an advantage here in the overhanging part. And like you said, often leading to oh, a faster Oh, also pace. searching for the wrong, in the wrong place like Frey, but managed to hold the volume up there. Wow, managed to hold uh, the volume. I wonder if One they... arm choking without feet. Yeah, why not? I wonder if maybe they read the route together and they expected to go to that yellow volume and then cross under to the purple, but he made it work. Wow, that was impressive for him to hold the volume. There is so little I to hold there, onto there. You there. See, there you see, Shannon, there you see the angle. I think when you're hanging down there, you just don't see where it is. So you have to remember from before where it actually is. Of course, And yeah. Albert shows so great strength just slapping over there, just holding it, just slapping against the volume and then doing a one-arm chalk up on the... And now we see a hold. lot of chalk where they both held that yellow volume. So I wonder if that maybe will mislead other climbers as there well. There is a tick mark below on their original hold, but um, maybe it's not long enough that you see it from around the corner from the left. Or maybe they just thought that was the tick mark for the left hand crossing under. I think no one slept there before. But, well, we'll talk to them later. <laughs> <laughs> Albert really confident up here. Now in the headwall section where it's less steep. Two finger pocket with the left. And well, three finger pocket with the right. A big slap up, a very accurate move. He managed to stick it, but he's starting to look like he's having to fight really hard here. So you see, Albert has a right leg left that he uses as well, but falls off there. And being a bit disappointed, but enjoying the moment as well. Yeah, maybe misreading the sequence a little bit there. I'm not quite sure. I think that might be where the frustration was coming from, but a good effort from him. It looked like he was having to fight really hard up there. 
definitely. While Albert is back on stage, Rachel Meyer from New Zealand is starting in her route. Let's see the replay of Albert. Whew. Slapping up and uh, see there he's balancing with his uh, stump, even stepping up. Coming back with the left feet and then in leaning into the volume. And his hands, it yeah, just looks Then so I see there a question mark, hmm, how do I do this? Okay, I lean back over here and then losing the volume. Yeah, he just looked a bit tangled up, like he had his hands, he wanted his hands the other way around, but couldn't quite figure out how to, how to do that. Definitely. Yeah, Rachel now entering in the very overhanging section of the wall. We can see Joanna's high point of 23 plus just on the left there. That's still some way to go. Rachel's our only athlete from New Zealand we have coming a long way to Switzerland, halfway around the world. So the only athlete in the Paraclimbing World Championships? The only athlete from New Zealand, yes. From from coming from New Zealand, yeah. Exactly. Um, also, wow. in the past years, it's, she's the only one. So, um, not sure if there are others. Um, hopefully, they join. For example, Australia also started with yeah. one person, and now there are a few here. Uh, already, getting more so, of a team. So, yeah. she's, she's leading the way. Definitely. I hope she can encourage others to participate and to, to come along and to join her on the event scene. It's a long way, it's a big investment, and uh, yeah. She's doing it already over for a few years now. But what an inspiration as well. The only athlete coming from New Zealand to this World Championships. And looking really confident on this incredibly steep wall. Exactly. Here we have Thierry Delarue from France. Um, oh, uh, I would say really, really strong gold medal candidate here. Climbing with a prosthesis in comparison to his other competitors before. Um, and there you see, here you see his leg flagging, so he's really working with the balance that he can use from his prosthesis. And uh, I'm really, really confident here. Looks like Rachel is having to start to fight on this route now. A, a bit of a power screen maybe. She was battling there. It looked awkward in that section. She got really close. Oh, she did pass Joanna's high point, so she's currently in first. Nice one. And we've talked about pace on the men's route here. We've talked about the fact that maybe some climbers are climbing faster than others, but right now we are seeing a rapid pace. Exactly, definitely. Thierry is, uh, I would say, climbing a bit slower with his prosthesis, but that's his climbing style. And uh, But not much slower. I, you were saying... Um, yeah, Albert, for example, had a way more explosive... Um, of course, more dynamic yeah. style. Uh, he just he doesn't use a prosthesis. Thierry, for example, he has a prosthesis, and with a prosthesis, you don't have feeling. So you have to really check yeah. if it's on the hole. So we see you cannot feel it. So if we look, he, yeah. he will look until the foot exactly. is there, and, and you then always look away. see it. You always see it when he places his left feet. You always see that he's looking down. And he has it's to spend all that time exactly. until that foot is And so is automatically on. you have a slight more moment that you that you need in comparison. You have no prosthesis. You have no second leg you need to place. Yeah. You have no, so to say, control. Look down there to check whether it's in the right place. Because we step on something, we just feel it. Do you yeah. look down? I have no maybe idea. I've never yeah, thought about it, so I guess not. <laughs> yeah, but let's check it. Now he has his <laughs> just uses his right. But also, he it has very limited op options on whether he, how he can turn, he cannot step up, step down. It's always the same angle. Now nearing the top, this should be the high point. Thierry doing the move to the left, really confident, crossing through with his leg and topping the route. Wow, topping the route and topping the route in style. He wants a reaction from the crowd. He gets it. He is very, very, very happy with that. And the last climber in that category is he the world champion? I think he, he might be. He is. He is world champion. Wow, do you think he knows it? It looks like he knows it. He knows what? it, yes. I mean, Jerry, I think he, I'm not sure, but Jerry, as far as I remember, he never got anything else than gold. He's one of the stars of the paraclimbing. <laughs> the champion by far. So an that's easy why bet I was for asking, gold on him. That's why yes. I was asking, do you think he knows it? Because yeah. 
I know he would expect to be up there, but it looked like he already knew that he'd won the only top in that round. Wow, what a performance and a split on the podium with the top, a 51 plus and a 51. Great work from the root setters, all getting up high there and splitting the pack perfectly. It's a little tie down low, but for the podium, we have great separation. Definitely, definitely. And it's, that shows like uh, the root setters nailed it perfectly. Just one top and all the rest behind. And it also shows with our first athlete out, you know, he had a great performance getting really high. Yes. Kind of making it look like the route might have been too I easy. I think after Uko's performance, the route has, might have been a, a, bit, bit, nervous. a bit nervous, but then maybe relax a bit more afterwards. And can you tell me what the feel has been like in isolation here? It, does it feel like a normal World Cup? Does it feel like the World Championships? I always felt like the World Champions felt different. Yes. Does it feel like that for it's you? It's completely Has that different, <laughs> yeah. I've been in four finals before, mm -hmm. and I've never been as nervous as today. You've never been as nervous as today? <laughs> yes, never, never. The night was, I think, the best from the whole team. I said like six and a half hours, okay-ish. And uh, but as soon as I was nearing the, the, the venue, I started feeling like the nervous building up and not getting away from it anymore. So Sarah Lacombe from Team Australia here, talking about small countries before. Here's Team Australia. <laughs> not a small country in size, but in representation here, in maybe representation, not so many yes. athletes, but what an inspiration that they are to their all the athletes back home. And she is struggling there, fighting, but still is in that top spot right now, coming off with a score of 27. A great effort from Sarah. I hope she's happy with that. It did look like she was having to fight pretty hard in that steep section, but we know that is a really difficult route. It is, definitely, definitely. So here we see the Berti from... Uh, Switzerland climbing. So this is our men's RP3 sport class. Uh, also new to the competition scene, started this year and right entered Innsbruck the competition with a gold medal. Ooh. So and a Swiss athlete, home world championships. The crowd are going to be going wild. Do you think it's a, an advantage for him having that home crowd or do you think it's going to be adding to the nerves? Well, it can be both. If the audience helps you, um, I don't know. Do you hear the audience while you're climbing? If I'm feeling comfortable, then yes. If I'm feeling focused and in the zone and finding that flow state, not so much. So I think it depends. Yes. It depends on how I'm feeling, what's going on, if I feel good, if I feel bad, if I need to block it out or need to. Sometimes you need that crowd to help you up there. You Definitely, know? And yes. we've seen that in other rounds of the competition. And, and today too, you know, we saw Abby earlier. She was asking for that support. Um, yeah, it, it depends. What about you? Yeah, for me it also depends. If I'm too much in the zone, then I see, uh, then I hear nothing. So, for example, today I heard nothing. Uh, but if I'm fully in my, in the zone. yeah, fully in the zone, I heard, uh, I could not recognize. I just realized, okay, it's loud, but maybe it's because of the other one. <laughs> I, I don't you know. You didn't think everyone was cheering for you. Yeah, I, you don't even know. I mean, if someone else is on the wall, it's, <laughs> it's not just about me, right? <laughs> it's not. But that, I mean, I was in the arena when you were climbing. There was a lot of cheering going on for you. Just so you know. <laughs> Yeah, okay, so I know when I'm climbing, uh, it's in general, it's uh, a bit more loud than the average, I would say. <laughs> but um, yeah, you don't, when I'm climbing, I don't know what's happening on the other routes. So we lose Brachy here in the, yeah, towards the end of the overhanging section, looking exhausted. Looking exhausted, I'm glad you pointed that out. He looked tired. That's that's what you want, right? You want to come off a route yes, in the finals definitely. of the World Championships feeling exhausted. You want to know you've given it everything that you possibly can. Definitely. And on the right here, we see Lucy Jarich from France. She's also a real legend. Uh, I think she never won anything else than gold. Ooh. Uh, yes. Uh, AL2 climbing without prosthesis, being a real, a real, real legend here in the power climbing for many, many years. So. Uh, do you think the more gold medals the athletes win, the more pressure piles on or the more comfortable they get? Does it depend on the athletes? Do you know it her depends. well? Do you think she's feeling the pressure here or do you think she's just absolutely owning it and she knows that gold medal has her name on it? She, I talked to her this morning 
and she said she slept so bad because she was so nervous and she, she said does still yes, get nervous. yes yes she said and she said the others if they ever have a chance it's today oh wow <laughs> that were her words at the breakfast in the hotel when we met in the wow. elevator <laughs> We're getting all of the inside scoop. Thank you very much, Sebastian. Yeah. Yeah, Team uh, Germany and Team France are in the same hotel. And, well, you see each other, you spend time together, you talk together, you're sitting together. But and, uh, she's got the high point. It's already first place, yeah. So it's already first place. She doesn't know. And she also doesn't care. She just wants to deliver a good performance. Lucy is always aiming for the top. I was and about she is to ask. a real fighter. I've seen her climb before. She is such a fighter. She has something so special. It, like, she just wants to climb everything that's put in front of her. You know, she's regardless of the fact that the crowd went mental when she kind of passed that high point, she is so focused, so determined. Definitely. Eyes on the top of this route. Definitely. And what a way to finish if she can drop it, regardless of whether she does or she doesn't she is the world champion she's had a great competition but she's looking for it yeah now sitting on the foothold there with her stump that's a real real good way of resting there now stemming with her hand in the dish ah. but that right foot is very low so she's she's in an, a position here where she will need to move that i think to be able to reach I think up now to the she's next turning hold. a bit maybe can she can she can she Put that, yeah, now that's the way to, maybe she's trying to get her right hand off to shake a bit out up there. Just breathing through, now Jasmine changing her body position, changing in on the other dish, into the other dish. Oh, wow. Not <laughs> sitting in the other dish, changing hands and freeing her right hand a bit. Well, not really wanting to let go. Not wanting to let go of that right hand, and she's been holding on with the right hand for a really long time. Now shaking out with the right, finally. Finally gets it off for a shake. I was getting pumped watching. <laughs> no chalk here, Shauna. I know, there isn't. My hands are sweating. <laughs> oh, this is intense. Oh, wow. Now Lucy checking all the handholds up there. She's still looking confident, and she needs confidence there, because the next move will be very, very long for her. Yeah, very challenging. I, do you expect she might need to jump for this move? Or could she reach what? it? I think it's the first we first woman we see with one leg up there. We just have seen the two leg version. We have seen the blind version. Now let's see. She's aiming for the jump. Oh, and nails it! Wow, nails it. Gets a huge reaction from the crowd. Wow. Topping it. One hand, second hand comes in. That meant so much to her. You can see it. You said if anyone was going to be here, today was the day that they had the chance. But. There was well, no one I, close. I didn't see the chance, to be honest. There was no chance. <laughs> Not even close. So, Lucy, maybe you can I do that like also without sleeping at all at night. It's, I think she can, and I don't <laughs> think she quite realizes just how far ahead she is. That was unbelievable. What impressive climbing from her. So calm, so composing, really focused, and really committing to that jump at the end. She couldn't she couldn't half commit, she couldn't falter there. She just had to really throw everything at that jump, and she did, she stuck it, and a one-hand swing too. She did it in style. Yes, and she just looked swinging out and screaming while already holding it. <laughs> Not even swinging out, just and continuing. Wow. This is just the next level, I would say. So she's climbing definitely in her own level. So Lucy, you are a legend. What? Yeah, an absolute legend. We've seen many legends in the arena tonight. Whew. She doesn't like the word legend, by the way. She I, doesn't? Yeah, no, she said because legends need to be dead. Oh. Yeah, but uh, I'm not convinced. Well, so. she's a hero then. Yes. She's a... <laughs> That crowd's reaction. <sighs> what else do you want? Yeah. She's she's definitely way above the pack and deserves some sort of recognition for that. Whatever status she wants, she can have it. Definitely. So we're starting with women AU2 at the moment, uh, right now. First starter here out on the same route we saw before from uh, the AU2 women climbers. Starting confident here through the volume section. It looks a little bit awkward, this volume section. It looks kind of, if you hit the holds perfectly and you find the good body positions, maybe you can move through it quite easily. But what we've seen, this wall tends to lend itself to an awkward start, maybe. Did it, do you think it 
seems that way? Did it feel that way for you? I didn't climb that route, so I Oh no, I meant on exactly your route, sorry. Uh, so it feels like on all the routes, maybe the wall itself lends, it kind of lends a style to an awkward start on all of these routes, I think. Yes, um, it was not the most confident start in the competition route I ever had, I would say. Yeah, that's why I was asking, because <laughs> yeah, yeah, all yeah. of the routes so look imagine, this way. Yeah, it's, it looks the same, yeah. It looks, yes, you're right, yeah. On the left, we see Jamie Barendrecht from uh, Team Netherlands, uh, that's the men RP3 sport class starting as the first climber out here on this route. It's uh, supposed to be 8A plus more or less. Um, so now we see the version with two legs, and but RP meaning limited range power. Jamie has an artificial hip on one side and uh, which limits his leg and hip flexibility and uh, gives him enough points in uh, classification to be part of upper three. So okay. there is a minimum impairment that you need to meet yes. to fit into the sport. So okay. just a toe missing, for example, is not enough to be in AL2, for example. Yes. And uh, so these minimum impairment criteria, by the way, did not exist before the introduction of the new classification system. And just to remind us all, the introduction of the new classification system came when? It came in the 21 season after COVID. And uh, since then, we have these new criteria. And also, we lost a few athletes from the past who did yes. not meet those criteria. Yes. So, meanwhile, we lose our first climber from the women AU2 on the right. Jamie, very confident on the big jack after the little jump to the right up there, shaking and resting a bit. I was just smiling as Jamie was waving to the crowd, having a good time. He turned around and was just taking it all in. We were talking about whether or not you hear the crowd, what zone you're in. He wanted that encouragement and he got it from the crowd. Definitely. Crowd still very active after all of these hours here going on and on and on. Oh, Jamie coming into the head wall. Less steep but more demanding in terms of size of holds. Now slapping up and missing it. Not quite enough height to get right over and around that slope. He did start to look quite fatigued, I think, but great to be up right high. I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, he looked to the right there. I think maybe got a glimpse of the scoreboard, which is in the middle of the arena. He's seen that he's sitting in second spot. Maybe, maybe not what he was looking for. So a little bit of disappointment on his face maybe just now. I think he just, he was not sure if the performance was good or, yeah, that was the right method. Can I ask you, as an athlete, when you come off the wall, do you take a moment to assess whether you're satisfied with your performance just as it is, not against the other athletes? Do you think about that or is yes. it all about your positioning for you? Yes. Uh, there's a photo of me from the qualification giving two thumbs up from yesterday towards the route. So. It was not meant to be like this, so yes, I judged right after my <laughs> wire falling already. You were just so happy with what you gave, yes. given to the wall, what yes. you given to the crowd, yes. to this competition. Yes. I love that moment, actually, that moment of self-reflection before you get any external information, yes. before coaches and friends and family start to either yeah. try and congratulate or console you, depending on how it goes. But yeah, it's, it's a moment that is, is hard to describe to, to people who aren't athletes, I think. Definitely. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's, it's, a, it's a very private but also um, interesting moment when you fall off, right? It What's is. happening it inside yourself? It like is. It's all the so tension, falling off, and also like maybe the disappointment coming, like, ah, what was this? Yeah, it's so hard to explain. Yeah. Um, you did a great job of it there. And we've got two athletes back on the wall right now. We've got Lucia from Italy on the right and on the left. We see our final athlete in this category, just kind of stepping into the steep section now. Yeah, Lucia Capovilla on the right, by the way, is my uh, athlete representative colleague. Oh, wow. Yes. Um, I'm, uh, my period of yeah, four years ends now. The athletes yeah. are voting at the moment for the next one, and Lucia will stay on. She uh, yes. joined the committee two years ago, two years so, ago, so yeah. she will uh, stay on for another two years. And she's doing a good job there, and uh, we have some changes coming up there. And yeah, she's also not a strong climber on the wall. She also has an important role aside the wall. Yeah, and the athlete representation being so important, as we both well know. So a huge 
huge shout out to both of you, to Lucia, who's on the wall right now, all eyes on that center screen. This, this screen that you see right here, it's also up in the middle of the stage. She looked like, was there a little slip there? But she is currently in the lead with 26 plus. Maybe not quite, not quite hitting the right sequence. I'm not sure what happened there. We couldn't quite see from that angle. Yeah, it looked like she was trying to, to reach for it, but maybe knowing it's not enough, not high enough, or maybe she slipped. Not sure about that, but uh, screaming at the same time a bit. Takano, meanwhile, confident, moving up the wall here. So, shaking out on the finger pockets. Yeah, Takano looking smooth, looking chilled, composed, one in a bit from the crowd. Hits that pinch like we've seen the other athletes do, and then bumps into the purple. So, a different sequence to what we've seen previous athletes do, but in this category, many athletes doing the same thing. Definitely, they do, they do. Um, also because their impairment is way less severe, so there's a good chance they might climb a more similar way. Um, we talked to the root setters before, and there's a root setting guideline out there which gives a description of how roots should be made for each sport class, and it says for the RP3, they can climb almost every normal root setting. There's yes. no specific root setting required for RP3, unless, for example, to even out, there might be impairment which might be more on the left or more on the left yep. or on the right, so that unless which side is affected, um, the root can even it out and okay. be fair for both sides, for example. Okay. So Takano nearing the high point, the existing one, which is at the moment tied by time on the final route due to same ranking on previous rounds. And I think we see him into the lead right now. There he is. Coming With off. The position it first. So there we have our gold medal winner from Japan. Oh, and that one means a lot. Look how happy he is, clapping his hands as he comes down. We've talked about the nerves. We've talked about athletes not sleeping, not able to get to sleep last night. I remember that feeling, lying in bed, your mind racing. You're tired, but you just can't go to sleep. There's such a buzz. And then you walk into the arena the next morning, kind of feeling that fatigue but it's almost like it all melts away when you get into the stadium. Is that, does it feel like that for you? Yes, adrenaline can do a lot of things. I know, it's magical, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> it is, it is. Maureen back from Team USA here on the women's AU2 route. Maureen also is a yeah, big name on the power climbing family, climbing for many, many, many years. This is her last competition. <gasps> This is a big moment. It's a big moment for her, but it was not her last, last competition. So she tried to step back multiple times before, okay. but couldn't quite find a way to jump off the train. <laughs> and today, on the way to uh, down to the route observation, we were walking together just down the stairs, and we say like, hi, we didn't see each other at the competition. And um, I just confirmed, and she's like, yeah, it's the last one. I said, which one from the last now? And she just answered, <laughs> yeah, if we might get Olympic, then uh, I might come back. So there's a little asterisk again at this okay. last one. So sorry, Maureen, um, if I leaked your secret plan now, but uh, <laughs> Well, you can you understand get away when you from come this. back for the Olympic stage. That is understandable. <laughs> well, we lose her there on 26 plus. She looked like she was having to do a really powerful move up. Kind of a little uh, shrug of the like shoulders. Uh, let's, let's see if it's the same, exactly the same uh, like Lucia. Yes. Yeah, so. shrug of the shoulders, turns to the coaches, maybe trying to get some understanding of whether that was a good performance compared to the other athletes or not. She does have a little glance up to the leaderboard there. But yeah, interesting that we've lost two athletes there and there's one more to go. Yeah, we'll see on that if time gets important here. One more to come, Solent Pire. Meanwhile, on the right, on the 60, we see our AL1, our climbers who are in a wheelchair who campus the route start. Daniel Conch from Team Austria starting the round here. And Team Austria, a pretty 
big team out here, right? Yes, and they are, I would say, famous for their AO1 climbers. Okay, so all eyes on the screen. Yes, we will see three Austrian AO1 climbers coming up. Will we see a an all Austrian podium? Have we seen that? Oh, I think oh, no. Oh, a question you don't uh, know the answer to straight away. This is yes, interesting. <laughs> I think, yes, we had a pure all the team German. Of knowledge. Yes, I was on there as well. We had pure Team GB, yes. Team Austria, no, I cannot remember. So today is their chance. Today is but their there's moment, one guest starter from the US <gasps> within the Austrian group. Ooh. We'll see what he can do. Wow. Come on, Daniel. This is exciting. So a good performance, campusing through more than half of the overhanging section, not having any use of his feet. While well, we have Solent Piri starting here in the as final starter for the women AU2. <laughs> trying to wrap around the volume and we see a little struggle here already because not looking too confident here the rope being stuck around the volume losing it with her feet wow that was an impressive recovery wow. she didn't and seem flustered she and stayed composed and imagine you can still see the head of the b layer there in the in this frame which shows like this is not what you want just two meters above the ground it's not but what a recovery to stay composed, unhook the rope with her foot and then continue climbing. And being blocked by the rope at the same time, yeah. by the rope. Wow, Solen, such a strong performance. By the way, Solen is our gold medal candidate by far, so maybe the others have a chance today. <laughs> but it didn't seem to fluster her, you know, when something goes wrong at the start of a route. It can, can really throw athletes, but she seems focused, she's got, she's got a really strong pace going on she seems to have kind of used that fire to really yeah. get her going if it, if on it brings your adrenaline to an even better level why not right but adrenaline can go too far too right so you know she wants that perfect level don't forget if you get the tunnel of you you mean <laughs> <laughs> it's when they get start shaking and falling off the walls not I, what we want I, I feel like if i have a slight foot slip or something which is unexpected then I, if i can rescue it somehow then i sometimes feel like okay no now i'm back now you're now, back. Now I'm, now I'm like, now I'm fully focused. Now I'm here. Like now yeah. the adrenaline is the right, uh, yeah, yeah. on the right level. So, uh, so Len moving quite confident here after this, let's say, unhappy start into the route. And, and she's nearing that high point. We know this. She's going to come into this blue volume. So the purple hold on the blues, on the black volume, on the blue volume that we can see, and the crux moves for this category seems to be going out left to that hold you can see, just. In her eyeline there, it looks so close for her right there right at, on this camera angle, but it really isn't. It's a big, it's a powerful move. Yes, it is. It is. Breathing deep through and there doing the move. But she also has uh, in comparison to uh, to, uh, to um, Lucia, it's the other hand which is affected. So Rutatas really have to make sure that it's uh, equal and it's the same, um, no matter if it's the right or the left hand which misses. Again, coming back to just how hard the root setters work to make this possible. Our next wheelchair athlete is on his way, right next to Solan. You will see him soon. You see the rope swinging over there, and we lose him. Tanner from the US. Let's see his ranking there. With the same score of 28, so both athletes coming out and getting 28 on that route. Let's see if we have some more changes there, because that... Uh, Tanner should be in advance due to count back to previous round, so that might destroy the all Austrian podium. <laughs> that was their moment, but it's not to be. Tanner will be on that podium if we're correct. If it comes to count back, it looks like both athletes got 28, so not an all Austrian podium, but there will be two Austrians on the podium. Let's see, maybe there's an appeal, whatever. Sometimes yes, sport subject change. to appeals. We do but need to say moment, that. This is sport, of course. There are appeals. Appeals can happen. They do happen quite a lot. But meanwhile, Solen confident in the head wall, now nearing our little jump or dynamic move out to the left. And she's the gold medalist. Definitely. She's she our is final climber. Stretching the forearm in this category a bit. In the final. <laughs> this is her moment. We could see another top of this route. It would be great for now her to finish. Let's see how she does it with limited reach, because for those sport classes, reach is crucial. And of that's course. what you need here. The, it looks like the only way is going to be for her to jump. She does. She sticks it. Wow, wow. that was so impressive. Wow. 
What a show, Solen. And another top. And another top for the gold medalist. She is happy with that. And what a recovery. I think that might have been the recovery of the competition. She couldn't have fallen off after just two meters. After not many moves at all. Incredible performance. Incredible performance, incredible recovery. A very, very well-deserved gold medal. So here we see Tanner climbing before. Um, oh, AL1 athlete campusing up his way through the overhanging section. Yeah, those athletes, he does not use any momentum with his feet. Some have like, some sensation left in her lower body so that they can control the swing with her knee, yeah. with their knees and feet a bit better. He seems to have no options there at all. And uh, yeah, being on the hold, but not being able to do anything more than just holding it. There we see Markus Bösendorfer, the next starter on this route. Markus from Team Austria. By the way, all the three AL1 athletes from uh, Austria live quite close together. They train together. They train They're together? Friends. Yes. And I, I visited one of their training camps uh, in the beginning of this year in January. And it's like, uh, it's like a really, really nice atmosphere amongst them. They are all, so to say, our AL1 pioneers. <laughs> I love Come that. on, Markus. You see, Markus has a bit of control left in his with his legs he's um, yeah, not he's, he's using them sometimes to to get a bit of more of momentum you see yeah. for example like uh, now but let's see there you see right it's a slight tuck of the knees very yes. very slight but definitely aiding him do you think a bit a bit a it will help bit. him a bit but it also depends a lot on the on the duration that uh, those athletes already are in a wheelchair so okay. the longer you're in there the more you use of that function because this yeah. is something you don't necessarily use and yes. you know the motto of uh, or the slogan of your body is use it or lose it yeah so after a few more years uh, even if you have it before and you don't train it specifically it's gone so marcos now on the last moves in the very overhanging wow. section crossing so impressive through that he stuck that shake crowd out going wild arm. and he's just fighting Nothing can stop this guy. He's just continuing to put Come everything on, out there. Wow. Wow. He wasn't letting go. He was going to the bitter end. I expect his forearms are screaming right now. What a fight from him. Definitely. And stay tuned for the last one now. Angelino Zella, the last climber of this final road, will come in a few moments. Is this Have you seen be? him before? I've heard about him. I've seen a couple of his performances. I've not seen him climb in this competition. I was so sad to miss the qualification. So I've not seen him climb here. Should we hold our breath and expect something special? Yes. I would not say nothing more than that. <laughs> <laughs> just yeah, but just totally watch I, it and enjoy the show. I had a board so meeting with the IFSC when the qualification was done. I was devastated to miss it. So I'm so glad that I can catch the entire finals today. I absolutely love coming to these events, just seeing the try hard and the fight that goes on on the wall. It's, it's magical. It's so amazing to be in here. The atmosphere, the crowd really getting behind that last athlete. And like you said, something special coming. So are they going to ramp it up again, do we think? Yes. This crowd seems will. to know how to just get bigger and bigger and louder exactly. and louder. <laughs> they know. So I hope, that, I hope they've saved something for this performance. <laughs> I hope so too. Yeah, Marcus showing absolutely really, really strong performance where we see Angelino Zella being tied in here, just going through the moves. So Angelino, he, he destroyed the performance of a hand cycling para athlete, but he's <laughs> not interested in the sport. <laughs> <laughs> so he could perform so, so brilliant on others as well, but um, he just loves climbing and you will see why in a few seconds. And how many gold medals does he have? I don't know, but I think he... A few. Quite a few, yes. When he was merged into RP1 back in the days when mm -hmm. there were not that many, he was finishing in lower, um, in, let's say, lower uh, yeah, positions as well. But he gained so quickly so such a great... Uh, yeah, such great power and also experience that he's now dominating the scene as no one else. You see him so confident, just one-arm style, 
You Juan say Apolo. dominating. You say confident. He's skipping holds out there. Yes. He isn't using all the holds. Did I promise too much? Huh. <laughs> I mean, it was impressive before, but to come no, out here and then just wow. skip holds out, wow. Did I promise too Angelino. much? <laughs> <laughs> and Angelino. Angelino, oh, looking up there. Oh, yes, nice. There speed, we go. So much speed. Look, yeah. what's that and hold you, on the left? I don't know. I don't need it. Exactly. And you see he's really working with his lower body. He's pulling up his legs. What a show, Angelino. This come is on. the move, though. Oh. Oh, no, uh, no, Back he said, down. I will go different, right? This is the way to just go. Just doing a few extra moves. Yeah, Why now not? looking into the crowd, asking for more support, and they're there. Come on, Angelino. By the way, Angelino had an accident while doing paragliding. He fell from 20 meters to the ground, and he survived. Wow. And lost all of his function in his lower body. But there you see, that's definitely not the end of your life. He's one of the best examples on... No matter what happens in life, there's always a way to deal with it and to do the next step if you want to. Thank you, Angelino, for showing us. Come on! Thank you, Angelino, and thank you for this performance. All eyes in the stadium are on him right now. He's two moves away from the top. Come He's on, Angelino. Have we seen the top before on this route? I don't believe we no. have. We've, uh, and the crowd, they want it. And we oh, we oh. see it reach up. It's so... Close for him. Wow. You promised something special. He gave us it. He didn't quite get the top. You can see what that means to him. He's looking up. He almost looks disappointed and frustrated. Yes, he will he be disappointed. He shouldn't like be. do the last move. No, Angelino. The world champion. That was a great effort. He's pulling on the rope. He almost looks a little bit frustrated, like the rope maybe got in the way. I feel like we should talk about the ropes and how the beeline worked at some point. But right now, all eyes on this man as he takes that world championship gold medal you take it let him take it in, in what style. a moment <laughs> in style you promised something special and he delivered well angelino is every time i mean ruta does really try to see the limits here so they know now okay this was maybe too far for him but um last time they tried an undercling i did wonder. that he pinched oh wow and then just didn't stop him no didn't slow him down no i, I asked him afterwards how did you do it he said i don't know it worked I don't know, it worked. I can campus on anything. It doesn't matter about undercuts. I wondered whether the rope, so there's, there's two ropes that are being belayed, and that's because of how the how steep the wall is, if I'm correct. Yeah, exactly, exactly. The single reason is if you have just one top rope on the very end of the wall, mm -hmm. and you would fall in the very beginning, all which would happen is you would ground. You would hit the ground. You would hit the ground, or maybe something in front of the stage. You will. So that's why we have two top ropes, one and the... At the end of the wall and one in the very big, in the, let's say in the part where the big overhang starts so that you can compensate the big swing out there and protect from ground falls. Yeah, that makes total sense. Thank you for explaining it so well. Can I ask, does the lower rope ever hinder the athletes? Yes. Once they're above a certain position, it does. Did it happen then or do we think that, that final move, that final campus move was just too far? No, it was just too far because okay. he was slapping up. The ideal point would have been in the middle. He was slapping more to the left because that was a shorter way to go. But there were just a few centimeters missing. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a long hold. He was campusing all the way up there. Yep. Like 30, I mean, 40, 50 moves. Who knows yes. how many moves that was. Oh, we can look at the exactly. points to see how many it was. But exactly. wow. So meanwhile, our score here, Solen Perrier taking a golden AU2, Lucia Capovilla, Maureen Beck just separated by time due to same ranking on previous rounds. Angelino Zella, as we talked before, 51 plus, so 51 times. 51 well, he skipped plus. holes, so 50. it was less than 50 pull-ups. That's true. <laughs> but he did do a little bit of extra moves when he got the sequence wrong in the middle, so... Maybe even yes. more than that, potentially. Yeah, we, we would have to analyze in detail. No pure Austrian podium, but it was close. Daniel Conch in fourth, um, missing the podium, but Tanner from the US taking the bronze. And as we set up for the medals ceremony, I am going to say goodbye. Thank you so much, Sebastian. Oh, we're, I'm, we're all going to say goodbye. We are done with the stream. That was such a... An amazing show. Do you have a favorite moment from that whole event? Is there just one? I, I don't have just one. There are too many. I, I'm going away inspired, excited, and crossing everything yes, that we well, 
get that Paralympic spot, but what was your favorite moment of well, that first, competition? Well, first, my own climbing, for sure. I was <laughs> my hoping very, you would say my that. My very special moment there on the wall, because it was my wor first World, Cup, world Championships final. <laughs> and uh, being able to be on that wall, uh, it feels like, w for me, the fourth place was my personal win. Because um, if you compare impairments, I know what my limitations are, I know what the limitations of the others are, and just just making it barely to find the sixth place just felt like a podium for me. And then again, not ending six was just, what else am I asking for, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I've been on the podium before, but in, and I would say in less big uh, starting mm -hmm. uh, groups and also in uh, a different route setting. The route setting decides a lot. Yes. Sometimes depending on the impairment. And yes, there were so many big moments here outside for me also in the commentary box. Um, the first time that we have such a big team here shifting and uh, managing the hours of commentating here. And I love to, yeah, to be here on the microphone and commentate the action, witness the performance and hoping to spread the word of power climbing. And, and you do such a wonderful job of it. Thank you so much. I said it earlier, thank you as well for all that you've done to make the sport progress and all the work you've put in behind the scenes. I know you're part of a big team, but it's important to mention just how amazing you uh, amazing you've been and how influential you've been in progressing this sport we saw so many amazing performances today and you want to spread the word of paraclimbing you are doing just that by being out on this, that stage and putting all of the work in behind the scenes so thank you to you and a huge thank you to the brute setters for that show what a show it was the organizers it seems like the events just keep stepping up and up and we know we've got the decision coming later in october so i'm wishing you and the community all the best for that. I'm crossing everything. I hope we see paraclimbing in LA. But right now, I focus on all of the athletes who are standing on these podiums today of the World Championships. This event just keeps getting better and better. So thank you to all the athletes for the show today. Thank you to all the classifiers. Thank you to all the volunteers, b layers working at the World Cup, also behind the scenes. And yeah, you can stay life for the podiums and we'll leave you with the ceremony and it's time to say goodbye thank you shauna thank you thank you, thank you so all much. the other commentators it was a pleasure see you and bye
Angelino, another day, another gold medal. But this is the world champs. Did it feel a little bit different out there? Oh yeah, it's a, it's a different. Uh, it's it's so amazing event with all athletes from Boulder lead speed, and uh, it's so special here to climb. And yeah, I'm really happy with the result. There was a moment when you were high up on the wall and you kind of turned around to look at the crowd. Uh, what were you doing up there? Yeah, when I find a good hole to rest, then I take a look in the publicum and uh, get some energy and then I can start a new campus. <laughs> awesome. Well, mate, congratulations. Enjoy that gold medal. Thank you. Have a wonderful night. Thanks. Thank you. Cheers, Angelina.
Tell me about your climb today. Congratulations on your gold medal. Tell me about your climb today. Thank you. My name is Sunita. I, can, I, I am from uh, Indian. Uh, I'm so happy today because uh, my first me gold medal. Uh, well, enjoy that victory. You are a world champion. Congratulations. Okay, thank you. Brian, congratulations. Uh, oh, so you, did you get gold yet? What? I no, no, no. This is, this I'm is, sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. I literally fucking my brain melted. I'm so sorry. No, you have to only mention the gold. I'm no. literally, I'm so sorry. You're all good. I'm so sorry. Oh.
Congratulations on that gold medal. You are such a dominant force within paraclimbing. I bet you enjoyed that though as much as any other victory you've had. Tell me about the route out there today. Uh, it was a super nice route. I really enjoyed climbing, um, but uh, I was super stressed. And uh, I, I don't know what I did uh, on the first part, but uh, I had to fight after. I was like, okay, let's go. Now, let's go. <laughs> well, look, congratulations on that victory. I uh, wish you many more in the future, as I'm sure you will. What's next for you? Uh, first holidays. Uh, yeah, taking a rest because it's like eight, nine months of training, uh, indoor training, and um, uh, I love climbing outdoor too, so I think uh, it's holidays. Uh, climbing outdoor and uh, we'll see. Cool, well enjoy that gold medal, see you soon. Thank you, see you.
Benjamin, congratulations on that silver medal. Uh, you said to me that you climbed it a little differently from how you normally do. What changed out there? Well, this time I uh, realized that the competition was definitely a little more uh, foot intensive, so I had to kind of learn how to use my feet really quickly. It's been a long uh, struggle for me to use my feet, so this time I actually really tried to focus on my footwork and actually slow down. I normally climb really, really fast and kind of forget about the lower half of my body, but this time I slowed down and really focused on those feet. Awesome. Well, look, you enjoy that silver medal. You are a vice world champion. Congratulations. Thank you. Have a good one, Matt. Congratulations on your victory today. You are the first para climbing gold medal winner from Brazil. How does that make you feel? Uh, I think it's an honor and a privilege to be here. I'm so grateful. I'm really happy, of course. And the route itself, did you enjoy it up there? Was it hard? Of course I enjoyed it. It was fun. I wish I had made it up, but maybe I almost stopped the, my qualification route, so it's okay. <laughs> And finally, what's it like to be a world champion? It's a different feeling from just uh, going out there and winning another competition, right? Yes, of course. Uh, this year, the best girls were here, so winning it with all the best girls together, it's amazing. I still can't believe it, actually. <laughs> well, congratulations on that victory. You. Enjoy your evening. Thank you.
Congratulations on that medal. Tell me a bit about your climb and the route tonight. How did you find it? I found the route very hard. I thought it was easier to look at when we had the observation. So I got a bit of a shock when I was on the wall. Um, but it was a very cool route. Uh, so it was cool. <laughs> And tell me a little bit about the atmosphere here in the stadium because the crowd were really cheering the athletes on out there. The crowd was amazing. They were always screaming and I heard my coach through all of the screaming, so that was cool. Well, look, congratulations. Have an amazing time and good luck for future competitions. Thank you.
Congratulations on another incredible victory. You look so dominant out there. It seemed easy to you. Felicitări. Este foarte ușor, pare foarte ușor pentru tine. Domini categoria. Așa este. Așa pare. Este a fost un traseu destul de ușor. It looks uh, a very easy route, but it was a, a quite challenging uh, route. And uh, he's very happy for for this win, and uh, he is expect uh, uh, more challenge to come. Congratulations on that victory! Enjoy the gold medal. Felicitări pentru victorie, bucurate de competiție. Mulțumesc și nu e rezultat, nu e rezultat unei întregi echipe și reprezentăm o țară, deci asta înseamnă că am reușit împreună și asta e cel mai important. I'm very thankful and uh, thankful to all of my team and uh, we did a great result for our country and we are uh, very happy for that.
Congratulations on your victory. How are you feeling? Uh, uh, my, my, I'm so happy uh, and uh, uh, I want more training <laughs> soon. <laughs> well, good luck with that training. Enjoy that medal. Well done. No, no, thank you. <laughs> nice.
<laughs> Congratulations on your victory, guys. Uh, tell me a bit about the atmosphere in the stadium tonight. How did it feel? ありがとうございます。ありがとうございます。すごくお客さんが入っててこうコールゾーンにいても声援がこう漏れ聞こえてきててうんなかなかこうすごいところに来てこれから登る登らなきゃいけないんだなっていう気持ちがあってまあそん